the February 18th, 2020 meeting of the City Council of the City of Springfield is called to order. Please rise for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. Clerk, if you please call the roll. Will do. Alderman Redpath. Here. Personal. Alderman Gregory. Here. Alderwoman Turner. Here. Alderman Filginsi. Here. Alderman Proctor. Here. Alderwoman DeCenso. Present. Alderman McMiniman. Here. Alderwoman Connolly. Present. Alderman Donnellan. Here. Alderman Hanauer. Here. Mayor Langfelder. Here. Mr. Mayor, a quorum is present. Thank you. The uh, first item on the uh, zoning agenda is docket number 2020-001 for the property located at 1520 South 5th Street. Petitioner is Igor Slobod Yank Yuk. Present zoning classification is R2 single family and duplex residence, district section 155.017. Requested zoning relief of variance of section 155.068B1. Garages or accessory buildings or structures to construct and 22 foot by 24 foot addition to the east side of an existing 22 foot by 24 foot detached garage to within two feet of the south side yard instead of the three feet. Springfield Sangamon County Regional Planning Commission recommendation is approval. Planning and Zoning Commission recommendation is accept the recommendation of the Springfield Sangamon County Regional Planning staff. Chair will entertain a motion. Uh, yes, I move to accept the recommendation of the Planning and Zoning Commission. Second. Second. Been moved and seconded to accept the Planning and Zoning Commission recommendation. Any discussion? All those in favor of the motion vote yes. Those opposed vote no. The voting is now open. And the uh, zoning request passes 10 voting yes, none voting no. Next item on the agenda is docket number 2020-002 for the property located at 1501 Griffiths Avenue. Petitioner is Stephen and Karen Ray. Present zoning classification S2, Community Shopping and Office District, Section 155.031. Requested zoning relief reclassification to B2, General Business Service District, Section 155.034. Or in the alternative, a use variance to allow operation of a plumbing and sewer business in the S2 zoning district. Amended Springfield Sangamon County Regional Planning Staff recommendation is denial of the requested B2 zoning but approval of a use variance to allow a plumbing and sewer business on the subject property provided that outside storage is limited to an area north and, nor and west of the eastern edge of the existing building in a solid fenced area in compliance with the code and number two, all vehicles are parked inside the, at the enclosed of business daily. Planning and Zoning Commission recommendation is accept the amended recommendation of the Springfield Sangamon County Regional Planning Staff. Chair will entertain a motion. I make a motion to accept the petition as originally uh, by the by the original petitioner on a B2, no no restrictions. Second. Been moved and second to accept the uh, petition as submitted for the requested B2 zoning. Is there any uh, discussion? Anybody wish to speak to the petition? All those in favor of the motion, vote yes. Those opposed, vote no. The voting is now open. I vote yes. And the uh, the recommendation or the uh, motion passes 10 voting yes, none voting no. And that concludes our zoning portion of the meeting. This time, the chair will recognize Treasurer Busher for the presentation of the financial report. Thank you, Mayor Langfelder. <coughs> the corporate fund in the month of January had a beginning balance of $14,106,516. We took in total receipts of $9,129,122. The corporate fund had total disbursements in the month of January of $7,806,242 which left the corporate fund with an ending balance of $15,429,396. This concludes my report, Mayor Langfelder. Thank you. Chair will entertain a motion to approve the financial report. So moved. Second. 
Been moved and second. Any discussion? All those in favor of the motion, say aye. 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 Opposed, say nay. Motion carries. Chair will entertain a motion to dispense with the reading of the minutes of the February 4th, 2020 regular city council meeting and approve the minutes. So moved. Second. Been moved and second. Any discussion? All those in favor of the motion, say aye. 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 Opposed, say nay. Motion carries. Chair will entertain a motion to incorporate the pre-council first reading of ordinances into the record of this city council meeting. So moved. Move. Second. So moved and second. Any discussion? All those in favor of the motion, say aye. 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 Opposed, say nay. Motion carries. Next item on the agenda is the consent agenda. The chair will entertain a motion to incorporate the pre-council reading of the consent agenda in the record of this city council meeting. So moved. Second. Been moved and second. Any discussion? All those in favor of the motion, Say aye. 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 Opposed, say nay. Motion carries. Or they should actually vote on that, shouldn't they? Yep. Ben, ben. Voice, vote, voice vote like that's okay? We're just reading in. Okay. Agenda yes. numbers 2017 1032018, 2018 008, 2019-2766, 2019-430, 2020-049, 2020-057, and 2020-067 remain tabled or in committee. We didn't vote on the consent agenda. We, didn't vote on we need to vote on the consent. We have to vote on the consent agenda. Motion Very good. Final. Motion Thank to you. approve the consent agenda. Second. And then yes. take a roll second. <laughs> Been moved and second. Any discussion? All those in favor of the motion vote yes. Those opposed vote no. The voting is now open. Mm -hmm. And the consent agenda passes 10 voting yes, none voting no. Any uh, motions on the agendas uh, of the ordinances remaining table during committee? Very good. Next item on the agenda is number 2020-054, an ordinance approving the and authorizing execution of a one-year lease agreement for 7020 Bronx Cemetery Road for the City of Springfield Office of Public Utilities. Chair will entertain a motion to place agenda number 2020-054 in final passage. So move. Second. Been moved and second. Any discussion? All those in favor of the motion, vote yes. Those opposed, vote no. The voting is now open. And the ordinance passes 10 voting yes, none voting no. Next item on the agenda is number 2020-055, an ordinance approving and authorizing execution of a new water service agreement between the City of Springfield and Sugar Creek Public Water District through December 31st, 2050 for the City of Springfield Office of Public Utilities. Chair will entertain a motion to place agenda number 2020-055 on final passage. So moved. Second. Been moved and second. Any discussion? All those in favor of the motion, vote yes. Those opposed, vote no. The voting is now open. And the ordinance passes 10 voting yes, none voting no. Next item on the agenda is number 2020-059, an annual appropriation ordinance of the City of Springfield, Illinois, for a fiscal year beginning March 1st, 2020, and ending February 28th, 2021. Chair will entertain a motion to place agenda number 2020-059 on final passage. So moved. Second. Been moved and second. Uh, I understand there's some amendments. Only a couple. <laughs> I've got a couple more if you want. So, uh, I guess if we'd go over those uh, one at a time, and uh, Director McCarty, would you like to go over those for us? And we'll just take each one, uh, one at a time, and if sure. anyone wants to speak to each amendment, we'll do so, and then vote on that particular amendment. Okay, so amendment number one is sponsor uh, Alderwoman DeCenzo, Alderman Hanauer, Alderman Donnellan. This would take the $200,000 that is allocated for the tree program, in Fund 95 from $200,000 down to $50,000, so a $150,000 reduction. Any discussion? Uh, discussion. Yes, Solomon McBenham. There's been a, a huge um, amount of public support for using our infrastructure funds for um, maintaining the beauty of our streets and maintaining the integrity of our neighborhoods. So I, th I think we should support the original budget amount of 200,000. I think the, the original budget amount includes 100,000 for trees to replace all the thousands of ash trees that are being taken out because they're dying. 
and it also includes, I believe, roughly 100,000, which is an estimate to do a, a very broad city inventory of our trees to know where our trees are located, how many are dying, how many are already dead, and uh, to kind of establish a priority for replacement of our dead trees. Um, some neighborhoods have been decimated by the, uh, the wipeout of the ash trees. Uh, I think this um, tree proposal as originally submitted had, had broad support. Um, natural resources is important whether you're in the city or outside the city. Um, so I, I hope we pass this as originally proposed. Uh, in, in my situation, um, I can think of one case where um, Tim DeRosa lives at the corner of um, right at the edge of Ward 8. Uh, he's got a corner property, and um, he had uh, six ash trees, a corner property, three on one side, three on the other side. They were um, either dead or half dying. So, you know, branches were falling down on, on potentially on cars. Um, a park, he couldn't have park, parked cars under the trees. And um, so he, he asked for these trees to be taken out and removed, which we did. Um, because we got an outstanding tree crew with Public Works. And then his second question, you know, after we got that taken care of, he says, now, this is on city right of way. Will the city be replacing these trees? This was a year and a half ago. And um, I said, Tim, I'm going to talk with Public Works, see if we got a, a tree budget. And at that time, we had no tree budget. So here we've got just a decimated corner um, in Cokie Mill neighborhood. And um, so we worked on this, and now we've got a proposal to properly um, fund replacement of our dead trees. And it's coming not out of our corporate fund. It's coming from dedicated funds from our infrastructure fund. Those are monies that the public said, okay, let's increase our sales tax so we can accumulate funds in our infrastructure fund. And it, it's got a healthy balance right now. And uh, so we're using those funds. We're not using funds that can go to police or that can go to fire. We're using dedicated funds for infrastructure. So um, I was very surprised by this amendment to um, reduce down what we're spending on trees. I think there's broad support for this. We've created basically a tree commission. They're excited about their job. And, and it's almost like pulling the rug out from underneath this new committee, this new commission that we've, we've created to beautify our city. This is about the best kind of, one of the best kinds of economic development tools we have at our disposal because unlike when we send money to, let's say, the Sangman Springfield Growth Alliance, which goes to basically salaries, this is money going for something you can see, something you can touch. It's, it's beautification, it's trees, and it's, it's good for our mothers that are walking their kids uh, in the shade or their baby carriages. It's, it's good for a lot of reasons. So um, I hope we get, it's, it's good for our water usage reduction because the more shade we have, the more, the less water we got to use to water our lawns. This has so many benefits um, that we, we got to get this through. And Mayor, thanks for proposing this uh, spending uh, for our trees. Alderman Hanauer. Thank you. Well, a couple things. Um, number one, we couldn't plant, if we had $100,000 for trees, we couldn't plant $100,000 in trees in a year. There's just no way. We don't have the crews to do $100,000 in trees in a year. So why, spend, why put it in the budget if we got that much, number one? Number two, uh, got a lot of emails and that from the forestry, uh, the Urban Forestry Commission saying don't cut our budget. I want to make something clear. The Urban Forestry, unless, unless this has changed from all our other commissions, and that's, that's not what I understood, but they are an advisory commission. Is that correct, Mayor? Corporation Council, aren't they advisory? Yes, uh, all commissions primarily are advisory with one or two exceptions that such a civil service that right. might render decisions, but oh. primarily advisory. And they Council don't have a budget, is that correct? On that. But they don't have a budget, is that correct? Well, right now they don't. I think uh, what this is is a recommendation that came from the urban forestry group that we brought forward. So, but it still uh, the goes trees, though, uh, the trees themselves, I put that in with regards to the study. That's a recommendation made by that particular body. But it funnels it through public works money, is what uh, what I'm getting at. Yeah. Okay. But they'll, uh, Nate, if you'd like to come up to and, and answer the question about the planning, but go ahead, Alderman. The, the other part is keep in mind that two hundred thousand dollars. 
is, is roughly a half a mile of, of road overlay, or it's over, what, about a mile of, of, of sidewalk? It's a lot of money that we can use on roads or sidewalks. And, and I mean, I'm not against trees, but $200,000 for, for a, you know, a startup type deal, I think 50,000 when last year we only spent about 33 on, on trees is a pretty good, a sizable increase on a budget that, keep in mind, we had to spend, we had to take 1.5, 1.7 million dollars to balance this budget. So it, to raise the, the, the number of trees that we're planting, I think is pretty daggone generous. So. Well, with regards to a mile of road, I think a mile of road is a million dollars. I said uh, a half a mile. Half mile. Yep. Half a mile. Uh, for uh, to overlay, so a uh, half a general, mile would be five hundred thousand. Road that'd be five hundred thousand dollars. But but you're you're not for your general, uh, just to overlay a uh, road like in the neighborhood. And how much? I, maybe I'm we, wrong, Nate. How yeah, much are we spending on roads? Uh, it's approximately four hundred to five hundred thousand a mile for an overlay. How much are we spending on roads this year? Um, well, total about ten to twelve million dollars. And then uh, what about the trees? I guess the planting of the trees, what's your opinion on that? With regards to the budget, would you be able to plant the amount of trees for the $100,000 Yes, we could put a contract out and plant that many trees. So it would cost more. <laughs> so it would be more. <laughs> so, or also with the schools, I mean, uh, let's, let's be perfectly honest. I mean, we get beat up on, before this came forward, we were getting beat up about beautification. So regardless how we are critiquing this process, there's 3,000 ash trees that are gone by the wayside. And how, much have, how many have we removed? Uh, we've removed approximately 1,500 15, to 2,000. Yeah. And how many have been replaced? 250. Right. And so, you know, we were criticized by not taking a proactive stance, and that's my point, is so you can't have it both ways. You know, you, you have to, you know, be for one or the other. So I understand the argument for infrastructure. There's money in the infrastructure budget associated with that. And we do have individuals signed up that will speak uh, from the urban forestry group. But, uh, you know, that's, I guess it's just the priority of each particular individual voting on it. Alderman Redpath? I'll yield the floor to Alderman DeCenso. Thank you. Um, this was my amendment, and I was concerned, I brought it forward because I was concerned that at the amount it was listed, it wouldn't get funded at all, that it would get zeroed out. So I wanted to make sure we got something. And we received yesterday the last three years worth of Public Works tree purchases. Um, there was one line item for three dogwood trees for $985. Um, 161 trees went over to replace the ash trees and went in Ward 2. The rest were just scattered throughout the city, and it was about 12 trees. This is just for last year. So we're not doing this discriminately by ward. Um, and the Urban Forestry Commission would argue with you, this isn't a beautification effort. This is an effort to make sure we have the proper canopy for the city, that uh, you know we're planting trees that, as Alderman McMenamin pointed out, that you know help with drainage and help with flooding, because um, trees soak up the water. Um, but I want to make sure we get some trees. I also want to make sure we put out an RFP so we're getting the best deal on trees. And I want to make sure that, that every ward gets some trees because it's not fair for one ward to get trees and no other ward to get trees. Um, that's just, that's not right. And I would like to say that we did a lot of talking with the Urban Forestry Commission yesterday and they are in support of this $50,000. Alderwoman Conley. I will yield to Alderman Donnelly. Okay. Alderman Donnelly. Yeah, just real quick, I echo the comments about making sure that we actually absolutely include monies in the budget for this purpose. I think it's important for the city. The one problem, I, the one thing I had a problem with, and, and we really didn't get into in, in great detail, is I'll give you an example. I've been fighting, and others of you at this table have been fighting for engineering and studies to get major infrastructure, safe public safety slash major infrastructure improvements done the last four years. And I'm sure 
like Alder, Alderwoman Turner has been here longer than that and some of the others. Um, and finally, it's in this budget, and I appreciate it. But uh, to spend $100,000 on a tree inventory when we have these major infrastructure uh, uh, improvements that need to be done, I just, and again, you have to prioritize. I'm glad money's in there to actually plant trees. And I think you, it sound, sounds like you have, a, from discussions we've had and I've heard you say with others, you have a good idea of where the trees have been taken out, out and where they need to replace right away. An inventory, not, not, no pun intended, is going to be organic. As soon as it's done, it's going to be out of date. I think spending $100,000 in inventory at this time is premature. We need to focus on spending money on actually planting trees so that we can focus on other priorities such as major infrastructure improvements. And there's a delicate balance here, and, and that's why the, I'm in support of the amendment. Alderman Redpat. So, Nate, can you tell me the breakdown of, of we, on the money being spent? How much of it costs to plant, and how much is it actually a tree? I mean, there's a labor cost, correct? That's correct. Uh, I can get those to you. I don't have them at this time, what, but it's basically in order to plant the trees, it's in essence two hundred dollars per tree to plant the trees, tree, including labor, including and tree. labor. Okay, so, uh, but we're not using our regular public works crews. We're, it's going to go out on a contract. That's correct. That's what we did last okay. time. Okay. All right. Please get those numbers to me. Thank you. Alderman Gregory. Uh, yes, Nate. Um, I do know that we had a, a, a nice amount of those trees. Uh, taken down and replaced in, in uh, Ward 2, Stratford Place. Um, I am aware of how, Is there a process in place to get the stumps out? I know I talked to Jeff um, one time in passing at Moxo, and you guys have done a great job. I appreciate you, uh, that. Um, what's the process? Does, does the stump removal come from, from these monies? No. Todd Hazelwood right behind here. He runs the crew, and they'll be removing the stumps here uh, shortly. Yeah. They do an excellent job. And you the stump guy? <laughs> he does an excellent right. job, too. Right. Shouldn't have raised your hand. As do all these men and, they, and women. And women, men and women, have done an amazing job, especially with the snow, too. We've had quite a few snows, and they've done an amazing job. Thank you. Thank you. Um, so, Nate, you've, you're kind of leading into my, my next question, which is, um, would it be possible for us to get more trees planted if we had an additional tree crew that could be doing the work for you? Amen. It's possible. We can run a cost-benefit analysis on that. I got um, one. Have you done? I'd love to we'll see take that. our turn and speak at the podium, please, for our um, records. And the reason I ask is that um, you know I've seen Ward Eight has been hit very hard with the ash tree removals. I would like to see. Um, I've had people asking me when they're going to get their trees replaced. There's obviously a lot of appreciation for your crew. You guys have been working overtime and I love it. Um, but I would like to see if we're spending this kind of money to put resources out in our community. And and I will agree with everyone, I think, at, at, up here that our trees are an important resource in our community. Um, but I would like to see that we move away from contracts for work like this. And um, I'll be bringing that up again later. But I, I I guess my concern is the amount of money that we put into these trees right now, is that just going to be driven into a larger contract that we're then giving to someone outside of the city? Well, in regards so like if, to the maintenance and everything along those lines, we were doing that in-house. Okay, so maintenance, so when you say it's 200 per tree, that's purchasing the tree, planting the tree, and then does the city do watering or are we? The city will be doing watering. Okay. And that's that's one of your crews doing that work. That's okay, correct. thank you. So I do have uh, some individuals signed up to speak on this particular amendment. Um, first is Jan Von Quaylen. <coughs> You'd state your name and address for the council. We'd appreciate it. <coughs> My name is Jan Von Quaylen. I live at 1716 South Whittier, and I'm the chairperson of the Urban Forestry Commission. Mayor, council, thank you for the opportunity to address you tonight. Thank you for passing the Springfield Urban Forestry Commission ordinance. I'm a retired administrative law judge, and I volunteered to be on the commission because of my deep love of trees, and I want to share that with the community. 
There are six other voting members of the commission. One is Amy McEwen. She has a PhD in terrestrial ecology, and she's an associate professor, professor of biology at UIS. We also have Susan Allen, who's a retired professional who devotes herself to environmental and social advocacy. Randy Belleville, the owner of New City Greenhouse. He brings many years of experience working with trees and landscaping. Ernestine Lawrence has been a long-term active member of the Springfield community. Rianne Hawkins is presently the vice president of Springfield Parks Foundation. It is with sadness that I tell you that there is an opening on the commission as Mike Pierce had an untimely passing in December. He was an arborist with National Tree Care and he brought experience to us in tree trimming, pruning, plant diseases, and disaster cleanup. Each of us on the commission is passionate about the importance of our urban forest and we are dedicated to maintaining and improving it. We thank you for any support that you will give to maintain the urban forest. We requested a budget for urban forestry to include 500 new trees. The need to plant new trees is urgent. Emerald ash borer has taught us the importance of diversity. 1,800 trees were removed in 2019 and more than 1,500 more need to be removed next year. We need to replace some. We have been exploring ways such as planting smaller trees to bring down the cost per tree, and we hope that with that we could make the budget go further and plant for more trees. We've also asked for a tree survey, and I know there's a lot of misunderstanding about that. The tree survey would be a one-time expense to give us a baseline so that we know what we have in the Springfield Forest. It would allow the Public Works Department to proactively maintain it. Without knowing the condition, location, species of the tree, we cannot know what changes are needed to make it a stronger, healthier, more diverse forest. The most present concerns are hazardous trees, the need for diversity, and determining what areas of the city are most in need of trees. We also ask for a budget for community and educational events. We're planning events for Arbor Day and Earth Day. We've begun a series of educational events about the value and maintenance of the urban forestry. Dr. McEwen will give a presentation on Wednesday, February the 26th at Lincoln Library. In the few months of the UFC's existence, we've been very busy learning about urban forests, the purpose of an urban forestry plan, and the steps that go into writing one. In the last month, we went through a very steep learning curve about the budget process. This year, we understand there was a disconnect between the UFC's budget request and the information we gave to the council to support it. In the future, the UFC will update the council on its plans and activities regularly. Next year, the council will be well aware of the UFC's plans and budget proposal in advance of the budget hearings. For the present, the UFC does not know the condition of the urban forest in any of the wards. We encourage you to reach out to us with any concerns that you have, and we encourage you and your constituents to attend the educational and outreach events that we plan. The next Urban Forestry Commission meeting will be March 11th at 5 p.m. in the council chambers. I would be happy to answer any questions any of you have. Any questions? Alderwoman Conley. Thank you. I just would like to thank you all for your um, your time and, and your very thoughtful consideration to this issue. It is an important one. I'll tell you, as um, as someone who's new to this budget process, it, it is daunting. Um, and, and I I hope you understand that uh, any you know my vote tonight is being taken with all due respect to the work that that you've put in. And I, I appreciate um, when a, a commission that the mayor establishes works this hard to get us information. I'm just sorry we didn't have a little better picture sooner. Um, and Mayor, I would hope that we would get updates from commissions on a more regular basis so that we're aware of when citizens volunteer their time to us, we're aware of what they're finding. Very good. Mm -hmm. Any other? Alderman McKenna. Yeah. Ms. Van Quillen, you've put, you've got a, you've put together an outstanding report tonight and you described a uh, 
very quality committee membership or commission membership with just experts that are advising the city. You've put together a budget and I think we should support what you've proposed. And uh, you know, when you break it down, if, if we're spending $10 million on our roads and sidewalks, et cetera, um, the $100,000 for that survey is, is a one-time expense, like you described it, and that's 1% of our total budget, and we'll never have to repeat that mm -hmm. spending anytime soon. So that's a very modest request, and then that 1,000, uh, excuse me, $100,000 for the, the trees you're recommending, again, that's 1% of our total budget, it also is a, is a modest amount. And if we, if we can't, if, if ultimately we don't spend all that money, it just rolls over to next year. So I know that our public works director will be careful the way he spends this money. He'll get good contracts and it'll be somewhat of a learning experience because we haven't done this before. So uh, let's encourage this commission and their proposal, and that's why I'm a yes vote on this. And uh, I really respect what you've you've brought to us. And I also think there's some disagreement about what you do support. I think $50,000 is better than zero dollars. And I think maybe there was some communication out there that quote, unless you support the 50,000, you might get zero. So this, if that discussion was out there, that's unfortunate because it, it shouldn't really be that type of a discussion. Any other questions? Thank you. Is there anybody else from the Urban Forestry Commission? Like Thank to you for your council? time and your support. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. If you'd like to come forward and state your name and address for the council, we'd appreciate it. My name is Patty Morton. I'm not on the commission yet. Um, I'm supposed to fill the position of the person who passed away. I wanted to clarify the reason the reason we need the survey is because there's money laying on the table. If you don't have a survey, nobody is going to give you grants and and opportunities to get more trees, to match funds, to do things like that. So you have to know where you are to begin with. So they know you aren't a fly by night like um, um uh, Arbor Association has grants, Trees Forever has grants. They all want to know exactly where your city is as far as where your trees are, how many, what, what condition, everything. So that's why the survey is so incredibly important because we can have matching funds. We can get grant money. So that's what's really important. Thank, thank you. Thank you. Then we have Ann Logue signed up to speak. Is Ann Logue here? Or the other person, Guy Sternberg? Submitted a letter. Oh, he submitted a letter. Okay. <coughs> Any other discussion on this amendment? Is there a motion on the floor? Is there a motion for the amendment? I move to uh, pass the amendment for $50,000 for the Urban Forestry Second. Commission. Second. Does that mean that the amount has been reduced by $150,000? That is correct. Any uh, discussion? Alderman Fulgenzi. Um, is the 50000 enough for the tree inventory? Because it sounds like if we don't have the tree inventory, we can't get any matching funds or any of the uh, $50, money that's on the table. 200 is 250 trees. No, I mean for the tree inventory. Isn't that an inventory, 250 trees? No, no it's no, not. What he's trying to uh, express is what the speaker before him just expressed, that the uh, study will allow opportunities for grants. And so the question is, uh, the 50000 are you designating that it just goes for trees, or is there flexibility to go for trees or the study? I'm, I, I'm flexible. I mean, I would prefer it to go for trees because we are we need so many trees. But if the <coughs> Urban Forestry Commission thinks that it is a better idea to, you know, split that money between survey and trees, then they are the experts and we put it in their hands. I, Alderman McConley. Yeah, I'm. I'm actually not in favor of that. If we're pass, if we're reducing this to fifty thousand dollars, I would prefer to see that go directly to trees. Ward eight's taken a big hit, and I'd like to see our our tree canopy recovered. Um, I will say, um, 
I, I, well, I, I understand the argument behind the tree survey. I think if we're looking at searching for, for granting grant funding opportunities, we have um, a grant writer position currently in the budget, and then there may be an amendment on that too. Um, and, and I think that's something that we need to be planning for so that we know exactly what our parameters are so that we have someone within the city who's responsible for writing that grant and then reporting back to us on exactly what we need. So I'm not opposed to the concept of the tree survey, but I am opposed I mean, I'm opposed to taking money from tree plantings for that this year if this amendment passes. So. Yeah, I think the uh, speaker was referring to you have to have the data to support the grant. I think that's what the, instead of, uh, or you can do the match for match, you know, if we're putting up so much, you might be able to apply for it. But I think, uh, and she can come up and correct me if I'm wrong, but I think the data will tell whoever we're applying the grant to would be able to make sure that we're just not planting trees willy-nilly. We have a planned strategy as we move forward. And I, and I agree with that concept. And I, I, I'm just saying that maybe I'm not sure that this is exactly the year if we don't even have someone yet on staff to write the grants. So. Alderman Hanauer. Yeah, well, one thing, too. I think that <clears throat> what really needs to be done is we originally, I thought that, that they, came, they told us that the, this tree study was going to be 50 grand. It wasn't that with the cost originally, and then it became a hundred grand. Why don't we go off for RFP to find out what the true cost of it is? Because it could be two hundred and fifty grand. And I mean, we need to we need to know what the numbers are because, you know, when numbers start changing like that, it makes me nervous. And and I think that that would be the prudent thing to do: go out for an RFP and come back and let us know what it costs. Because if it's a two hundred and fifty thousand dollar you know, we're a pretty pretty good sized city, and if it's going to cost us a lot of money, then then that if it's only fifty thousand, that's something else we can look at. But but right now the numbers have changed. So yeah, I think that's a good point. Uh, and with the expenditure, it would still have to come back before city council for right. approval over the fifty thousand dollar limit. Anyway, isn't that correct, Corporation Council? Yes. Well, and, and if if that's the case, we can come back with a supplemental if mm -hmm. that's the if, right. if if it comes back at a decent price. But mm -hmm. good point. Can I address, can I address that question? Sure. If you come up and state your name and address for the council. <laughs> Come on, Randy, uh -oh. you know better than that. Yes, the... <laughs> yeah, it did go from 50 to 100. And that's because we don't know until we put an RFP out. So we wanted to have enough in there to cover that. I think I explained that in a letter, and as I talked to some of you, that we don't anticipate spending all of that allotment. We have identified a true grant source for up to $30,000 from Morton Arboretum. That money is dedicated money for exactly what we're talking about, tree surveys. It is administered through the Illinois Department of Natural Resources through the State Forester. The State Forester has been sitting in on our meetings and walking us through this process exactly as Urbana has done, Champaign has done, Bloomington has done, Mount Prospect. Many, many, many cities across Illinois have a tree survey and have it in place. Why do we need that? We need a statistical analysis that shows us and then specifically what the health and wellness, diversity of species, all of those things we've talked about, where they're at and where the open opportunities are to place trees so that they know how much money to give us. But they do and have and will, according to the State Forester, work with us to match $30,000 worth of whatever the 100000 that we need to do it. It's not our intent to go out and spend $100,000 just willy-nilly. We will send it out for an RFP through Public Works um, I wanted to also say, it, it, it just we're not also looking at contractual obligations. We're not looking to drive up contractu contractual spending. We have talked about and worked with in our, our uh, little committee there to begin to address and get buy-in from the public for um, tree planting, working with schools and PTOs and other businesses and sponsors that will come in and help us on those days. Um, so that we get community buy-in, so that they understand the importance of this as well as, as you all and as well as us as an Urban Forest Commission. That's the best way to do it, is to get those people out there and get their hands dirty, buying in on planting and making this forest exactly what it needs to be or what it can be. It's in decline. It's in severe, severe decline, you guys. You know that. You're hearing the, these things about um, how we're taking trees out all over the place. 
All they do is go through and cut down the diseased and damaged trees, which are hazards. As part of the tree survey, if the RFP goes out and Davy Resource or any one of those other groups would respond, <coughs> As part of their response, they give you a, a software system that allows you, that, that, that's all then in a database. And so every time something hazardous needs to be taken down, Jeff can then go in and, and create a work order. Whatever tree we put back can be put right back into that database so we know exactly when and where it was planted, what the age of it is. We can begin to monitor, and we have a four-point system, four, three, two, one, where those trees which are deemed before need to be come out right away. When Champaign-Urbana did that, um, they had something like 20,000 trees in their tree survey. They ended up with 170 trees that needed to be addressed immediately. So they went out and they worked those. Also, as part of that, and the cost-saving measures from this, would be the fact that we would want to bring forth to you guys a ward-by-ward -ward, um, tree maintenance schedule for the first 10 years. And then we've talked about, just like they did in Urbana, where then they were able to drive that down to where they were able to get back into each ward every four years. And they proactively addressed the needs of those and cut down the amount of storm damage that they had to take care of after a storm came through. Whether or not there was any property damage or any, anything on tree or on uh, cars or streets, all of that was addressed with a proactive approach and saving you thousands of dollars. And also proper training. We're, we're trying to make recommendations as well for the tree crews and that we don't have trees with just six foot of uh, foliage at the top of a 50 foot trunk, you know, or only half of a tree. Um, we're trying to address with the homeowners how to select the proper tree, the proper placement of that tree, and do that. It does cost us about $200, $250 to plant a tree. It used to cost us a whole lot more, but we've sized the size, that size tree down to a much more manageable tree. We'd hope to get that down even further so that we could manage them as individuals and volunteers rather than having to have a piece of machinery come in and plant it for us. If you have any other questions, we'll, we'll answer them. But I, that's where the 50000 went. We don't, we don't assume that a, a survey is going to cost us that. We put that in there as insurance in case it, it does. Alderman Redpath. Uh, Director uh, Bottom, do we still have the, uh, the program where citizens can buy the trees and we plan them for them? We used to have that program. Why don't we have that program? We don't have that at this time, but we can look at reestablishing well, it. We used to have it. Uh, 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 I don't know if it was when you guys started, but uh, back when I first started, we had a program where, where citizens, and that it actually worked, where citizens would call in and spend a couple hundred dollars to have trees planted, and we'd go plant them for them. So would you, can we look at that? Mm -hmm. Sure. That's a supplement to not just what we're talking about tonight, but that's, that's something that worked in the past, and I don't know why we got away from that. So if you could look into that, I'd appreciate it. We'll do. This week, um, Alderman, program uh, worked too. Right. Alderman Phil Jensen. <laughs> Yeah, I think without this tree inventory, though, how can we select the right trees? I don't know what tree to plant. I don't know if anybody else up there does. But the point of it is that may be how we got all these emerald ash borers, you know, these ash trees. <clears throat> It definitely makes it difficult. Um, what we will do, though, is we'll plant a diversity of trees with but whatever what we plant. However, trees? that would ultimately be the goal. But what kind of trees? Sweet well, gums, ash trees. <laughs> we don't have a list. But we'll go ahead and no, we don't list. know what the list. We won't plant sweet gum. No, no, we won't. And we work with the, our arborists as well as Urban Forestry Commission on preparing a list with different genus and species. It Randy sounds, can talk about that a lot better than I could. It sounds reasonable that we should have a, an inventory of trees and go out and get grants. And, uh, if they're willing to do something like this with the type of uh, people that are on there, I say we ought to do it. Yeah, yeah as Alderman uh, Hanauer suggests, we'll go out for an RFP, and then we always can come back for a supplemental appropriation. Right. Any other discussion on this amendment? So the uh, motion is to uh, change the uh, dollar amount from $200,000 to $50,000. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed, say nay. 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 Roll motion call. carries. Roll call, please. Alderman Redpath. Aye. Alderman Gregory. Aye. 
Alderwoman Turner. Aye. Alderman Filzinzi. Nay. Alderman Proctor. Aye. Alderwoman DeCenso. Aye. Alderman McMiniman. Nay. Alderwoman Connolly. Aye. Alderman Donlin. Aye. Alderman Hanauer. Aye. Do you vote on this mail No. You have eight yeses and two noes. Very good. Thank you. Amendment two. Amendment two is sponsored by Alderwoman Connolly. This amendment eliminates funding for the position of Assistant Human Resources Director. And uh, is there a motion? So moved. Second. So moved and second. Discussion? Uh, discussion, Thank Mr. I, Mayor. Alderwoman Connolly. Thank you, Mayor. Um, yeah, I would just like to present this to uh, the rest of the council. I've I haven't had a chance to talk to you a whole lot about this. Um, my concern with this position is that while it may be necessary for human resources, I think that we've seen um, a stagnation in our staffing levels, and I would prefer that we, um, if we're adding new positions, that we add those in frontline services that have a more immediate impact to our community. So I would ask for your support tonight on this amendment. Alderman McMenamin. Uh, Director Quisen, could you come forward? Um, your um, department has an extraordinarily important role in hiring new employees, filling positions, sometimes, oftentimes critical positions, and if, <coughs> if you're understaffed or ha lack the staffing to do that, that impacts all the other departments, whether it be police, fire, public works. Uh, do you have jurisdiction over city water, light, and power too, as far as the, Correct. the we hiring? Correct. Also, we also handle paperwork. every department. And, and we're facing um, uh, always significant turnover. So my question is, how critical is this position uh, to the performance of the duties that, that you have in a, to, to perform those duties in a timely manner? To give you a perspective, in 2008 and 2009, our department was staffed with 12 individuals. It dropped to 11. Two years ago, we took a hit and we re eliminated the training position. So virtually no training is coming out of HR anymore. Um, this current fiscal year, the labor relations manager will be exclusively under um, budget, budgetarily wise, under the legal department. The, work, the loss control manager will move over to human resources, again, not doing HR functions. That'll leave us nine people, including myself, to handle all the employment activities for 1,400. So I think we are definitely shooting ourselves in the foot, not having someone that can offer those services for the department. We, our, our, our primary mission is customer service, and our customers are not only um, the citizens, but our employees. And that leaves nine core staff, the other two handle benefits, to administer for 1,400. Thank you. Alderman Hanauer. Okay, well, the labor relations person that's moving over to legal, what did they do uh, other things besides labor relations? Formerly labor relations, um, they did a lot of the uh, disciplinary investigations and, and complaint investigations. Most Won't of that's they just being take done by that labor. over to legal? It, it, most of it's actually the labor relations manager is supporting um, the other departments, both the legal department and the police advisor as well. So we're, Nate is still helping us out if and when he can, but he's not exclusively as we had before. Well, my question is, is then why move them? If, if they need that, why are we moving them over to legal? Already um, in legal. You know. It, it, the Corporation Council, would you care to answer that? Well, yeah, the, uh, traditionally that's been a, an attorney position. And so the, with Stephanie as an attorney and then with Nate as an attorney, uh, most of that role is primarily a legal responsibility both in the contract side or, for example, discipline, presenting discipline cases, resolving grievances, things of that nature. But if they, they do, do other almost things exclusively. In, if they do other things in, uh, in personnel, you, in a sense, you're, you're, I mean, they can still work with, they'll still work with you, but I don't understand why we're taking people out of personnel if, if, if you know, you leave that there and that would, that would help them out in other, other sides of it. I don't, I mean, it's, I just, it doesn't make sense to me. Actually, I know they want to consolidate all the attorneys, but in some cases, this isn't a, this, this may not be a good fit. What did Stephanie Barton do? 
Is it the in, same in role as negotiating all the contracts? Yeah. She also, again, she she did dealt with a lot of the day-to-day -day, um, grievances and, and things of that nature, uh, employee complaints, employee investigations. So a lot of those things that that she used to do, Nate still helps and assists with as he can. However, this this current fiscal year, a lot of the contracts are coming open. So he will be more involved at this point the coming year in, in the labor relations doing aspect. the same thing it's yes. always done. Position's mm -hmm. not changing. What would the uh, position that's budgeted in that they're looking to cut, what would that person do? The assistant human resources director, I mean, they, they would support, you know, everyone within the department. We would uh, use that person then to do some training, whether it's the assistant director or whether it's the HR manager. We could actually start doing, doing some additional training that we haven't been able to do. Alvin Proctor? No, that was my question there because when we lost the trainer, what, what training are we no longer doing? Um, when when Danielle and Pamela were here, they, they offered training. They tried to do it, if not on a weekly basis, bi-weekly basis, soft skills, um, just on a number of training sessions that we offered, not only for the frontline staff, but for the supervisors as well. Well, I mean, does that mean like to make them better employees or just like mandated training that we're required there to There was both. It, there, there was, it was, uh, we, had, we had some mandated training. We have some mandated training coming on the calendar for this year as well. And is that getting done now then or is that just being done we, by the we, employee? We get it done as, 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 we ha as we can, but we're not as dedicated to it as we need to be. So you hit on that this, if this position went through, this position could help carry some Absolutely. of that task and help some training. Yeah. Okay. All the woman, DeSento, then Donna. Thank you. Um, so Stephanie Barton was located in human resources or in the legal department? Human resources. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Alderman Donnelly. Thank you, Mayor. Jim, just a, just a point of clarification. Uh, you mentioned Stephanie Barton. How long was she with the city? Mm, probably six years. And then her predecessor was Jim? Jim Gates. Jim Gates. And how long, estimate, he was at the city? 15, 20 years. 15, 20 years. Mm -hmm. Was he an attorney? No. I didn't think so. Thank you. And what's crucial about this uh, particular position, as was stated, it's um, you know dealing with union contracts, things of that nature. So how many contracts do we have coming up this year? We have a total of 26. I don't know how many, uh, t 26 different bargaining agreements. I think probably at least half of them or more are going to be coming open this year. Alderwoman Conley. Thank you. So, um, and I guess I need to just have some clarification. You said soft skills. I, 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 could you please give me an example? I don't know what it, this is. Like if, if we're dealing with, with um, say, the commercial office, they might be offering some customer service skills. If we're having new, new supervisors, we had new supervisor training, um, just those type of classes that would help people do their jobs better. Okay. And when you're talking about your contracts, um, so will you would you not be relying on legal for that assistance? We would, we've would. we always relied on both the labor relations manager and the legal department for those. And the labor relations manager is now in legal? Correct. Okay, and so, um, Mr. Zirkel, can you please, I've, I'm hearing kind of two different things. I'm hearing on one hand that HR is getting less support, and then I'm hearing that legal will continue to provide the same services to HR that they've been providing. So I. Could we just have? I don't understand where the break is in that. I, I if I may, uh, I would say that, that, that what what we're seeing that's different is when formerly a lot of the employee complaints, employee investigations, grievances. Um, Nate is still handling a lot of the grievances, but those employee complaints, investigations, things of that nature, those are now we're having to deal with those. So it's really spreading us thin. So has he had a reduction in his duties then by moving to legal? Oh, absolutely not. So you have easy doing other things in addition at legal? Correct. Okay. And I, I want you to know, I, I hope you understand, uh, this is in no way, shape, or form um, an amendment that's intended to disparage the work that you do or the importance of HR. Um, and and I, I realize it's been a lot of heavy lifting. Um, I, I've just gotten other contacts from other con other interest groups and other constituents asking for more frontline services. And so um, that, that was where this, this amendment came from. Uh, I, I have to rely on HR for all sorts of things, and, and I appreciate the work that you do. I really Thank you. do. And, and, and you know, we're, we're advocates for, for frontline services as well. We want to make sure they're properly trained and ready to do their work as well. And I appreciate that. Thank you very much. Mm -hmm. Any other discussion on this amendment? All in favor of the amendment, say aye. 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 Opposed, say nay. 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 Motion passes. Director McCarty.
Amendment number three is sponsored by Alderman Proctor. This is an amendment that would give the Kidzeum or put funding in destined for the Kidzeum for $100,000. It would also reduce the transfer to the cemetery to Oak Ridge by $50,000, taking it from $500,000 transfer to $450,000. Yes, Mr. Mayor. Yes, Alderman Proctor. Need to amend the amendment. Um, Need to reduce, well, we need to just get rid of the reduction for Oak Ridge so they'll still get what they were originally in this proposed budget. And then the 50,000 that'll be going to Kidzeem is coming from the 100,000 that's allocated for downtown tours and promotion that we halved off from when we did the uh, hotel tax increase like three or four years ago. Does that make sense? So just 50,000 will go to? The yeah, 50,000. It's a one time deal, it's not going to be a multi year. Um, requests or anything. This is just one time to help increase their marketing for one year and development. For a total amount of 50000 50000 It's not new spending because we already we already budgeted that amount, but we didn't allocate it for anything yet, is my understanding. Mayor, I'd like to make a motion to amend that to $50,000 in one dollar. Oh, yeah. All right. So that if it comes back, <laughs> it has to come back to us right. to approve. And I'll explain that later. Yeah. So... I'll, I'll make the amendment to do it for 50 and one dollar in a few seconds. Second. There we go. <laughs> Any discussion on the amendment? amendment Alderman Repath. So is our is our cemetery that flushed if they can lose fifty thousand dollars? Well, I think he's saying it go from tourism. And I'd have Scott Dahl. Is that correct? It yeah, from the, the tourism buzz. From what I understand, the endowed care fund is at Corpus or whatever you, that legal term they're above. And so they're, part, they're starting to use some of that interest fund to pay for Oak Ridge. Not taking the now. Yeah, we're not taking it for the cemetery now. So it's coming from you? What's the hotel motel, right? Yeah, hotel motel. No, if you recall, there was a one percent that came from the hotel tax that went to the cemetery. A hundred approximately a hundred thousand dollars went for downtown tourism. So that actually bypasses our budget. It doesn't come from the SCVB budget, it comes from the hotel tax money that's routed through the cemetery. And some of that is used for the um, the allocation of the advisory group? Uh, yes, the local grants uh, could be, we have a line item. Actually, there's a line item in our budget for that that we would hope to use from that. So obviously that would that would take from that downtown promotion, but it doesn't technically come from the SCBB budget, come from the cemetery. Thank you. Any other discussion? Alderwoman Turner. So, um, I know that there has been a lot of discussion over the last couple of weeks about um, funding for Kidzeum. So I would really like to hear from uh, someone with Kidzeum that can explain where they are, where where they are right now from a fiscal standpoint, and how this fifty thousand dollars will impact their budget going <laughs> forward. Because what what is ha what has happened? Previously, and I don't want to go into a long history, but those of you that know, and Aaron, I know you're the newbie, so you weren't here. But no, but I, I've I've been following the background. <laughs> but um, Kidzim came and and asked for money, and they said this is it, this is it. Then they came back and said we need more, because if not, we won't be able to move forward. This is it, this is it, and then they came back for more, and now we're seeing that. You know, things are not meeting the projections. So I, I think that we just all need to know where they are and how this is going to impact them and what the projection looks like going forward. Let me just preface this with um, no one wants to see Kidzium fail. No one wants to see that happen. I think that they are a vital part of our downtown community, and, uh, and we all want to see them prosper and grow. As a, you know, as a, a native Springfieldian, I remember what downtown was like, and I think that Kidzium has the opportunity to, you know, to add to the possibilities of bringing that back. However, we need to understand what they're asking from the city of Springfield. If I think that everybody just needs to be open, honest, and transparent, and give everybody an opportunity to hear the story and then make an intelligent, informed decision. We can't keep doing this in the dark, fly by night. So if if what we're looking if what they're looking for is an ongoing 
partnership, relationship with the city, we need to hear that. If, if they're looking for a one-time 50,000 infusion of, of money that's going to get them over the hump and then they'll be fine next fiscal year, we need to hear that. But we need to hear the story. And, and I'm not, I mean, this is, has nothing to do with, you know, Alderman Proctor. I'm not saying that he's not telling us the story, but we need to hear the story from Kizim. Alderman Proctor. Yeah, I appreciate that, and I agree with everything you said. I completely agree with everything you said. Thank you. And I've told you that many times when we talked on the phone about this thing. Uh, Leah uh, is here from the Kidzium to come up and, to t and talk about it. Um, and yes, and I would say that we, we are in a partnership already with Kidzium because of all that money that we've been given to them already. And we, we have we, that sign on the yeah. front door and everything. Right now, we are into Kidzium for about $1.5 million. Everyone should know that. We're that is TIF dollars, which can only be yes. used for certain purposes. Yes. And, and that's what this is, is hotel motel dollars, tourism can you be only used for certain purposes. So yeah, if Lee could come up and kind of yep. go through it, that'd be all great. Uh, Desenzo, do you want to go? Yes, um, I wanted the total, the grand total of what's been spent so far. And to also explain that TIF money isn't free money. Um, people like to think that TIF is just, oh, it's a, this big pot of money, we, we've got to spend it. Um, you know, it freezes property taxes. Uh, school districts don't like them because it, it cuts down on what school districts are are than earning in increment. Um, so, you know, there's, there's a bigger component to this also. Um, when we refer to TIF money, we're not talking about just one big pot of free money that someone can just grab and use for whatever they want. It's not how it works. And Hannah? Yeah, thank, thank you, Mayor. Um, yeah, and this isn't TIF, any more TIF money, so this is, this is not uh, the same, same grab bag in a sense. But Correct. one thing, uh, the reason why I, I put it at 50,001 is uh, just, just as old, older woman Turner said, we need to have information and we need to, we need to have some, some truthful information of what's going forward. And if we do it at 50,000, everybody knows that's our limit where we don't see it again. So 50,001, they will, if they don't give us that and they, and this comes before us, we can vote it down. All we're voting for tonight is to put it in the budget. And, um, uh, and the reason, but and that was the reason why I added uh, the extra dollar, so it's over the threshold. Kind of crazy, but whatever. Um, but this way, if they don't come back, I, I'm going to support it to put it in the budget. But if I don't see, um, if I don't see a plan that I think is going to be uh, that's going to keep it afloat, I'm not going to. I will not not vote for the fifty thousand and one dollar in you know, as it comes back to the council. Very good. Alderwoman Turner. And, and just so I, I understand, this is, this will be used for operations, correct? Marketing operations, yep. yeah. Is it, Outreach. is it, is it operations? Yeah, okay, English. so I need to know, is it operations, is it, or is it marketing? Those are two totally different <clears throat> things. Yep, you'd like to come forward, Leah? <clears throat> State your name and we appreciate it. Thank you very much. My name is Leah Wilson. I'm the executive director of Kidsium, and I have our board president, Karen Witter, and she will be uh, joining me in the discussion as well. Uh, first off, I'd like to say that we're, of course, very grateful for all the support that the city has given to Kidsium. For me, it's a relatively new project, but I know for you, you've heard about this for years and years. Uh, we've been a bit of a hungry child, I guess, coming back and, and asking for repeated funds. Um, but I wouldn't be here today if I didn't think that there was a very important reason that we approach you and some real opportunities for the city to continue partnering with Kidsium for the benefit of the larger community. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions you have, but just to give you a brief overview of what I have uh, come into as the new executive director. Uh, I was hired about six months before the doors opened to Kidsium, and we had broken ground at our historic building in downtown. And uh, the building had a lot of work to do, so we were busy getting that done and, and getting an infrastructure in place. Uh, shortly before we opened, um, it became clear to me that there were some maybe surprises uh, financially that we were going to need to tackle. Uh, one of the significant challenges that we uh, had was 
the west wall of our building uh, was structurally challenged and we had a significant cost overrun to repair that. We were at a place in the construction where it didn't make sense to stop uh, the, the progress but to go forward with it. Um, so we did that. Um, in the process of, of fixing that problem and also dealing with uh, some funding shortages in the fundraising process, um, you know, we ended up with a little bit more debt than we had planned to cover and that we presented in our five-year plan to you. Um, additionally, in the five-year plan, there were projections made for admissions that have been uh, difficult for us to achieve for a variety of reasons, and I'm happy to go into those reasons uh, as well if you would like. Uh, so, uh, you know, Kidsium got off to a bit of a bumpy start. Uh, there's no denying that. Um, but I think uh, in the two years that we've been, almost two years that we've been open, uh, we have made tremendous progress and we've had some major successes. We've had over 62,000 visitors come from over 37 states. We've had around 9,000 uh, school children come. We've had uh, all wards represented, all zip codes represented. Uh, we do have reduced pricing for people who are using LINK and EBT, so we've had around 3,200 people take advantage of that. Uh, and this year, we are starting with some very exciting programs that will put us, I think, more at the center of the educational pipeline here in Springfield. So one of those is that we're going to be offering learning labs to school students who come in for school tours. They're going to learn about a, a variety of different STEM topics. Um, we're also going to be starting some summer camps, and we've got some wonderful partnerships there. One is with the Illinois Math and Science Academy. A lot of you are familiar with that, but it's a, it's a fantastic program uh, from Chicago, and we're excited to partner with them to bring uh, some new STEM programs to third graders. And we are also being considered as a pilot site for their second grade, uh, actually K through two program uh, that could start in Springfield next year and be a first for Springfield. Um, we're also doing some exciting after-school programs. We have a partnership with the Museum of Science and Industry in Chicago to provide, again, STEM content that they have put together and has their brand on it. And we're also in the process of starting an after-school program called the Young Engineers Club, which was just funded by the Community Foundation. And we are going to be able to supply not only scholarships, but transportation for students from uh, the, some of the you know, most economically challenged schools in Springfield, uh, including McLernan and also Feichens. So uh, we're doing, I think, a pretty good job in our second year of launching some programs that are not only going to help us have more of an impact educationally, but are also going to improve our earned revenue status as well. Uh, in addition to that, you know, recognizing that we need to take a fresh look at our business plan, we have uh, added some fantastic new board members, and Karen Witter can speak to that as well. Um, we've got some talent on our board that is really going to help us to be sustainable in the future, and I feel very good about that. We also have uh, support from outside of our board. So we have an advisory council from others in the community who are providing us with advice on how to move forward and be sustainable and to have the biggest impact we can. Uh, we're working with organizations like UIS and we're also talking to the school district to see how we can partner on educational programs going forward. Uh, we think we could be an important part of the innovation district. Uh, we know that they have an early learning uh, program that they're trying to get launched and we have around 5,000 square feet of unrenovated space that could potentially be used for that. Um, in addition to that, we're also looking at additional earned revenue strategies. Again, with that 5,000 square feet that's not renovated, it's possible that we could have uh, some commercial businesses come in and lease that space, so we're looking at those options as well. Um, so I'm very hopeful that uh, with these changes and the support of the city going forward that you're going to see Kidsium not only thrive as an organization on its own, but to add incredible value by partnering with some other key organizations that are trying to make a difference in Springfield. I'd like to introduce Karen Witter. Yep. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. My name is Karen Witter, and I've been the board president since January of the Kidsium. And I would say there is no one more surprised that I am standing here today asking for money for the Kidsium than me. Um, I 
uh, spent 30 years in state government. I was a former director of the Department of Energy and Natural Resources and spent 14 years at the Illinois State Museum as the associate director. I watch the Kidzeum from afar. I watch the Kidzeum maybe closer than a lot of people, but I was not on the inside of what was going on. I had, a, I had somewhat of a healthy degree of skepticism about the Kidzeum, and I was a representative as a trustee when we closed the doors of the Springfield Children's Museum on Washington Street years ago. Cleaned out my basement and found my certificate to prove it. Um, uh, Rachel Thompson, because of my position, asked me to serve on the search committee when they were hiring an executive director. My feeling was that Kidzeum could only be successful if they hired a really great executive director. First and foremost, that was critical, and I was asked to serve on that, on that board. I was happily surprised when Leah Wilson was a candidate. She brings enormous perspective, credentials, Aww. background in museums, and a board that's going through a developmental stage trying to raise money and get started is a very, very different board than a board that runs a not-for-profit startup museum. After I saw that, Le that Leah was hired, Rachel Thompson asked me if I would serve on the board. I gave it a lot of thought. I was concerned about finances. I was concerned about where we were. I decided I was gonna say yes. I'm one that has a harder time saying no. A year later, I realized more about the financial position of the Kidzeum. I have concerns, and we have gone through a major, major undertaking for a pivot. What are we gonna do to make this successful? And when Leah asked me to step up and serve as board president, she said to me, <laughs> I think we can, I can do it with you. We need to do this together. And it is very easy for Kidzium to fail, in my opinion. But a challenge for Kidzium to succeed and rise up to that challenge was the enticement for me to say yes to this opportunity. So what's happened in the last year? We have assembled a new board of, board of directors. I refused to accept the position as chair unless we had a highly competent treasurer because we need the finances to be very clear. Um, Katie Keim is the CFO of Memorial and she is our treasurer. Awesome. All I can say is awesome. We, are, we had our, our new board convened in January. We had a board retreat. We were there all day. And as opposed to board members kind of, you know, getting ready to go and shuffling their papers, they were lingering afterwards, they were asking questions, they wanted to be there, they want to succeed. And our challenge now is really, will Kidzeum succeed for Springfield or will it not? And it could go, it could go either way. So what, we ha what have we done? Assembled a team of people, um, Bill Legge, Bruce Summers, we are looking at people, um, my sister Cinda Klickna in the education world, everybody I know and anybody who runs into me is gonna hear about, hear about Kidzium. We have this external advisory committee working with us. We've gone to John Stremsterfer. He assembled a team of people to work with us. And the first thing that we want people to say is the buzz is we want Kidzium to be successful. If people say we don't think Kidzium is gonna make it, it will not. If the community says we want Kidzium to be successful, then I think we may. It's daunting, but where are we? Leah has said she will leave no stone unturned. There have been meetings with Jennifer Gill asking her the key people in the, in, the, in the school district, who are the people we need to talk to, how do we use our space more effectively, how do we bring in more students, and we're convening those kinds of conversations. What's going on with downtown, with the University of Illinois, with SIU, with we're engaged in conversations with the Cox Center and how can we be part of early learning in Springfield? So if Kidzium is only a place where you take little kids, if you have somebody of the right age or you're a parent or grandparent, that's one view. But if we can be Kidzium that is the pipeline for early childhood education, that is vital to revitalization of downtown, that makes people want to live here, that can bring young families, <coughs> that can make us part of the tourism infrastructure, 
then those are the kinds of things that I want to work on. So what will $50,000 do for us? Will it retire our debt? No. Will it solve all of our problems? No. Can we stand here and say it's going to be the salvation? No. But what it will do is it will be a vote that says the city cares about this, that in spite of all you've already done, that all we're grateful for, that everything that you've done, you don't want us to fail. With that, our hope is that we can go to all of these partners that we're working with, develop this pivot plan, develop a business model, re-engage our donors, re-engage our supporters, and be able to make this a success. Do we want a partnership with the city? Of course, we want to be a partner with the city. In normal, it was normal that came to my friend who founded the Children's Museum and said, we want you. So if there's an ongoing relationship, we don't want it to be because we're coming here for a handout, we're coming here for you to solve our problems. We would want it to be because you view Kidsium as an important partner for downtown, for Springfield, to achieve the vision that we would all like to achieve. So to say, what will the $50,000 do? You will give us <laughs> an incredible opportunity to go to the bank, to tell them we have support, to go to our donors, to say people are investing in us, and to give us a chance to carry things forward, to be as responsible as we can, to implement these programs for operational programming is how we would spend this money to do the kinds of things that we hope people would want to invest in. Alderman Donnelly. Thank you, Mayor. Leah, Karen, thank you for Thank you for being here to this evening and shedding some light. Uh, and, and actually, I appreciate prior to the meeting your willingness to chat and talk about this. It's obviously, obviously something you're very passionate about. You know, my, uh, my son Michael was two years old when we scheduled to have a birthday party at your predecessor organization, the Children's Museum here in Springfield. And we had to cancel that birthday party because they closed, they closed their doors. And here, uh, now he just turned, last week, 21 years old. <laughs> and uh, he didn't have his birthday party there again. That's a whole different story. But, um, you know, Alderman Turner, you said it best. Everybody in this room, I think, wants to see you succeed. And uh, I'm a, I tend to be a black and white numbers person at times. And the city has, the way I look at it, the city has uh, a $1.5 million investment in your organization. And I think we owe it to that investment to uh, consider this $50,001 as a part of ensuring that uh, everything you just described, uh, showing the community that we're behind it, showing the bankers that we're behind it, showing potential donors that we're behind it, because it needs to succeed in downtown Springfield. We need to provide that opportunity for our youth. Like you said it best, it's, it's not just about going and having a good time in, in, a, in a building in downtown Springfield. It's about early childhood development, which is extremely important. And quite frankly, it, it could provide uh, some individuals and, and, and children in our community and, and other communities, we hope, uh, they don't have an opportunity to experience something like this, uh, an opportunity to do so. So I intend on voting for it. But I, but I, I don't want this, uh, regardless of what happens, uh, I'd like to, I'm glad, that you, I'm glad that you have to come back and once there's a, there's a, a proposal process and ultimately has to come back to council. Uh, continue to work with us. Continue to keep us surprised on what's going on because uh, uh, I'm sure somebody in this room can has something else to offer. Thank you. Woman Turner. Um, I have I have a, que a question, but I really I, I appreciate your your presentation, and I know I've had long conversations with with both of you, and and I appreciate your you coming here, and I appreciate your your presentations. However, I think that it's unfair of you to say that a vote against this amendment is saying that we don't support Kidzium. I think that that's blatantly unfair because I think by just by the fact that we have already spent $1.5 million says loudly that we support Kids and I did not mean to imply that it would be a vote against that. Yeah. I only meant that it would allow us to go to others I who, I, I, who I are skeptical. I understand, but I just, yeah. I just, I just want to say, yeah. I, I think, I, understand that. I think that that's unfair, and I, 
I really took a little bit of offense to it because I have, there are many conflicting needs in this community. Um, needs for downtown, needs for west side, north side, east side, and I have always been supportive of all of those needs. And so I, I think to say that if we don't vote for this, it's it's not supportive, that's, that's not fair. But my question is, um, so would this $50,000 be uh, operations, outreach, um, marketing, or a combination of all three? And I'll let Leah answer that, but I do want to apologize because I did no, not, no, no I did apology not intend necessary. it. I did not really yeah. intend it that no way. No apology necessary. <laughs> The 50000 would be for operations, but I can give you an example of one of the ways that that 50000 would make a tremendous difference right now. Um, as a part of streamlining and cutting to the absolute bare bones so that we could get through some difficult times, uh, we have cut our staff and we currently don't have janitorial staff, uh, so staff members are actually doing the cleaning. Uh, we do not currently have an education director. Uh, we need to replace some of those key positions so that we can be effective. We're in the process of doing that right now. Um, to have an education director uh, will be necessary to carry out these programs that we're planning, including the partnership that I mentioned with the Illinois Math and Science Academy, where they would <coughs> like a credentialed instructor to be involved in implementing those programs, uh, to, to launch all the programs that we're talking about and to have the proper staffing to do that well, um, $50,000 would, would make that possible. Okay. So can we hear from... Scott Dahl, since this is tur tourism money that for downtown tourism, so can we hear Scott's Director take Dahl. on this? Thank you. I have also had long conversations with Leah, which I thank you for that. And um, you know, my concern from a tourism uh, viewpoint is that Kazeem is not on our group tour program. Uh, every student tour that comes through there, 15 or more, which generally there are 30 or 40 to a group, has to run through the Bureau. We uh, book over 2,000 school groups annually. There's 80,000 kids that come through uh, Springfield annually from across the state, generally between fifth and ninth grade. And so that group tour program for all of our major sites is very, very important. We, we book those for office and Kids EM's not on there. And that's my main concern. I think the pathway to their success is to get on that group tour program. And they may have to adjust some of their programming, some of their exhibits, but they can tap into those 80,000 students coming through. And again, our major sites do that already. And it helps them be sustainable. So understand the early childhood development. Obviously, that's a big part of it. But I think that path to success is tapping into those student groups coming in. Thank you. So I think the an opportunity there is that what you're Yes, I believe that that Kitsiam's missing a, a large opportunity not tapping into those student groups coming there. I, I believe that if it was geared more towards fifth to ninth grade, that we could load them into our group tour program and they would be built into their schedules and that they would come through Kitsiam and that would add an additional revenue stream for Kitsiam. And again, we're all about Kids Eam. I mean, they're, they're our front and center on all of our marketing. There are several times in our visitor's guide, we have a special insert, they're on the first page. I mean, we constantly market Kids Eam. We want to tell our leisure travelers about that, and that's great for our flam families that come in through the summertime, but that's the summertime. That's May, June, July, August, September, and we're done. So they need year round. So, so can I ask you, is there a model for this somewhere else that they're not following? I, I mean, I'm not saying, I, I don't know what their plan is, but I, there's got to be a model someplace that, that shows this, that that's effective. There, there could be, and I'm not, a, I'm not an expert there, but I do know that we are unique being the capital city and having these school groups come to the capital city, going through the Presidential Museum, visiting the Capitol, going to Lincoln's tomb. I mean, that's built in. We've had these 80,000 kids for the last 30 years, and we will continue to have them for the next 30 years. So even if you capture just a portion of that, and again, <coughs> Alderman Proctor and I have had those discussions as well, capture a portion of those, capture 50 or 60,000 of those, at $4 uh, per student, and you've got a built-in base. And I believe that's the path to success for Kizzy. Thank you. Yeah, and uh, 
Bob Yazel and I went to normal with uh, Leah Wilson, and you know I'd encourage anybody to go there. But what's clear is to they need uh, to build out that other building that they own. So they need to put that to use, and uh, that's what we encourage them to look at when they're looking at their long-term plans, because I think everybody's in agreement. We want it to be a success. It's a key component for downtown. How do we get there? And I think that's what they're trying to uh, move towards. What's that strategy as we go forward? Alderman Proctor? Yeah, and I appreciate you giving them advice for however long you've been doing this, and uh, I think they're, they are very open to that. I don't think they're opposed to doing anything like that, and I think that's something that they're looking to do as well. I don't want to speak for them, but my conversation with them, I think they are open to doing stuff like that, and they want to do stuff like that. Alderman, Alderman Gregory? <laughs> Sorry. I, I definitely agree. Um, I, I had spoke to Miss Leah um, for quite some time on, on uh, the kids Zim and its success. Um, I think it, uh, you know, it's a little difficult with with, with the their setup with the one way street down there. I think it hurts them a little bit. Obviously, we have a, a missed opportunity by not being part of the the tourism. Um, I didn't I didn't catch Miss Leah if if this was going to be a one time. I, if we I, I know we're saying it this year one time, but. Are we going to anticipate having to come back in the future to do some of these uh, redevelopments that's, that may be needed to uh, take it to the full scale? Thank you. We're prepared to ask for one year, although I would echo what Karen said and just take that further and say, uh, you know, one of the, the things that I've been doing and the board has been doing in this process of looking at our business plan is, is looking at some other models in other places in the, in the country to see what kinds of partnerships are not only the most effective for museums, but also spur some innovative education programs. And, you know, uh, you mentioned normal. Um, there is obviously city support for that children's museum. Uh, Peoria Playhouse, which is their children's museum, is part of the park district, so they get support, uh, ongoing operational support that way. Um, there are other models in the in the country that also have similar models. So, uh, you know, I, I think I would still like the opportunity to keep the city apprised of the plans that we're making. Uh, you know, we are looking at some very promising partnerships with UIS and the Innovation District and the School District. Uh, there's a possibility for forming a center for innovative education that would be STEM focused, uh, looking at similar models across the country. Um, it's often a partnership among the city, the universities, and the school districts. So we, we don't want to rule out that we wouldn't uh, come back to you and, and mention those, those opportunities. Um, I was recently in, in Pittsburgh, and at the Children's Museum in Pittsburgh, uh, their school district actually leases two of their classrooms uh, in their main museum and does programming there. And then they, they also opened a museum lab for middle schoolers, which is one of the things I wanted to look at because I do realize, uh, and in, our, in the surveys that we've just recently completed, uh, a lot of our constituents who responded said they not only want more things for toddlers, but they also want things for older children as well. So we are engaging in those conversations and looking at some ways we could do that, not only with our existing space, but as we could, as uh, Mayor Langfelder suggested, uh, move into the other 5,000 square feet. So yes, for today, uh, prepared to ask for $50,000 for one year, but certainly hope that uh, the council members would be interested in learning about future opportunities. All right. And, and um, I know uh, Alder Woman Turner had, had uh, and we've had some conversations about just diversity and making sure we, we're reaching across the, the, the tracks to make sure that we're, we're doing that. Um, so for our, for our council, I, I just, you know, like I told her, it'd be very hard for me to vote no, even though I want to. Um, but because I love kids, you know, that, that, that it just is what it is. Um, but I, I just want our council to know that we got we to gotta decide what we're going to do because this is going to be a partnership or it's not. Um, and then we have to be prepared to put in the same energy, 1.5 million, um, into programs and things across those tracks that, that have been attempted. And, and that's why I, I, I don't want to vote for it, but I'm not going to be selfish and do that. But I just want to see the same energy um, for programs across those tracks, across 11th Street, um, you know, and, and, and I, you know, I, I look at you, you know, you're the mayor, you know, you have some conversations with, with some people over there, and, you know, I, I just want to see us fulfill on that, and, uh, you know, that's how I feel about it. 
Very good. Permission to respond. Oh yeah. Um, sure. I, I feel very strongly about Kidzian being a place that is inclusive uh, and represents our community and serves our community to the fullest. And part of that process was doing a community input session. We had over 423 survey respondents and we had three focus groups and we did some individual um, interviews also with, with donors and other constituents. And you know, unfortunately, what we found is that yes, the majority of the people who responded are white. That is not uncommon uh, for museums, uh, but it is information that I take to heart and I think the board is taking very seriously. I don't think it, it reflects a lack of interest or lack of planning in that uh, issue. I think what it allows us to do though is to create a baseline and without that data, we wouldn't know how to move forward. So now that we do have a baseline for that, uh, we're going to take that community input and move into strategic planning. And in the strategic planning process, we're going to include the community uh, further and hope that we can develop some very robust uh, strategies to increase the diversity, not only of our, our board and staff, but to make sure that we are reaching visitors outside of uh, the typical demographics. <clears throat> And that, uh, I'd just like to point out again that some of these early projects that we're planning for this year are our first attempt uh, at some pilot programs to address that. So the, the Community Foundation grant for the Young Engineers Club is uh, scholarships for children who would not be able to afford to come to an eight-week program like that. We're also trying to remove the barrier of transportation, which is significant for people uh, in um, you know various parts of our community. And that's going to be a, a very important project for us to, to begin to, as you say, uh, make sure that we're reaching out into the community and serving the community to the fullest. And there are other examples of that as well. Uh, we have a Rotary grant as well to provide uh, scholarships to low-income schools so that they can bring their students uh, for school trips as well. So we're, we're a young organization. Uh, we have uh, a lot of room for growth, but I, I do think that we are starting with some good data and we have uh, a nice foundation to build on. Alderman Proctor? Uh, I'll yield to okay, Alderman Turner. Alderman uh, Conley first, then Turner. Um, I, I appreciate your comments because Second. I really feel that that is one of the um, low points of Kidsium. I think that it is it it is not um, there's no diversity at all within those four walls, none whatsoever. And I think that with the huge partnership that the city has put into Kidsium, I would expect more. And I and I hear you talk about. All of the things, and you know, you and I have talked about, we, we talked about this, so this is nothing new. We've talked about this before. And I hear you talk about all of the things that you're doing to make sure that low-income, underserved, underprivileged minority kids get there. But every person, every minority person, kid in Springfield that would be part of access to Kidsium is not low income underprivileged. So the so the outreach and the engagement has to be broad and and overreaching. It's not just that segment of, of the population. Um, I mean it, it it from beginning to end, Kidsium was never marketed or never engaging for the entire community. I'll just be very blunt. It was always appeared to be, and I, and I think everyone, if they were honest, would agree with me, it was a upper middle class white organization that targeted upper middle class white kids. And so that, that has to change. And, and, I, and I think it, it doesn't just change by outreaching to that low-income, underprivileged segment of, of the community. It has to be much broader, it has to be much bigger than that. And I, and I, I need, and, and that doesn't change unless you have other voices at the table and, and in the room when those conversations are, are being had. When, when you're talking about developing exhibits, people have to be in the room. When you're talking about outreach, people have to be in the room. You have to have a diverse staff because otherwise you're just hearing that one 
voice. And that's and that's that's the reason why, you know, it's not as successful as it as it could be. And you know, I love kids too. I have three of them. I have ten grandchildren. But you know, I mean, you know, it, there comes a time when you have to say, "Hey, it, it's everybody has to be included, and every and everybody has to uh, step up and to the plate and do what they need and do what they need to do and be accountable." So. May I respond? Sure. Uh, first of all, I, uh, I, I really appreciate what you are saying, and I, I want you to know that I, I am personally committed to changing the situation at Kids EM. I, I can't change the past. I can't change the early planning that went into it. I can't change the way it was marketed. I can't change a lot of things uh, about the way Kids EM got started. But Kids EM is here. And I'm here, and I am dedicated to working with all members of this council, every ward, and anyone who would like to come forward and help us to be the best museum possible to serve as many people in this community as possible. We do have some diversity on our board, and we do have some diversity on our staff, and we certainly have diversity coming in the doors, and I, I don't think that you do a service to those who do come to our museum by saying that they're not there because they are. So I would uh, just encourage everyone who's considering the future of Kidsium, as difficult as it is, to try to look past some of those early decisions that were made and the things that we don't like about the way it was conceived, and to recognize that you now have leadership in place who really wants to make a difference, not only on the staff side, but from the board. And I think we have the expertise and the, the willpower to, to see it through, and I just encourage any and all of you who have suggestions about how we can do that, please reach out to me because I'm, I'm here to make it a better place for the community. Okay, not to be argumentative, but do you have demographic data on, um, on visitors and, and, because I will tell you, I've been to four events at Kidsium. And every time I've been, and I know four events out of, you know, the two years that you've been open is not representative of the people who are there. But I will tell you, the four times that I, were, I was there, it was me and my grandkids. So I'm not saying that other people out, don't go. I'm just saying that it's not in the numbers that it, sh that it should be. And, and that's the last thing I'm going to say about it. Alderwoman Connolly. Thank you. Um, and thank you again for, for coming and sitting through a fairly lengthy discussion for $50,000. Um, I, I would like to, first of all, I'm going to echo where I can because other people have said things better than I have. Um, I, along with Alderman Donilon, had my young children at the original Kid Children's Museum. Um, they've aged out of that, and I'm looking forward to bringing my granddaughter in. I appreciate and respect the fact that you are willing to acknowledge that you've had problems. I think that takes strength and not every organization has the ability to do that. And that actually gives me much more hope for you moving forward. Um, I don't want this to look like it's a Ward 2 and Ward 3 issue that we have diversity represented at Kidsium. Um, my Ward, Ward 8 is diverse. Um, we have, and I would like to know that, that the clients that are going to Kidsium are reflective of our entire city. Um, and, and it is important that, that we see that outreach. Um, my, my husband used to teach at Matheny. Those, there are some really bright kids who deserve access to the kinds of resources that you're offering. And I'm pleased to see that you're including transportation in there too, because as a, as a, when I was a single mom, transportation for kids in the summertime can be very daunting. So I, I appreciate, I think you're making good steps. Um, thank you for coming in and acknowledging where you, you had some fallings. Um, I look forward to seeing improvements. Uh, I think that Kidsium is, is a really important feature of our downtown. I'm excited to see you succeed and I'm, I'm voting tonight to help in, in support of that. So thank you. Any other questions? Alderman McMinimum. Real briefly, uh, I was a no vote on this, uh, but I've become a yes vote for three reasons. Number one, because the request has been downsized from 100 grand to 50 grand. Number two, because the 50,000 is a one-time request. 
um, and, and number three, because the source of the money is hotel motel money. And I think what we want in the city of Springfield is a diversity of activity. So when families come in from out of town and the, and the mother's at a professional association meeting or the father's at a convention or they're here for the state fair and it's a big, bad rain day and they need something else to do, the Kids' Museum is an outstanding place to take those young kids. And so um, we, we, uh, that's why I'm at a yes vote for this. Thank you. Any other discussion? All those in favor of the motion say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. No. 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 Oh. <coughs> Alderman Redpath. No. Alderman Gregory. Yes. Alderwoman Turner. No. Alderman Fulgenzi. Yes. Alderman Proctor. Yes. Alderwoman DeCenso. No. Alderman McMiniman. Yes. Alderwoman Connolly. Yes. Alderman Donnellan. Yes. Alderman Hanauer. Yes. You have three no's and seven yeses. Motion passes. Rick McCarty, number four. Number four is an amendment sponsored by Alderwoman Conley. It is to purchase 10 police cars out of corporate fund balance at a cost of $490,000. I, I move that we um, pass this amendment. Second? Second for discussion. Thank you. Um, and I, and I, I understand the reluctance around the horseshoe. I've, I've heard from you. Um, I have heard, I've been listening, that we do have a vehicle replacement um, plan in place. I appreciate that, and I appreciate that, that it, has, it has been um, spread out over the years. Chief Winslow, you have come before us to talk about the fact that re attracting and retaining new officers is an issue for you. What I would like to do in an instance like this, where we, um, even if we pass every one of these amendments, we will have a 17.2% fund balance remaining. This is a one-time option where I see that we have some extra money where we can invest it in our police department and get rid of some of these cars, these 2008 vehicles that our officers are driving. We're looking at someone's workplace, which is on the streets, and I find it um, discouraging that, that our officers are in cars this old. I don't, I don't think that anyone's vote in this case on this amendment would, would um, disagree with me on that. I am asking for your consideration that we take the fact that we have a healthy fund, ba fund balance this year, that we invest it in our officers of safety, their, their office space, that we can use this to attract more people, some young officers who can come and, and understand that we value their, their time, their, um, and just where they work. So I don't feel, I don't know if we need to have a whole lot of, I just it's not a kids DM discussion, right? If you'd like to speak to the amendment, please. And actually, if I could real, real quickly, because um, one thing that Alderman Hanauer has brought up, and I, I think um, Alderman Redpath mentioned this also, is should this not pass, I do think there needs to be an encouragement that instead of new vehicle purchases going to people at the top of the ranks, we need to be looking at filling the bot that our, our officers, our patrol officers on the street and ensuring that the people who are spending the most time in vehicles have the newest vehicles. Well, I'd like to address that first. Cause Thank you. The new cars don't go to the top of the rank. None of my staff drives a Mark Squad car. Uh, in fact, I drive a C's car that's got 140,000 miles on it. So does my assistant chief. Uh, there's two people in operation who drive unmarked SUVs. The way we're able to make these cars last is that these cars go to the take-home car program, where they're driven for five or six years and they only have 50 to 60,000 miles on them. When they get about the six-year mark, then we push them down into the fleet where they average about 30,000 miles a year. And then within two to three years, they're ready to be retired out because they got 140, 150,000 miles on them. That's how we're able to make these cars work. If we put brand new cars in the fleet, then those cars would be no good after about three to four years. They would be 150,000 miles and shot. The way they're taken care of is because they're driven one time a day, not two, three times a day. 
It's also one of the incentives that we have to keep people in the community to live in the city of Springfield because you can only get a take-home car if you live in the city. So you're right that the fleet cars are the older cars. We push those down. Typically, the car hits about 70, 65, 70,000 miles when we push it down into the fleet. Uh, but they are the older cars. And those typically are driven by the younger officers who don't have the seniority to get a take-home yet that lives in the city. Or they're driven by people who live out of town by their choice. Okay, and I, and I thank you for that, Chief. I, I appreciate that. And again, this is this is not a criticism of how you handle the vehicles, um, and I'm not saying that these. I, I'm just saying we do have a healthy fund balance this year. I've had, I've heard concerning reports about about the condition of, of the vehicles that our patrol officers are driving, and this is my first budget. And you all get to have a whole slew of Conley amendments tonight. So. Well, I'd like to just say that obviously we thank your support. We do need cars, there's no doubt about that. The city has one pie, we understand that. We know we only give a chunk of it. And I will say the city has been good to us in the past, even though we only purchase cars every three to four years. Uh, they've been good with us on it. And we're waiting on 28 that we ordered in July. We're on a 45 week delivery rate, or delivery cycle. Yes, so I understand cars, you're ordering popular vehicles. They're very popular vehicles. But I was just informed the other day that 45 weeks is probably gonna be closer to 52 weeks now because of the back delayed by floor by Ford. So as soon as we get that 28, we're still going to be left, I think, with 21, 2008 that are averaging right now around 140,000 miles on them. So those are older cars, and they don't take in idle time. According to my garage personnel, the idle time on most of those cars is around 225 to 250,000 miles. Mm -hmm. So they are older cars. Our garage does a wonderful job keeping these cars upright, moving, and safe. So with that, um, We'll take any cars you're willing to give us, you know. We've put a plan forward under Alderman Senor, and he asked us to put one together that required purchasing 12 to 14 Mark Squad cars per year and two detective cars per year to rotate their fleet every 10 years. We've looked at it again. That's still the numbers that are needed to make it work if you're going to rotate them every 10 years. Typically, we're getting rid of cars right now because, one, just because of the, the, the cycle we've been in, the recession, that we haven't been able to buy as many cars as we would like to. We understand that. I, you know, I have this conversation every budget year. We try to ask what we absolutely 100% have to have and not go above that. Uh, I understand there's fire trucks and I understand that public work needs vehicles. We're trying to be a team player here, but I'll definitely take 10 more vehicles if you want to vote in my way. I appreciate you being a team <laughs> player here. Alderman Redpath. Chief, uh, I commend Alderman Connolly for, for bringing this forward. She, it comes from the heart. I know it does. She, she, felt like there was, a, there was a situation where someone was unsafe. Is it, are, are your officers driving unsafe vehicles? No. Basically, we had, since November 1st, we've had uh, three to four incidents of carbon monoxide in the vehicles. Each time, the range has been under the OSHA standard for eight hours of a vehicle of 50 parts per million. Uh, they've been tested. One time it was tested and came up in zero. Um, so on a couple others, yeah, there was a header boat loose on one of them. They downed the car because they said it wasn't worth the time to remove the engine and put the vehicle into uh, to repair the engine. The other one they've repaired. Each one of these older cars is inspected every time it comes in for a PM. So for a take home car, I was told that's about every three months. For a uh, fleet car, that's about every four to five weeks. So they are inspected. Out of abundance of caution, we place CO2 detectors in the older vehicles to have it set at a rate where if it went off at 30, parts per million versus 50, nobody would be in danger. We would be able to remove that car, have it inspected immediately, and then see what the issue was, if there were an issue there. I've been in your chair. I've uh, ran a police department myself, and I know how, how tough it is to get vehicles when you need them. Um, we always had uh, supervisors check the vehicles on a regular basis through shifts. Um, is, that, is that a practice that you use? Yeah, the shifts supervisor are in charge of doing inspections. Uh, with that said, you know, as far as mechanical inspections, we depend on our officers. They're supposed to inspect the car every day that they get in the car. If there's something wrong with it, we have a garage that's opened, not 24-7, but it's open in the daytime, it's open in the uh, evening hours. You can down that car immediately, take another car, and it will be sent an email for a repair request to get that car looked at. So again, they are older cars, there's no doubt about it. And like I said, I, I'm more than happy to take 10 of them if you want to throw I, them my I know, way. I know you are, and the thing is, is I support your plan that you have in place right now. I think that's a sufficient for what we need, and I'll support that. Thank you. Thank you. Alderman Hanauer. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Um, you know, <clears throat> two years ago, just to give you a little background, um, we were in a mess. and. Uh, I know uh, Alderman Donnellan and I literally were going through lines cutting 
$250, $500 out trying to save as much money as we possibly could. And, uh, uh, it, you know, we had to raise taxes, and there, that was a tough vote. And now, right this year, yeah, we're at 17, whatever, 18. But it can go very quick. It can go very quick. And uh, I just, from, from my standpoint, I just, I just am very concerned, and I've said it before, I'm extremely concerned of what, what's going to happen with the pilot. Uh, we're going to have some issues with that. And, you know, that's a big chunk of our budget that we're going to have to look at. So I, I hate not to vote for, for uh, equipment for the, the, the police and the fire. I mean, I, I'm a big supporter of it, but I like what we, I, I think we've got a good plan going forward. And I think that we stay with that plan. I mean, again, if, if there's a situation where you don't have enough cars for police officers, that's when you got to come back to us later on in the year and say, hey, I need, I, we wrecked a couple car, we did whatever, and then we have to look at it. But um, I'm just, I'm just, I don't want us to look at this budget as being flush with money. You know, keep in mind, we had to borrow from the fund balance, wasn't it, what, 1.5, 1. 1.7? This year? Yeah. It's about 1.7. So we're actually, this budget is taking money, we're, we're spending more than what we took in. Keep that in mind. So we, we have to watch our spending. We have to watch our spending or we're going we're gonna to be in the same boat that we are in, we were in two years ago. And it is not pleasant. I will say this budget, budget uh, process has been a little bit smoother than it was the last two years. And I would rather keep it this way than what it was two years ago. And just for clarification, Director McCarty, what makes up the 1.5? Isn't it a carryover for the uh, police contract? So it's not necessarily expenses accrued it's, for the it's upcoming. It's not just the police contract. There are some other things that are rolling over from right. the current year that are currently unspent. But that amount is roughly 1.4 million in total, right. all those items. And so, then there's right. additional on top of that with uh, some of the one-time things that are in the budget. So those were set aside in this year's budget, carryover expenses? Yes, yes. So the fund balance, a majority of the fund balance usage is attributable to some of those things that are rolling over, including or inclusive of the unsettled police contract. Alderman Conley. Thank you. Um, and thank you, um, Alderman Hanauer. And I, I do hope everyone on this council understands I'm learning a lot from you. <coughs> and and I, I certainly don't dismiss the, the pain that you guys got to go through. I, I feel very fortunate to have a balance this year for my first budget. Um, again, that was my thought process behind putting this amendment forward was that should we get in a pinch, at least we would have already had 10 more cars. So um, I, I do appreciate your patience with me. And, um, you know, I'm, I'm, I am being optimistic. Chief, I hope that you understand that I, I think what I'm hearing is that there is support that should a need come for training, equipment, supplies that is not already budgeted. Um, I certainly be very supportive and I, I think I think this council is supportive of that. So while I appreciate your discretion and um, restraint in asking, um, I'm kind of a ask for the sky and then bargain down kind of girl. So um, that's my philosophy on this. So I, I thank you for those comments. But just to clarify, Alderman Hanauer hit it right on the head. If the chief needs it or if the fire chief needs it, they know they got to come back to us. It's a tough deal for us to have to deal with that. But we're going to make sure that it, there are yeah. firemen and our policemen and our public works people are safe as they could possibly be. Yeah, and, that's, and I'm sorry, Alderman Redpath, that's, that was kind of... You said it the way I meant to say it. That was that was where I was how I was trying to phrase that. So, um. and then, uh, Chief, for the record, if you could, uh, what's the average cost per car? Right at fifty thousand, forty-nine thousand. Um, <clears throat> the ten we were talking about here, we're going to be on our vehicles. They're black because they were in stock. Versus waiting another forty-five, fifty weeks to get cars, we could get those immediately, and so those would be placed into uh, certain specialty positions in patrol. Uh, an undermarked car, low mark profile, low profile car, but they would be answering calls for service, and then we would take squad cars that are currently assigned to other people and push those down is how it would go if we were to get them. 
But again, I don't want to shoot myself in the foot here. I'd take anything. There is a need. Let me make that clear. There is a need. I'll take There's anything. There's always a need. Thank you, Chief. Thank you. Stay Thank there, you. man. You got a lot more coming. <laughs> Any other discussion on that amendment? All in favor say aye. I don't believe there was a motion for passage. There was a motion oh, for, for discussion. passage, and then there's a motion to discussion. So is there a movement for uh, passage? I move that we pass this amendment. Is there a second? Dies for lack of a second. Thank you. Amendment number five. Director McCarty. Amendment number five is sponsored by the administration. This is to add an additional $78,000 to the police budget for training purposes. The reason for this is the fact that training that used to be reimbursed by the state of Illinois, we're understanding that that reimbursement will not be available in the coming year. And we do have some recruits coming in that we need to train. So we need to add some additional money that will be from the city in order to complete that training. Alderman Rep. Path. So, Chief, uh, is this money that comes from the local law enforcement training board uh, that we're missing out on? And how come that money's drawn down? So, the only law enforcement training standard board is funded by what they call the task fund. Uh, with that said, there were some changes into that fund. Monies were distributed different, uh, as well as some discretionary override by some judges as far as fines and fees that could be assessed that are no longer being assessed. So, my understanding is that training board is being funded at about 50% or less. Uh, than what was previously had been. And they fund several things, not just our uh, basic training academies. They also fund our mobile training unit, which is now canceled all classes till the end of the year, or till the end of the fiscal year for the state, July, because there's no money to fund it. Um, with that said, we were notified by the uh, academy, Macon County Law Enforcement Training Center, uh, two days before we were sending the current class there, that we needed to come up with $70,000 to send our people. Typically in the past, what has happened is that the academy has direct billed the training board and the training board just pays them back. We're no longer in the middle of it. Now, the way it's going to work is we have to put the money up front. Then we can apply for reimbursement from the training board and they will give whatever funds they have available. What that rate's going to be, I don't know. I can tell you with the Chiefs Associations, the Sheriff's Association, the PDPA, and the FOP, this is our number one legislative priority this year. Um, I was notified late Friday that uh, Senator Menard is at least putting forth a bill for a funding stream. Good. Whether it, where it goes, I don't know. How it's going to be funded, I don't know. But we have been made aware that at least he's going to put something forward to try to correct this problem. <laughs> I don't know if it's a one-time fix or if it's going to be a, a... You answered all my question because that's what I was going to go to next. If, is it going to be a one-time thing? Is there legislators that are trying to address this at, the, at that level? And I can tell you that from every chief that I've talked to, and I sit on the legislative committee for the Illinois Chiefs, that it is our number one priority. Uh, you have to have people that can go to the academy, and it's hard to come up with that kind of funds up front to put people through the academy, especially your smaller departments. It's the difference in not training somebody, not hiring somebody. So this is, the, this is the money just to cover the cost of those cadets and not, not your mobile training units? No, right. this money is specifically to pay for the tuition for the basic academy. And let me go back to this. I've been telling you guys for three years we're in the middle of a huge turnover in our department. We are an older department. I got 10 in the academy right now. I need 10 more in May. And I need 10 more at least in January to keep up with retirements that we anticipate this year. So we're going to be needing money. If they don't fix this problem, this money we're asking here is for the May class because I'm hoping by July they'll have a funding source in place and we don't have to come back and ask you in January for additional funds. So if you know that, why aren't we addressing the May one right now too? This, this is the May one. All right, and the next one is? January of next year. Okay. So we're hoping after July 1st there will be a funding stream there and this problem will be rectified prior to January. If it's not, unfortunately, I'll probably be asking for a supplemental come next December to you know, November, December. Right. Alderman Hanauer. Mayor, I make a motion we, uh, for passage. Second. 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 Move for passage and second. Any d other discussion? All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. Wow, oh, unanimous. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. One. Amendment number six. <laughs> Amendment number six is sponsored by Alderman Hanauer. This would reduce funding for a police commander in the, I think, administrative ops division. $3,659 in reduction, and that is corporate fund. I'll make a motion for passage. Second. A move and second for passage. And what was the amount? It was just, it's a negative $3,659. Like 
say a couple things. Yeah, go ahead. Um, real quick, just I realize it's it's not a lot of money, but here's here's the bottom line. When you guys came to us for the deputy, the, chief, the assistant chief or deputy chief, you said you were giving up a commander. Um, I'd rather see the people on the street than another commander. Um, and and you know, yeah, it's it's only thirty six hundred dollars because somebody's going to get promoted up. But then what happens? You're going to see the whole stair step. But every it's going to go up. And somebody else is going to get it. Somebody else is going to get it. And somebody else. I just, you know, Chief, I'm not against it, but but we made a deal on, on the assistant job, and I, I just, that's why I put it in. No, I'd, I'd like to address that. Okay. You're 100% we did. And what we've learned is that the workload, the additional responsibilities that are coming in on the admin services side, the technology, the mandate, training mandates that are being put on us by the state, the technology, the accreditation we're going to be doing this year, uh, the NIBRS transition that the feds have put on us, all these things are taking additional bodies. We're going to have to put somebody in that place to help with the workflow. I did not come back and ask for an additional body. I'm restructuring to take that body. But you're right. I'm going to have to put another person up there to help out. And uh, whether that, you know, right now we're getting by with light duties, et cetera. The second portion of this is that it's a session planning. The facts are that my deputy chief of admin services will be in his 27th year this year, and he will be hitting retirement age this fiscal year. And the conversations I've had with him is that if the right opportunity comes along, he most likely will leave. So we have to start planning for training somebody to take over some of those duties, some of that responsibility. Uh, you're right. I, I came to you. I asked that. You're 100 percent right. And if I didn't have to come ask again, I wouldn't be asking. But we're going to have to put somebody there, whether I make that a sergeant spot, whether I make it a lieutenant spot or a commander spot. If I make it a sergeant spot, the cost actually is going to go up because I'm going to be paying overtime for all the work he's going to do. He's going to get a sick time sell back on top of that. And his hourly rates almost are what we're paying due to the wage compaction for the non-union. So by putting a lieutenant there, I'm actually going to save the city money. Or by putting a commander there, I'm probably going to save the city money. Yeah, Chief brings up a good point and uh, goes to the point of the HR assistant director. It's for succession planning. So that's the other uh, directive I asked all the directors to look at is succession planning. And we're going through with CWLP. I mean, it's important that we have individuals that can move up, uh, and we don't want to lose that knowledge base. So the... So, I'm going to speak. <clears throat> So you're going to move a lieutenant into that spot? Why don't Why don't he stay as a lieutenant instead of a commander? A sergeant or lieutenant. You're right. We could do that. And what about that? You got other commanders throughout. You have an operations, investigations, and, and one administration. That would be if we got the spot. Yes. So can you prioritize the other ones to help with that with those duties? Right now. We're still down from our pre-recession because <coughs> we know we had a cut of a DC. We made a deal, commander. chief. You're right, and we'll get by. We will get by, but I'm going to have to put somebody in there. Right now, if you know the deputy chief's gone for a week vacation, assistant chief Scarlett and myself we step in, we help. Donnie Mumo don't want to go on vacation. Donnie Mumo couldn't do admin. <laughs> no offense to Donnie, <laughs> but or would he want to? <laughs> or would he want to? So, with that said, in all due respect. Uh, uh, we will get by, but we're going to have to take that body and put that body here to help there with all of the things that are coming through. Alderman Donnelly. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, Chief, just, just, a, just a point of clarification. I'm well aware that you are part of the executive branch. The mayor is the CEO of the city. You make the decisions on as far as how the structure of the department goes, who goes where, and so forth. What's the police department budget? $50 million. $50 million. This is a $3,600 change. So uh, I think it, well, uh, I think it sends a message and maybe maybe a needed message. Um, but my point is that 36, if this is cut and this passes unanimously or what I have, you get six votes, you're going to still be able to do what we'll you're by. proposing. Just want to be completely Absolutely. transparent here. So 100% great. We'll get by. Thank you. Any other discussion? All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed say nay. Motion passes. Number seven. Amendment seven is sponsored by Alderman Connolly and Alderman Gregory. This would add an additional inspector in public works, a housing inspector. The cost is $74,013 from corporate fund balance. Is there a motion? I move that we accept this amendment. Second. 
Moved and second to accept the uh, recommendation for additional housing inspector and second it. Any discussion? Mayor, if I could. Yep, go ahead. Again, this this is, um, and I, I ask everyone's patience again, but this this is an issue that has come up repeatedly for all of us where we're, we're dealing with situations in our neighborhoods um, where we have houses that are, are problematic, where we have housing issues that are, are creating problems that are dragging an entire neighborhood down. I'm, I'm not going to bring up the particular issue that's had plenty of press coverage, but we've all got them. We're all dealing with this issue. What I would like to see is we give an additional inspector to um, the housing department so that they have more bodies, more eyes on the street, and additional people going and ensuring that the ordinances that we pass that deal with health and safety in our neighborhoods are enforced. So I, I would ask your support for this amendment. Any other discussion? Alderman Redpath. Uh, Nate, could you address this, please? Is this, is this something you're requesting, or is this? Oh, and I should be clear, this is, no, this was me, again. Tell me your side of this. <laughs> I'm, I'm not totally opposed to this yet. I, I okay. Wanted to, yeah, yeah, we could obviously offer a higher Thank level you. of service if we have additional inspectors. We could um, reduce the size of a, a few of the different locations so that they could be a little bit more proactive uh, whenever responding. However, our staff that we have right now, I think, does a great job and is very responsive and usually is out to inspect within 24 hours any, any problems. Uh, and I, I'm sorry, if I could real quick, and I know, because I know Alderman Redpath is going to make some really great points. If I could just jump in real quick and say, none of these amendments that I've proposed tonight are in any way, shape, or form to disparage existing staff. I, I sat down at your inspector's meeting. Um, you have a great group of people, and, and that's just, let's just take that, that's off the table. That is not what this is implying. So, thank you. Very good. Uh, Alderman Redpath, then Alderwoman Turner. Go ahead, Doris. So how would this position be integrated into your current staffing? We'd have to determine that, but we may um, reduce a couple of the sizes of the areas that are covering that have more calls. <coughs> uh, we could be a little bit more proactive in some of those. However, we've not determined that at this time. Any other discussion? No discussion, Mayor. Yes, Alma McMinimum and then Gregory. I'm in favor of additional inspector because we have that need, but I think it should wait until we've got the revenue stream uh, to support it, the new uh, revenue stream. I know we've got representatives from inner city older neighborhoods here, and including Bill Basket, and they have proposed or will propose ideas. Uh, for example, uh, when violators have to come to the administrative municipal court, there should be a filing fee for that. And that could be a, a new revenue stream that could support an additional inspector. Uh, number two, uh, we've talked about registration of non-owner-occupied properties uh, like Peoria has, which brings in $100,000, $200,000 a year. That's another s new source of revenue that could support the additional inspectors. So until we have those uh, new additional sources of revenue, um, I don't think we should spend down our corporate fund for this. It's premature, so that's the reason for a no vote on this until we have the money to support the additional position for our corporate fund. Alvin Gregory? I, I think uh, this this position, is, you know, honestly, they could probably use some other things, but, but you know, I, it's something that, that I, I probably send Mr. Harris an email every day on. Sometimes I feel bad to send him so many emails. <laughs> I mean, and it's not a knock to them, but I don't think three or it's three inspectors we have four to five. Four or, or whatever. But, I, you know, I, I think you guys could use, uh, you know, another one for, for the proactiveness. Um, I, I get it, Alderman uh, McMenamin, that, that, you know, you would like to see, you know, uh, revenue straight forward. But, you know, people can't, can't just sit and wait. So we, you know, just in the neighborhoods look a mess, you know, until we, we can find the money for everything else. We, this is, like, important. We need to find it for, the, you know, this. And, you know, you guys could probably use another labor or something to, to really get on it. We got some areas that, that are really, really bad. And, you know, I think, you know, it, it really drags down um, some of the, the major veins uh, from the east and to the west uh, uh, of this city. And I, I think, uh, you know, I'm, you know, everything that, that I'm going to do, I mean, I, I might seem like I'm pressing them six months in. But, I mean, it's, you know, we got to get rolling for sure. So. Alderman Proctor? Yeah, I think this is something that 
we could support to add to public works. So what is it four or five right now that you got? We have five. five. One of them, though, basically does zoning as well part of the time. Okay. And then to Alderman Benjamin's point, sorry, I got a breath in my mouth. Um, just because we appropriate it beginning March 1, we're not going to hire somebody March 1. What's the HR ramp up? You do what, six weeks to two months to hire somebody in the city of Springfield, it seems like, sometimes? So I think we'd be able to address those proposals that ICON will probably be bringing forward, and then we'll have the position in place and don't have to come back with a supplemental for the position. So I support it as is. Alderman Hanauer. Thank you, Mayor. Um, you know, <clears throat> another inspector, yeah, might get them out there. In, you know, they're, they're, get, they're getting out to calls in 20, 24 hours. That's pretty dang gone good, you know. Um, I, think that, I think that the problem isn't the number of inspectors we have. It, the problem is getting people to clean, clean the stuff up. And, 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 you know, we've talked about that, and we're, you know, I know you're working on that, and I, I look forward to seeing that because, um, you know, I think we start hitting them in the pocketbooks and we'll clean a lot of this stuff up. Mm -hmm. I mean, I really think that's the key. And 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 uh, I don't agree with ICON too often, but I think we do need to make sure that when somebody goes to a, don't fall over, Polly, don't fall over. But when people go to, when people go to uh, court, they should get fined regardless. They should get a fine every time we go out on, on the call and it's warranted, they should have a minimum fine because we spent staff time out there and then if the, when that comes around then we ought to look at look at this but I think it's a little premature but I, the issue I don't think is the number of inspectors because they do a good job and I think in, in sitting in their meeting their frustration was they go out there and then it gets it gets thrown out when it gets to them in court and nothing happens if people don't get fined so that's why I say when they go out we, we got to get this get this going and when they go out, I don't care what it's for, the owner's going to get fined. And after a while, they're going to get tired of getting fined, and maybe they'll, they'll realize that we're not messing around. So, so you're in agreement with ICON and Alderman McMinimum? Well, man, I know. It's, it's, <laughs> this is, this is, this is, holy cow. What, yeah. face, what face of the moon are we in? Thanks again. <laughs> So any other woman <laughs> comment? Um, so I hate to say what stars are aligning tonight, but um, yeah, I think actually Alderman Hanauer kind of hits on I, my my thought was, and again, I get a lot of cons I get issues, uh, questions from constituents repeatedly saying, you know, we want more people on the streets enforcing these standards. I, I think um, we can chicken and egg this issue all day long. If we have another inspector, our, our inspection areas are smaller, they have more ability to get out. And if we do in the next few weeks, which I am working we are on this ordinance and we're going to be bringing some things to, together. If we have, as Alderman Hanauer suggested here, um, a fine for coming into to court, this impact to our budget may be less than what we're thinking. So I'm, I'm again going to um, move on the side of optimism that, that what we're doing is going to be improving our community, that we're providing frontline services, and I again ask for support on this. Alderman Redpath. Alderman Connolly, I, I appreciate it again that you're bringing this forward, but I, I don't think the timing's right. I, honestly, I, 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 I agree with Alderman Hanauer. And that means uh, you agree with Icon and. I didn't want to go that far around. <laughs> That's two, Joe. <laughs> Uh, I, think, I, hoping, I think it's important that I will support this in the future uh, if after we get this whole ball rolling, because there's a lot to this. There's a lot of mechanisms in this whole thing about uh, absentee landlords, uh, about, uh, uh, you know, habitual uh, violators and that kind of things that we have to deal with. And Ralph hit right ahead. We need to find the pants out of these people in order to do this. But I think we leave it up to the director to say, hey, look, I'm to the point where I need this now. And uh, and when we when he comes in and says that, I'll support it then. So is this something that, um, and again, you guys are, I'm learning with this budget process, if this is something where <coughs> if in six months we've gotten ordinances passed and there is a higher volume, 
that um, Inspector Bottas can come to us and Absolutely. say. Absolutely. That's the point. The point is, is that he, if he figures out. So we're talking out, supplemental now. Right. Right. Or okay. Wait until, honestly, wait until next year's budget even. It, okay. It might be worth waiting but a year. But it is, it's got merit, and it's got merit to the point that if if he needs them, and we get to the point where we're, we're pulling all these these people together to try to make this, the, you know, the fine thing has got to go. We got to, we got to find the pants off these people. I, I would still like to see us. I, I feel like this is our horse and put it first, but I, I respect that. Thank you. Alderwoman Turner. Um, I'm not going to say I agree with anybody. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just going to say <laughs> that um, I do think that the response time is great. It's, it's, for me, it's always been 24 hours. They're, they're out there. The problem is once they go, again, the problem is once they go out and cite people, then it's getting things cleaned up and how often they have to go back and, you know, like two weeks later, they, they get called back out to the exact same place. So I think for me, I would rather see, because, I, because I, it doesn't sound like that the inspectors is the issue with the response time. For me, I would like to see another if we were going to look at adding staff, would be to wait and see what this ordinance brings forth and then perhaps add more staff out on the streets, actually helping to, you know, remove and, and do some cleanup. Because I think that's where the real issue comes in. It's, it's not the inspectors. It's having more staff to actually go out and do the remediation. So I would... So I would Okay. So I'm not, so I'm going to be a no on this, but because I think that the staff person is misplaced. You agree with me, though, right? Yeah, I do. Okay. <laughs> so you agree with... And Ralph, and Joe, and Icon. <laughs> Joe, you're paying a thousand. <laughs> Any other discussion? I just want to say, I, it, it, you know, I, I uh, you know, I talked to all the, all the women kindly on this, and, you know, I've, I've uh, you know, all of, all of my... Uh, Colleagues, I, 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 I really, really, really am adamant. However, we want to do it, you know, I'm, you know, I, I hope that we all can support this. But we definitely, definitely need another inspector, and we definitely need some more workers, and we definitely need to find them. So if we're gonna do it, we need to do it. Cause you, my ward, I, I, I'm just speaking for it, it. It, it really, really needs some good, good attention, and 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 you know I'm I get set to to get that rolling, and you know I'm not trying to be a bug, but you know I'm, I I really want to hammer it, and if I do it, then everybody's you know I think it it overload us, for sure, of what we really need to get done, and then we'll be like, you know it 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 really is a lot, to 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 get done, and and you know I I I, I can't um, really make the the importance on that. It, it, it definitely needs some dire attention and many, many factors. So that's that's how I felt about it. Any other discussion? So the motion for approval. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. No. no. Okay. Motion fails. <coughs> Amendment number, number eight. Amendment number eight is sponsored by Alderman Conley. This would add an additional... <laughs> Can yes. I say something? <laughs> this is, I'm not sure what I said, but anyway, it would add an additional security guard to the library at a cost of $64,721 well, $64, in total. Um, and I'm just going to, as a, as a brief explanation before I ask for a, a second, um, explain that this amendment comes from concerns that were raised to me um, in part by AFSCME employees um, with concerns at, about safety at, at the library. I do appreciate that we're adding at least one additional security officer. This would be a fourth officer. I've had constituents talk about concerns about coming to the library um, and being comfortable and feeling safe in the underground garage. So that was the genesis of this amendment. I, I don't really know that we need to have a long conversation, but I would move that we accept this amendment. Second. We move and second to add a security position at the library and second a discussion. The uh, one thing I will say is uh, what makes sense to me is if we're able to, we have security guards throughout CWLP that takes care of the facilities here, and it makes more sense if we can, uh, if they were all aligned, 
or there's a uh, inner union agreement where you can backfill uh, with positions because right now if you had that free flow of uh, employees or if they were all under one union, it'd give greater flexibility for operations. So uh, I think that's the struggle is when someone needs off, do you have proper coverage and moving that direction. I think if they were all under the same unit, I think that would address that particular issue. Alder, or Director McCarty. Uh, point of clarification, just wanted to let everyone know, remind everyone, there is already a security guard in the budget. So there's already, the mayor's proposed budget took them from two to three, this would go from three to four. Any other discussion? Yep, you come up, please. State your name, in case someone doesn't know you. Hello everyone, uh, for those of you who don't know who I am, I'm Gene Mitchell, I'm a proud resident of Ward 6, uh, but I also represent AFSCME Council 31 employees here with the city of Springfield for local 337, 3417, and 3738. We request that you approve this amendment, vote yes, because while I agree with the older woman uh, and the mayor, and Director McCarty that we already have an additional security guard. That's two more than we had than a year ago, just to be clear. A year ago, we only had one security guard, which means that person could never take a day off if we wanted to have security. And we're now getting back to where we used to be, which is three, which means that occasionally now a security guard can have a day off and we could possibly ensure security. The problem is the current status of the workplace here at the City of Springfield. We have an issue without having to litigate it, that this city council has failed to address. And so because of that fact, you have placed the uh, employees here in a hazardous work environment. What that means is I have employees, women, who are five foot one and weigh 115 pounds, telling us that they have people who know their home addresses, their driver's licenses, their license plate numbers, what make and model their car is, because we have no security in their parking space where we used to have security. We are hearing from security guards who are exposing themselves every day to, to be quite honest with you, situations that they're not prepared for. They're not social service workers. They're security guards. And they're being faced every day, and I'll, I'll just keep, I'll be very honest with you, they're faced with drug use, they're being faced with feces being smeared all over the property that you pay for, that I pay for. They're being exposed to violent violence, both emotionally and physically. And it is becoming increasingly impossible to secure both internal and external security, both at the library and the surrounding areas. Now, you may be thinking to yourself, well, Gene, why don't we just put a police car out there? The reason why you don't do that is because you need someone with a softer touch. Our security guards know these people. They deal with them every day. They know them by first and last name. I suppose when someone calls you a son of a you-know-what, you tend to want to know who that person is. That's who you're dealing with. That's what's happening here. And I would tell you that if this city council had addressed the issues that are happening outside these walls, I probably wouldn't be here today asking for an additional security guard. But the major problems, and this is why you need four and not just three, is because as of right now, if you were to hire an additional security guard, you would have no security for your employees who walk from where they park to where they come to work. I don't know about you, but I've lived here long enough to know that if you get here at seven o'clock in the morning, it's still dark. So the question uh, before us is, do we want to make sure our employees are safe? Do we want to make sure our patrons are safe? Because as of right now, we have an internal and external security problem, and only additional security staff will solve that problem. Alderman Ripath. So do you represent the security officers over there in ASPE? Yes, I do, sir. And uh, do you represent the CWLP uh, security guards? Yes, I do. So why don't we follow with the mayor's example, and then we'll have a rotating, uh, rotating officers to handle the whole situation? If you put a bigger group together, then you're going to get days off. They're going to be able to do it. You know, I, I've been in law enforcement and security for 40 years, so I do understand the problems of, that security officers face along with police officers. But the job of a security officer is to observe and report. They shouldn't be confronting people. What they should be doing is, is seeing a situation and calling the police. And so that's, honestly, that's, that's what they should be doing. But I honestly think that we really need to fold these folks into CWLP 
and, and, make, and that would give them a bigger pool of people to help them to help them rotate for their vacations and that kind of thing. Well, to, to be pointing about your idea, not saying that it's a good or bad idea, but it's a bargainable one. It's one that the city should sit down with this. With this. And, and let me, let me, may I just also address what you're talking about here? I would have loved to hear that idea from the mayor. When we sent this letter to the mayor back on October, we explicitly written, we explicitly wrote in the letter, if you have any ideas or concerns, or excuse me, we hope this letter will spur a conversation between the city and our union so that we can understand each other's positions. We are certainly willing to express why we believe these positions are needed at this critical time for the city. We ask that you respond to this letter no later than October 31st, 2019. That letter was certified and mailed to the mayor. It was you sent by what? email. And my point, my point to you is we would have loved to have that conversation before tonight. Well, we were not honored that conversation. But, but not going backwards. Let's go forward. Let's okay? do it. Let's do that. Let's talk about it, at least to try to figure that out. Um, you know, Admiral another, uh, you can have as many officers as you want out there. There's a problem out there. Okay, there is. We get it. But I think that's a discussion that we really need to have and, and on, on, on everybody lay their cards on the table and say this is where we got to go. Because they do, they do, CWLP security does handle the complex. And, and, and the, for the three that they're in the library, they should be folded into that group and put in a rotation. It, it would be very easy to, because they're represented by the same union, to believe then that they could all fall under the same umbrella. That is incorrect because they have collective bargaining rights and they were organized separately. So let's sit down and talk. I, again, as I, as I referenced right. earlier, we were willing to have that conversation, but unfortunately we're having to have it now in public view. Follow them in Desenzo. I Thank you, Mayor. I am going to take issue with two, something you stated twice, that this council failed to take action, and that's not true. This council did take action. I retract it. Thank you. Alderman Donlin. Thank you, Mayor, and, and thank you, uh, Gene, for showing up this evening and, and expressing your concerns. I appreciate you, Alderman Conley, bringing this forward. Uh, the, the, the conversation really centers around a, a greater problem in the city for sure. uh, that, that we're really not talking about, but I think we're going to later on this evening. Yes, we are. But uh, yes, we are. It, is, uh, it is something that I, I take near and dear to heart. And uh, I, I'm encouraged by the suggestion that you made, Mayor. And, and again, I think you're correct. It does need to be set. You need to sit down and, and discuss those kind of ideas. And uh, but I intend on I, I intend on voting for the amendment number eight with an understanding that we'll all try to work work some things out and, and have that conversation. So thank you, Alderman. Yeah. Any other discussion? I, and just so you know, I'm voting no on this. Only, but I am going to, I, I will talk to the mayor about and CWLP about what we just discussed. <coughs> and we'll follow through on that because I think that's the right, right move. I really do. And bring your issues to the table and we'll bring our lawyers to the table. So let's do it. I would request a roll call for this vote if we could. Oh, man, Hanauer. Sorry. Yeah. yeah hi, um, <coughs> currently, is there any positions open out of CWLP for security? Do we have any vacancies? Doug? I'm not sure. But there's not not one currently. Well, we got some work to do. I think Roger wants to talk. Yep, director from the library, would like to make a statement or comment. Hi. Um, when this came up, we uh, let staff know that this was coming up and gave them all an opportunity to talk to their manager or to me um, about a proposed fourth guard. Um, one of our security guards was adamant that we do not need four. The other one who is leaving us in March is the person who's wanting a fourth guard. Um, and nobody came forward to say that they felt this was an appropriate thing. Especially when we look that we have a children's department with three staff. Um, we're understaffed as a library in general. Um, and to have a security force that's bigger than our youth services department um, just doesn't feel right to me. Um, if I had heard overwhelming support from my staff, I would be here firmly supporting this because staff and patron safety is foremost for me. Um, but I, I didn't hear that from my staff. And I, I do appreciate your concern and Alderman Conley, your concern. Um, so just to let you know that there is not overwhelming or majority support at the library for this. 
Thank you. And again, I'm basing this off of the conversations I've had through um, union representation, which sometimes is a different conversation than what you have with management. And I'm not saying that you're, you come across as a very harsh taskmaster or someone who would be <laughs> difficult to talk to. But um, so that's, that's just so you understand. I do understand that from. dynamic where people don't always feel like they can speak their mind, but they had the opportunity to talk to each other and talk to their managers, not just me. Um, and I appreciate that. I'm, I'm certainly, that's, again, this is, um, I was presented with an issue that had um, already been existing for some, some time, and so why not? It's my first budget. Let's keep everyone here for a while. And we are in agreement that it's not a library issue. It's a community issue that we need to address. Um, you're correct, uh, Alderman Redpath, about how we hire people not to confront, but to manage um, and keep a safe space. So thank you. I, I don't know that we would feel safer with four people. And actually, most of the time, it's a really quiet job. Um, things happen like that, and I, I don't know that having that fourth person um, would help that much with the crisis situations that come up. Director, I, it's Director. a little deeper than just that. Uh, uh, not, I, I understand the safety aspect, but there is a, a morale situation too with the with the employees. We got to yes. make sure that yep. you know it's it's hard for there's there's a lot of people that work in the city and other places that have to work double shifts, have to stay late, and it it really. It's, it's tough on people, so we got to deal with it a little bit deeper than just the security side of it. Sure, and I, I do understand. I've worked public service and worked with security for the past 13 years, so I'm not naive <coughs> about the situation. Um, so I appreciate all your support and have at it. Thank you. <laughs> do you want to say something else? Uh, just to reiterate what Alderwoman Conley just said, uh, I think it's disingenuous to say that you actually know what your employees think about this because if you can ask the uh, local president who's sitting in the back of all the emails that she gets on a daily basis of the new terrible thing that they have found uh, that security has to deal with at the library. It is overwhelmingly, I'll be frank with you, the reason why I'm standing up here today talking and not 50 people is because I asked them not to come. Sure. Uh, because I think it would be a spectacle. So. Yes, we do need four security guards. Uh, as someone who's been in security for over 15 years, including the United States Marine in Iraq, I covered three prisons, that's Logan, Western, and Lincoln Correctional Center. It's about posts. It's about coverage. And when you only have one person looking at cameras, or you only have one person in an internal, or one person in an external, and you don't have all coverage, there's a possibility for harm or a low response time. You're right. They do need to observe and report, but if they can't observe, they can't report, and that's someone that could get hurt. And in my line of work, minutes matter. Thank you. Thank you. Any other discussion? Uh, ask for a roll call on the vote. Sure. Any other discussion? Roll call vote. Alderman Redpath. No. You didn't okay. sign oh, sorry, Reggie, did you want to say something? Yeah. I'm sorry, mm -hmm. Mayor. Is that? I'm sorry. Sure. Yeah, Ms. Reginald was um, I'm here to speak on the argument. You're correct. I agree with you on that one. The security guard, I request that he write. We need somebody in there that know how to understand crisis, period. Number two, they only got two staff in there. They're overworked. They need somebody else in there to help out to pitch in to cease the problem. I'm here also to talk about the feces and the urinate and that we've been arguing about downtown for the last five years. When y'all put them porty potties out there for like three to five months, look how the uh, feces and the uh, urinate stopped. If you put more out there, we won't have that many people urinate on our privacy. We won't have enough janitors be cleaning out the grown peoples. That mean kids, women, and child. When I'm asking questions, don't leave right. You know what I'm saying? If they want to sit up there and switch them, I agree with that. I would agree with him too. But always remember one thing, if you want to hire another staff, 
at least hire another staff that can sit up there and learn how to talk to the person, try to understand them, and be trained to deal with that person. I agree with this alderman. Thank you, Reggie. Any other discussion? Roll call vote. Alderman Redpath. No. Alderman Gregory. Yes. Alderwoman Turner. Yes. Alderman Fulgenzi. No. Alderman Proctor. Yes. Alderwoman DeCenso. Yes. Alderman McMiniman. No. Alderwoman Connolly. Yes. Alderman Donnellan. Yes. <coughs> Alderman Hanauer. Yes. You have seven yeses and three noes. Yes. We got it. All, uh, amendment eight passes. Amendment nine. Amendment 9 is sponsored by Alderwoman Conley. This would add another position in community relations out of corporate fund balance. The position would be an administrative clerk one. The cost would be $72,562. Thank you. Um, again, um, Alderman, um, respectfully, this is, this is a position that was brought to my attention by concerns raised by AFSCME employees and their representation. So um, I think if, if we need to have any discussion on it, I would certainly lean on um, our AFSCME um, coordinator again. Uh, again, I think I will say this, though. This comes back to some of my concerns with uh, Mayor. I understand your, cons your desire to keep headcount at a, at a certain lower level. I am seeing, though, from my constituents, I'm hearing from people in my neighborhoods that they want to have more direct services, that they want to feel that they are getting more for what they're paying in, in our community. And I have concerns for people who have to go through that do more with less. We've done that a lot, um, and I appreciate everyone's work. I appreciate the efforts that's taken, and I am not minimizing the fact that I am sitting with a uh, bunch of people who had to make some difficult decisions a couple years ago. So um, please know that I, I bring this with uh, full, full request for that, that um, consideration. Um, and, uh, Alderman Redpath. So could you tell, could you explain what's going on? Because I don't understand. Yeah, Gene, come on back up. Uh, Let's just give Gene a seat right there. Well, I needed to come back because I left my phone. Okay. Um, so I'm already here. Uh, so uh, as everyone who used to be on the city council uh, in the prior election will remember, we had a severe budget crisis. And uh, Alderman Hanauer and Alderman Donnellan did a really good job. Uh, the collective did a good job of trying to figure out where we could squeeze the most out of that budget. One of those places was in this office. We used to have this position, Admin Clerk 1. Uh, Is it, it in the mayor's office, right in the mayor's office? It, no, it's in community, community relations. Oh, community relations. Okay, yes. No, no. Great question. And so uh, that position was eliminated, uh, which meant that person had to bump someone. Someone got laid off. That's what happened. Um, since then, what has happened is a receptionist has been placed in there, which is a lower paying title. I will tell you that right now that person is doing the exact same job that the admin clerk one was doing. They're just getting paid less for it. So what we're really asking for here is not just an outright admin clerk one. We're asking for the posting of an admin clerk one. We'd love to have both. But if you, if you must choose between the two, go back to where we used to be and pay the person for the work that they're actually doing. Do you have a grievance in on this? No. Okay. And the, re and the reason that we don't is because we wanted to work with city council. We wanted to work with the mayor's office as opposed to going through an arbitration route. Yes, Alderman Hanna. And, and, and I can appreciate that, but I, I don't, if, if you don't file a brief, keep in, keep in mind, we can add all these positions. We can add all the money for it. But the guy in the big chair up there, it's his decision. It's, it's his decision how he runs his offices, his, his departments, and whatever. That's, that's the mayor's decision. We don't have that authority to, we can we can uh, approve the money, but we, that doesn't mean that you know we just we just pass the security guard. If they determine they don't want to fill the security guard, that's that's on them. I mean, and, and that's what I uh, no, in sure. this case it, it, it uh, you know you, you got the grievance process. If they're doing the same work as the prior one, I, I, I assume through the contract you follow the contract. May, may I and, explain a little bit my logic? Yeah. Much in the same in the last again. We wanted to have this conversation with the city. 
you're right, the mayor has the discretion, but what the city has told us was, we can't do anything, Gene, because it's not in the budget. So if it's a budgetary issue from the mayor's perspective, where do I resolve that issue? I come to you. Well, why didn't the mayor bring it then? That's a great question. You should probably uh, ask him. Actually, uh, we have the same headcount that we do when Juan Huerta came into office. So um, he said there is no need for an additional position uh, that is currently being handled by the current staff. And, and, and to be clear, I'm saying that you would not need to increase your headcount but to return the person to the original title that we used to have because the person's doing the same work. I don't, I, don't, I don't want to get into negotiating things in public, For but sure. I do, I, do to, I do have to ask this question. Sure. What is the difference, and if you can't answer it, we'll get the answer later, but what's the difference in, in, a, like in, in annual without, without going through a job description, point blank as a receptionist no, provides I mean, lower. Dollar-wise, what's the difference? You can ask the director behind you. Just a ballpark. You have no idea. Okay. All right. I got you. Hold on. Well, <laughs> anyway, I got just, you. just curious. Yeah, sure. Uh, so this position annually is 32,966. Oh, make sure I'm saying that right. I'm sorry, an, an account clerk two would be 32,966. An admin clerk one would be 45,715. Uh, and a receptionist, I believe, makes approximately uh, half of that. So she makes 16? She would make uh, 22, oh, okay. five. Uh, I move that we accept this amendment. Is there a second? I, I'd really like to hear your side a little bit more, Mayor, if I could, please. I think Juan Huerta, the director, uh, you know, he stated that they're covering it as is. I think uh, there's need for a promotion. I'm not sure how long the individual's here, or if they're performing other duties, I think that'd have to be an assessment that the director would have to make. But my point being, I think other people's point, Mayor, is that if somebody's working out of their category, if they're working, if they're working at a higher, in a in a higher quality job uh, for less pay, there's there's got to be some resolution to this. So, yeah, I think they're fulfilling the uh, position as a receptionist. So if there's anything above that, that's something the director, that's uh, something that the director could speak to. Okay. Again, I move that we. Um, so if you want to increase the personnel line item by twenty thousand dollars, I'm sure Juan would be happy. I, I think that the point and is to leave that discretion the up to the director to, that. to uh, make that determination. But to carte blanche, just give a receptionist a promotion up to the admin position, I, I think that's, uh, yeah, you should, we shouldn't be doing that. I think that's the director's purview. Well, Mr. Mayor, that, that wouldn't happen. What would happen is you would have to post the job and then qualified applicants would bid on the job. The person who had that job previously, by the way, had 22 years of service with the city of Springfield, and she provided a tremendous service to the city of Springfield in that office that I think we all agree is important. It's why you have it still in your budget. Um, so we would not have a receptionist immediate, unless she was the only person who bid on it, um, but I would, I would gather that uh, between the 170-odd uh, employees with the city of Springfield and in that local, there'd be someone who would have several years of experience who would be able to fill that job and do a good job, to be frank. And what it comes down to is what's the needs of the office? And right now, the need uh, for the office has been the receptionist position. So if we're asking to go above and beyond that, that's something the director would have to speak to. I, I would just say that your receptionist disagrees with you, but um, she's sure. doing the work of the, of the previous person. Nothing has changed because, as we all know, even though you eliminate these jobs, the need does not go away. So who is doing the extra work that the other person was doing? It certainly isn't the director. It's the receptionist that you've hired because you told them what the expectation was when they came in to do exactly what the last person did. Alderman Gregory. <coughs> I definitely understand what, what you're saying, Gene. So if we create this, uh, if we put this in the budget, this creates another position, correct? And, and we're taking from, let's that, say, That could 45. happen, or you could technically eliminate the receptionist position and replace it with an admin clerk position. We obviously would say you, could, you would need both, um, but in the absence of being able to do that, you could technically bump the title up. 
But again, that would be a bidding process that would need to occur. It would not be the person currently in the reception position who would get the job. Right. Well, they could be displaced. Well, right. we definitely need a receptionist, and I, I would imagine an uh, 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 admin clerk is going to do a different, different correct. job, correct? Correct. Right, I'm you. sure just like the chief explained, he'd like to have a new person. Um, I think we'll be discussing that. Uh, you know, Director Cousin was up here saying he'd need a new position. This director didn't ask for a new position, but we're going to force one on. I don't well, think that's right. I think that's, I think that's up to the director to make the decision Mayor, I think on what, how what that I'm structure proposing. should be. And he's not here to comment, so... Mayor, you know, what I'm proposing is that we recognize the, the request that the union that represents these employees has made to you over six months ago. I mean, I, I don't like being, I mean, I didn't plan on proposing a pile of amendments this year. What I am, what I am doing, though, is I will stand in support of our, of our employees who work for this city. I'm not saying that anyone else doesn't, but clearly they put, the AFSCME has put this request out months ago. I mean, October 31st? Mm -hmm. I'm sorry, we're having this discussion tonight. I am sorry As for that. I, yeah, we should have had it in the public session. I mean, we've all had the directors up here, and that'd be the time to discuss it well, in I, public forum. And I'm not a firm believer in behind closed doors discussions. It happens with the union negotiator. It doesn't happen with the mayor. It doesn't happen with the city council. It should happen right here when it reaches that level. So if we're going to have negotiations, do it at the table. But with regards to the budget, you do it in public. And, and we're doing it in doing. public right now. Yep. Mm -hmm. So Alderman Hanauer. Um, okay, I got to, it's my understanding, and maybe I'm wrong, but in the, in the contract, they have a, a way, and, and Mr. Cousin, if, you, if, if, if I'm wrong, they have a way that where there can be a job audit. Job reclassification. Is that correct? Is that correct? Job audit? Yes. Okay, yes. well, to me. Procedure here. Contract matters. Right, yes. we should so be talking about this. To file you got to turn your mic on. I'm sorry. That's I apologize. Sorry. Um, this is really a contract issue. That's why I it's see really it. It's really not yeah. a budget issue. So if there's a basis for a grievance, then a grievance should be filed. What, what I would say in response but, but, but wait a minute. Now, sure. so, so here's my problem. So what you're doing is, so you just said that you're, in a sense, you just threw the, the, the receptionist under the, under the bus. You said, yeah, you give us this, and then you can eliminate the reception's job. Well, she may not get that. She may not get that, right? So for that, one, it's not really fair to her so, or so, him or whoever it is. So a couple of things. One, I said that's something that you could do. I didn't say it's something that you should do. Um, as I've repeatedly said, our preference would be both. But what we have said is if you're going to have the work done, pay the person for the work that they're doing. So yes, that's how seniority works. But I happen to believe that people with seniority would remain. Now, um, to the Corporation Council's point, this may be a contract matter. The problem from our perspective is we don't know because we've had, the only thing we've been told by this administration is, Gene, it's a budgetary issue. You've asked for it and it's a budgetary issue. So. I'm quite perplexed that now I'm being told it's a contract negotiation issue, not a budgetary issue, when I speak with your labor relations specialist, who's now in the Corporation Council's office, as I understand it, tells me it's a budgetary issue. Well, I, I just, I think that this needs to have some sort of a job, the, whatever, the desk audit or job audit or whatever, and, and it goes through that, that path. That's how I think, because otherwise we're gonna, what we're doing is we're, we're doing a plus one uh, FTE and I'm not sure from, from what the director has said, he doesn't need an extra person out frankly, there. Which, we're out, right. Frankly, we're out of order. And I'll do a point of order for corporation council. We should not be negotiating at a budget hearing. Uh, Gene, I, I, I encourage you to file a grievance, but we should not be talking about contract stuff in this right now in this session. I agree. We need to call, call a question. Uh, a point of order, am I, uh, Corporation, Corporation Council? Council. Uh, correct. In other words, uh, there are two different issues here. One is a general funding budget issue, which is very proper for City Council to discuss. When it zeroes in on a specific person, whether or not they're doing, you know, acting up pay or whether or not they're in an improper classification, that is not a budget issue. That's a contract issue. And that's not something really for the City Council to have a role in. But even if there was a grievance, uh, Councillor, you would 
you would agree, correct, that that would only talk about making that person whole, and then going forward, there would be no guarantee that that person should be, in, in fact, an admin clerk or whatever title they should be, correct? It so would be, It would be based on whatever the proper decision through the contract process up to and including an arbitrator telling us. An arbitrator cannot make you create a position. They can make you pay someone for the work they've done, but they can't make you continue to make that person do work. That There's nothing in our collective bargaining agreement, and I don't think no, the administration would ever agree to something mixing, like that. So, I mean, you're, so, you're mixing these concepts, and the, the issue of budget, you know, how much is budgeted, is proper for the council. Who gets it, what the job duties are, and that sort of thing is not proper for the council. Respectfully, I am here, we are here discussing this because we were told it's a budgetary issue by this administration, by your own labor relations specialists and by your own directors. So if it's not a budgetary issue, we probably should have heard that, I don't know, six months ago, and we could have taken an alternative route. A letter on that? I'm sorry? Do you have a letter that says it's a budgetary issue? So if it's not written, <laughs> no, it's, it's called and a labor... If you don't have a paper trail... Let's go back. Oh, to I didn't say I have a paper trail. I have labor management notes. Mm -hmm. I said I don't have a piece of paper stating that. I guess let me ask or uh, add clarity to this. Um, from my perspective, you guys can argue. The attorneys, unions can argue all they want. What I look after is the employee. So if they're doing duties that should be at a additional higher level pay, then we should do the job audit, audit like Alderman Hanauer said, and we should not post it because this person is operating effectively under, according to Director Orda. So that person should get the promotion. We shouldn't be opening it up for everybody else to apply for that position and displace someone. It should go to the person that's been carrying out those duties. Well, that would be antithetical to the agreement that you agreed to four years ago. But that being said, that's not something that we could have certainly discussed, Mayor, had we had that discussion prior to today. Well, we could have. Because we, is All it true that we've not done that before? We have. Back to the point of the of the conversation, we're adding funding, Alderman Conley. We're adding funding to th this department, which doesn't correct this problem. It it adds funding for an additional person, and that has to be either the issue, and and, and the the union absolutely has a grievance. They yeah. they need to bring it to the table and and talk about it and, and resolve it. The mayor's right. Mm -hmm. If the lady's doing the position, then she should be uh, done a, a desk audit on it and and figure out that she's qualified and get the increase. That's how this all should be going down. But this budget hearing should be talking about, are you going to add funding to that line item so we can, so they can have it? Do and they need it? That was entirely my, my point. I'm, my proposal, my amendment is to add funding to the line. And I agree with you. I think we've kind of, we don't need to get into, I don't want to get into labor relations in this meeting anymore. <laughs> we shouldn't be doing that. It's no, we really, shouldn't. We shouldn't. Call the question, so, please. Yes, my amendment, um, I, prop I uh, move that we uh, accept this amendment, number nine. <coughs> to add a position or add It's amendment a number nine as read by Mr. McCarty. Can you uh, clarify, Director McCarty? Are we adding the, just the amount for the, the admin amendment, clerk or adding a position? The amendment adds an amount equivalent to another full-time position. So it's for a full-time position in addition to what they have now? It's, I'm not saying in addition or subtraction, I'm just saying this is the amendment. So one more question, Mayor, please. Sure. Alderman, uh, Alderman McCarty, I mean, Director McCarty. Um, so is, so is there a line it. item right now for the position that this lady is, is serving in that would cover the additional cost? The positions that are there now are all fully funded. This funding that is asked for in amendment number nine would fund an additional position. So you would- I understand that by. part. I'm asking about the position that the lady's setting in currently. Is she in a, is she in a position that's supposed to be, be paid higher? I can't answer that question. That, again, goes back to the discussion tonight about a job audit, whether or not she should or shouldn't be in a different position. Okay. That's something right I can now it's classified as a receptionist position, right. is my understanding. That is correct. Again, I respect call the question. Um, I move. Do I have a second? Is there a second? Second. The move and second. We have a roll call, please. No other discussion. There's if there is, we can have it. All in favor, say aye. Ask for a roll call, please, Mayor. A roll call vote. Alderman Redpath. No. Alderman Gregory. Yes. Alderwoman Turner. Yes. Alderman Fulgenzi. No. Alderman Proctor. Yes. Alderwoman Desenso. Yes. Alderman McMiniman. No. 
Alderwoman Connolly. Yes. Alderman Donlin. No, but I want to explain my vote if I can very, very quickly. Is my understanding is that we're, we've, again, we're not negotiating anything uh, in this meeting. But my understanding is the amount of money that we may be talking about is significantly less than the amendment, which is $72,500. $72, the, the, um, the administration has the ability through the normal budget process to transfer money between funds that could cover that difference. So I'm a no vote. I don't think we can transfer into personnel line items. Uh, Director McCarty, you clarify that, please. Can we transfer funds into the personnel line items? Yes, we can. You were correct, Mayor. You cannot transfer funds from other lines into personnel. But you can do it through a special uh, appropriation, right? Excuse me. I've been corrected. Uh, I got it backwards. You can't trans. You can transfer in. You cannot transfer out. Right. Thank you. Alderman Hanauer. Um, um, no. Mr. Mayor, you have um, five yeses and five noes. So the motion fails. What I would ask for is uh, a job audit. I guess I don't even have to ask for that. But the differential amount, or I could do it with the 2%. Is that correct, Direct McCarty? Can I that transfer correct, in the sir. differential amount for the admin clerk if it is uh, proven that we need to go that direction? That is correct. We can always do a transfer in. Just a point of parliamentary procedure. Sure. It is a 5 5 vote. That's a tie. Mayor, did you vote? No, I did not. <coughs> Alderman so Linkfeld. No record to. Present. How's that? Wow. So it dies. Wow. Someone else is doing it. Are you kidding? No, I'm not kidding. What did you say? Present. Present. This is your budget. Mr. Mayor, it's a 5-5 tie. That's right. So it fails. That was telling. Very good. Any other discussion on that amendment? So, uh, Director McCarty, if you'd answer that question with regards to the 2% and the other line items within that budget, can it be transferred in? It can, yes. So, I guess, uh, is there a motion to... Uh, that's not a that's council not, that's function. Not tonight. No, that's not tonight. No, I'm not going to do that. What I'm asking, Sorry, if Mayor. the council wants to uh, propose an amendment to the budget with regards to the amount for the admin clerk differential. Well, why wouldn't we do that after the audit, Mayor? What? That, no. yeah, okay. that was the whole argument. I, yep. I agree with uh, Alderman Redpath. Then we can do it after the audit. Yeah. Very good. Well, two, two things, if I can. Mm -hmm. two, sure. Two things. I mean, that is not the 2% rules in place so that you have the ability to not come to council. Yeah, I, I could think, do I that, think, but I it think, shortens. No, I mean, that's the process, and it's mm -hmm. done all the time. It's done every day here in, in this. It's done every day in this building and the building next door. That's just how it's done. Yeah, and we can do that. that. We can do that, but uh, Director Huerta put in, he submitted a budget that's really thin. And so uh, he Appreciate may not that. have the 2% to transfer in. So it's we talked, about, we wide, talked about we talked about operations and providing services to people. And uh, that's hey. what we want to make sure is covered. So if the job audit proves that we want to go that direction, then we'll come back with a supplemental. I think we're seeing the same thing, Mayor, if I can, but, mm -hmm. but the 2% the the two rule, and budget could correct me if I'm wrong, but the 2% rule is applicable to Mayor's office as a whole, which is not just the sub-department of community relations. Correct. Thank you. So, Director McCarty on the amendment number 10, I believe. Amendment number 10 is sponsored by Alderwoman Connolly. <laughs> You're almost done. <laughs> this is I'm, to I'll move more quickly. This is to add a position in the Springfield Convention and Visitors Bureau an account clerk two position. Total cost sixty one thousand four hundred and seventy seven dollars. Again, um, I thank you for your patience with me. This is another issue that has been brought to my attention from the Ask Me representatives of the employees in the Visitors and Convention Bureau. Um, I, I think I can shorthand this by saying we're dealing with a very similar situation, so I would ask for your consideration on this motion, and I move that we pass this amendment. And I would ask Fair for motion. a second. 
Is there a motion for a second? Second, second. thank yes. you. Discussion? Director. Same questions. Yeah, so we don't need a uh, count clerk two position. We had this position in 2019. We came to a crossroads. We had a retirement from OBM on, on the fiscal side, and we had a retirement there. We came to a crossroads. We could keep our account clerk two and move, shift all the fiscal over to OBM, or we could provide some upper mobility to that account clerk two and make them account tech one. And so that's exactly what we did. Instead of leaving that employee in the account clerk two, we simply reclassified them, gave them some mobility, and moved them up to account tech one. That's where we're at right now. There's not enough work for an account clerk two at this point. So because of the move that we did, had we known at that point that we were going to have to add an account clerk two, we would have never, we would have shifted all the financial over to OBM. We would have never made that reclassification. Any other discussion? All those in favor of the amendment, say aye. Yeah. I'd ask for a roll call oh, and there oh, is some right. more discussion. We have someone. Gene? <laughs> we won't, you don't have to reintroduce no, 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 yourself. Uh, I, I would just, and maybe I'm wrong, Director, but I seem to recall when we talked about this position, uh, you were uh, threatening to lay her off. Uh, that's what your labor relations specialist recommended. But the alternative to laying her off was because I believe you lost some sort of tax supervisor or something like that. This woman was doing at a lower title three jobs. She was doing the current job she was in, the job that she has now, and then technically her supervisor's position. All we're saying is give this good employee who has really taken a brunt of this job uh, some help. Because if she goes on vacation or if she gets sick, Who's her backup? And there's enough work here, according to the people who work in this office, that this would be more than justified. Thank you. I guess I'd ask Director McCarty to speak to that since it's a financial matter of, of uh, working with your office as well. Right. Director Dahl did a good job of explaining the situation. This individual, we elevated them. They were able to take on some more responsibilities with the loss of our fiscal officer there. And the intent is it's all part of a greater plan to have more individuals step up to do more and to pay them more, which we've done here. But this individual that's been elevated is still doing the account clerk to work. That was part of the deal. You would do your work and we would give you additional responsibilities. And in return, we would provide you with a higher, more elevated title. There is no need for this position. The work that was being done is still being done by the same individual. And then isn't there someone in OBM that's handling uh, the financial aspects of it, so the workload from that perspective Yes, is we are reduced? in the process of hiring a fiscal officer for the one who departed. Any other comments or discussion? I would just take issue by saying that you did not elevate her. We had an agreement. Um, you can't do that unilaterally. Um, and that's why I say that the impression was given to us by management that she was going to be laid off unless we did this because uh, if we put it open bid, uh, and had she bid on it and not gotten the job, she would have been laid off. So the agreement to save her job was that we allowed the city to promote her without bidding on the process. That being said, though there is, there is still plenty of work for this additional job title. Thank you. Alderman for Gen Z. It sounds like um, all of these things are a grievance process within the union and what they're doing. It's not a budgetary concern and it's something that they ought to grieve. I think we ought to vote on it for the budget there. Any other discussion? And again, um, Alderman Fulgenzi, I, I appreciate that. I, I think I agree with you on that. Um, I, I just want to ensure that if, if the concern is that there isn't money in the budget, that we at least have this budget conversation around positions. I, I agree with what you're saying, but the thing of it is, if they grieve the process and we find out that we have to put the money in the budget, we will. Okay. That's right. Thank you. Any other discussion? Ask for a roll call, please. Roll call vote on amendment number 10. Alderman Redpath. No. Alderman Gregory. Yes. <coughs> Alderwoman Turner. Yes. Alderman Fulgenzi. No. Alderman Proctor. Yes. Alderwoman DeCenso. Yes. Alderman McMiniman. No. Alderwoman Connolly. Yes. 
Alderman Donnelly. Yes. Alderman Hanauer. No. Six yeses and four noes. So the motion fails. <clears throat> How does six yeses make it fail? Yeses. Six yeses, four noes. Okay. Six yes means it passes. I was hoping it would fail. No, but <laughs> For the record. <laughs> that one to heart. <laughs> right. Amendment number 11. Amendment number 11 is not sponsored by Alderman Connolly. It is, it is sponsored by Alderman Proctor and Alderman Donnellan. This would add $30,000 for a study uh, for the North Grand Avenue, uh, an engineering study, in order to uh, try and receive an IDOT ITEP grant. Yeah, thank you, Director. Uh, yes, this would uh, provide $30,000 for a phase one uh, engineering study. We got that number from Nate. Um, for segments of North Grand Avenue to put those segments in line for, hopefully for an IDOT, ITEP grant with the state of Illinois. Uh, so amendment's been, been worked on for a while and the North Grand Avenue Association, the Business Association along North Grand Avenue fully supports this and has been requesting this to beautify, you know, to seek state funds and possibly federal funds or whatever funds might be available because of the limited uh, funds that we have as a city but this will provide them in a proper place to make a proper request uh, to the state. And Alderman Donald, my co-sponsor. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. I'll keep it brief. Uh, good summary, Alderman. Um, the only thing I also I'd like to add is, this, again, this is something that's been worked on for quite a while, and it's a matter of leveraging funds. And uh, it, it, uh, through discussions with some of my other colleagues, they pointed out that this, is, this would indeed be a a city engineering study. It would be a city engineering or city application. Uh, it would be uh, obviously uh, competitive, uh, competing with other cities and projects throughout the state. And city. And and the fact that uh, it it would uh, it's but it's good for North Grand, which t I wanted to point out touches does touch uh, wards nine, five, three, and I'm four. Is that it? Yeah, I think that. Right. So it has multiple. Actually, it doesn't touch work. Well, not close oh, enough, John. <laughs> I think Peoria. Urge I vote. Better. Thank you. I think he'll touch. Any other Road discussion? Alderman question. Turner. Um, <laughs> Hilltop Road and Peoria Road. Oh wow! I just, I sandwiched in between them. So, I have a question. Yeah, you're right. This would be a a um, opportunity to apply for a competitive grant, I think it's a $2 million maximum that would require a 20% match, correct? That would require a 20% 20, 20 match. So, um, and then there would be, before any work could begin, there would, also, there would also have to be a phase two study that would be about $70,000 that the thought is that that $70,000 would come out of the grant funds, if they are received. That's my understanding. If they if they are received, okay. Um, if we don't get the grant, then we just have this engineering study. So my question to uh, and I had a conversation with Director Bottoms about this. Is it possible? Um, is it because I understand that this is an entryway into the city, and we have a couple of others that are, I think, equally. Um, in the same kind of situation. Is it possible to um, have an application that would include two entryways and, and um, so the funds that, which would probably be maybe a stronger application that would then, um, that would then uh, take care of, you know, not just North Grand, but possibly Stevenson, no, possibly Stevenson Drive and or South Grand. You can include multiple locations in an ITEP grant. Okay. Okay, so I would like to make an amendment that, that um, the engineering study would be for North Grand Avenue and Stevenson Drive. I think it would cost additional money to do two different locations. It may be double. I'm, 
not sure, depending upon how far um, the scope is, how many blocks, and the, co the construction cost estimate. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. That's fine. <coughs> Mm -hmm. I'll support the motion to double it to 60000 um, Why in particular? Because this is money coming out of our infrastructure fund, our Fund 95, which has sufficient funds to support this kind of spending, unlike many of the amendments we've, we've, we've uh, considered tonight, which is coming out of the corporate fund. So I support that motion. Thank, Thank you. Second. Second. I move and second. Alderman Fulgenzi. <coughs> I would have supported the original motion, <clears throat> but adding another one and not adding Peoria Road, I'm sorry, but that's, that's, right. that's really not something that, Peoria Road is one of the major entrances to the city. And, and you just, and I would agree with that, but I would also say that over the last six, six months to a year, this council has voted repeatedly to put attention to Peoria Road. So please don't sit there and act like we haven't been doing Peoria Wait Road, Peoria Road, Peoria Road. I, I don't even want to argue about it. Well, either, you either you vote don't for argue. it, either you vote for it, or you don't the, vote the for it. The point of it is, Peoria Road has has not had an engineering study to do any kind of a, a corridor study, and that's what we need on Peoria Road to advance it further. Well, you just had the, the TIF was just put, you just had a, a new TIF that was established. So I would fully support, I would even co-sponsor an ordinance that you would bring, that you have an engineering study that's, that comes out of that TIF. I will co-sponsor the ordinance with you. What's the latest on the Peoria Road, Nate, uh, with regard to engineering study? What's your thoughts on that? We don't have one at this time, but um, we can do one. I know that IDOT's working on some various projects, uh, including some sidewalk further to the north portion of Peoria Road. So they could make that portion uh, part of the engineering study or whatever yeah. if they're out there already. <laughs> if I may, yeah, Mr. Well, Mayor, after we vote on Alderman Turner's amendment, mm -hmm. John, if you want to do another amendment to include Peoria, I'll second your well, motion. Well, South Grand coming too, then. Yep, that's, that's right. right. <laughs> well, then let's, on there. That's let's right. Let's not be greedy now, but I'm just saying, you know, we... You know what? <laughs> South Grand. <laughs> Very good. Alderman Redpath and then Alderman Proctor. So we can add as many roads as we want, but the cost goes up, correct? Yeah, that, that's, coming <laughs> <laughs> that's coming out of what? That's coming up. I'm sorry, but I can't give a good estimate right now on the well, spot. Well, but that's coming out of Fund 95 the... funds, right? Yes. It's coming out of Fund 95, right? Yeah. That's what the understanding is. What this right? says. Yeah. Right. Okay. And we can do not to exceed. And we'll 5, have to come back for possibly council approval. Okay. It just depends on the amount. Alderman Proctor. I'm, I'm for doing something for Stevenson, of course. Uh, the question is what segments of it, because this is just a very narrow segment, because you can't just say all Stevenson and then try to get a number for whatever segment. Is there a particular segment you want to? There is, and I, and, and, um, I, Alderman, not Alderman, Director Bottoms and I have okay. had brief conversations about that, so I think that we can drill, we can drill that down. Okay. That's not a problem. So 30,000 be enough, do you think? For, so I'll support that, of course. And then the other part, so, to Fulgenzi, I, Fulgenzi, I, I think the Peoria TIF is generating increment, and I think the last number I got was like there's fifty, sixty thousand dollars 60000 there. That's your money for your engineering study right there, I think. So, for TIF, if you for all of the Fulgenzi. Well, I'd like to propose an amendment to uh, have <laughs> an engineering it, study saying, for yeah. Peoria Road, take it out of whatever you want, because... Uh, Alderman I, but, Turner is going to back me up on that. But I don't think. But I, I will, I, wait a minute! I'm going to hold you hold to on, your word. Hold on! I will support you on that, but it's not appropriate for that to be part of this. Right. Right. It's, about, it's not appropriate right. for it to be part of this oh, amendment. I'm, I'm saying later do. Yeah, we've made all kinds it. of amendments and, and uh, additions and subtractions. If you bring a why isn't it? If you bring a separate amendment, I'm more than happy to support that. Yeah. I am. I yeah. am bringing Alderman a separate Dallin. amendment. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, again, getting back to the original amendment number 11 uh, for the North Green study, I'd appreciate the support. Um, you know, I don't like games, okay? Um, you're right. 
The TIF, the TIF is there, it's generating dollars. I mm -hmm. think it's an appropriate use of TIF funds. Actually, I don't think. As long as the funds are there, it is absolutely an appropriate use of funds. Yes, it is. Um, I wish we would have talked about the uh, Stevenson Drive and the, and the uh, what was the other one, uh, South Grand uh, concept before. Um, I do like the idea. Uh, and I will support the idea. But uh, I, I think we gotta, I mean, otherwise we're gonna be sitting here all night because you know what? J. David Jones Parkway, Jefferson. And we could go on and on and on. Pokemon Monroe. Pokemon Road. We can go on and on and on. But enough's enough. Let's quit playing games and vote. And only certain ones would be approved under ITEP, I would think, and qualify. So, it depends upon the type of improvements that you're doing, correct. And Stevenson Drive, IDOT does have a plan to do some bike and pedestrian accommodations here shortly, so we may want to sit down and talk about okay. those as well. I think we're just talking about appropriation for engineering for right. what be covered. Right. Right. Alderman Turner. Yeah, I, I guess I'm confused. I guess I, I guess my question is for Alderman Dowling. Could you please explain your definition of games and who's playing them? I think I think uh, there's a little bit of a little bit of that going on all over the council chamber tonight. Well, this, no, I, I would like for you to explain your your comment that you made just now in refer, in regard to this amendment. Well, I, Alderman, I don't know. I'll, I'll tell you what I meant. Please I, do. I think we we started adding something that I think had some relevancy. And then we start. Then we start playing games. We go out to other areas of the community. Uh, you and I and others in this room have worked hard on this. Hard on this project. We've had many meetings on this project. And uh, if someone doesn't like it, just vote against it. Any other discussion? So, uh, amendment number eleven. There was an amendment to add Stevenson Drive. All in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed, say nay. Nay. Motion carries. And then, uh, do we care to uh, offer the other amendments, or? Have we voted on Amendment <laughs> no? 11 yet? Okay. No. That's, that's the amendment to the amendment. Okay, that's amendment. what I was asking. What was that? We just made an amendment to the amendment. Amendment that to the correct. amendment. Correct. So it's uh, amendment number 11 is for engineering for North Grand and Stevenson Drive, and I'm sure there'll be others to come forward later. Is there an, a further amendment to the amendment that Alderman Fulgenzi, you wish to make? Well. Apparently nobody wants me to make that, but I, don't care. I think we ought to add uh, Peoria Road. How are you so. finding it? A second? I'll second that. What All in favor of adding Peoria Road to Just for clarification. Oh, sorry, what discussion? How is he funding it? What, what are you funding? Through the TIF same or infrastructure. The same way she's funding Stevenson Drive. <laughs> How's that? So, okay. Alderman Fulgen, your, your amendment is to uh, um, include Peoria Road and added an additional $30,000 to, to make this more feasible. Is that correct? So, any other discussion on Peoria Road being added for engineering study up to $30,000? I will say um, I, I would prefer this came from TIF funds, and that it, that's where my vote is coming from in this position, Alderman Fulgenzi. Exactly. I can't hear you. I would prefer this came from TIF funds. Sorry, I'm getting tired. You keep me up past my bedtime, people. You brought all the amendments. The person that had all the amendments? <laughs> I'm trying to go quickly. At least I'm not amending my amendments. You're getting tired. I want you to know, I'm, I want you to know I missed a Lampier basketball game tonight. Oh, what? Oh, my gosh. Alderman Fulgenzi, I just want to um, respectfully say that I would, I will vote for this if it comes back using TIF funds. Just so you Wait know. Let me ask you a question. Is, are the other amendments using TIP funds? No. No. Nope. 95. Oh. Infrastructure. They're not using TIP funds. Right. They don't have TIF funds. Because there is no TIF. That's there the is point. a TIF on North Grand. I wish I had it. it no, it money. doesn't include that area. <laughs> yes, it does. It doesn't. Part of it doesn't. Can we create a TIF at the lake? <laughs> Which we lake? It floods. <laughs> so any other discussion on the amendment to the Amended not amendment. Not, not the full segment, not for what All in favor of the uh, adding Peoria Road, say aye. 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 Opposed, say nay. 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 Motion fails. Alderman Gregor, you want to want to do the tip. try anything or not? Wait, 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 y'all. So was this for Stevenson or just Peoria? Road? It don't matter. Just go. That was it. <laughs> That's fine. Peoria Road. Peoria. Right. So any, uh, any discussion on Amendment 11 as amended to add the uh, Stevenson Drive? All in favor? Oh. Wait, Point of clarification: that. Are we adding 30,000 more? Is that correct? Yes. Okay. Yes. So it'll be a total of 60. 
Okay, so just making sure. So this is on the entire amendment as amended. No, he doesn't know that it's 60. I, I don't know how many blocks it's going to be and how much it's going we'll to cost necessarily at this time. We'll, we'll, we'll say up, up to. Two. Okay. Can we say mm -hmm. up to? Yeah. Okay, yeah, and that is the state 60, route that we're going to have to work with IDOT on as well. And one more thing. Uh, yeah, Alderman and Proctor. Nate, 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 Nate. And it's 30 each, not if Stevenson comes back at 40 and then there's only 20 left for North Grand. Correct. Great. All right, great, thanks. Any other discussion? <laughs> All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed say nay. Motion carries. On the amendment 11 passes. Amendment 12. Amendment 12 is sponsored by Alderman Gregory. This amendment would take $60,000 from the advertising budget of SCVB, and it would move 30,000 each into one into line 1290, which would be a funding, I believe, for incentives to bring groups to town. Uh, Director Dahl can correct me if I'm wrong. And then also 30,000 in our, the grants line. Yep. <coughs> if you'd like to speak to that, Alderman Gregory. <coughs> Yes, so what I have done is I have introduced an amendment to create a separate um, funding source for local um, organizations to come and apply for before the city. So therefore we have, um, we won't have the, well, are they bringing you know, people into town for hotel beds and things for us to make that decision on? Because I feel like we have enough organizations locally that really support our hotels and pay a, a lot of money to use their conference rooms and things of that nature. So I, I feel like um, you know, we, we do need a, a local fund so, so we don't have um, a way to get the two mixed up. So, um, and, and it's, you know, it's $60,000. I, you know, I, um, I think Director Dahl can put some, some uh, guidelines in place um, to make sure that stretches. I don't see that um, a, a lot will come forward, but we, we definitely need to have that. And I think the current way that we do it now, it, it, it makes it tough because, you know, uh, some local organizations come sometimes and they don't know if they're going to get it. They don't know if their they're, um, event is going to qualify. Um, I, I would take Juneteenth as an example. Um, we had to make some, some we had to do some things to make sure that, that we were able to allocate some money over to our Juneteenth Festival. So Juneteenth Festivals, for those in the crowd who may not know, Juneteenth is very important to me. It's, I'm always going to speak on it. But it is the only reason that all of us are here to even talk today. Um, in the land of Lincoln, man lost his life just for freeing you know, slaves. So I think it's important. Um, so, so when a when a group um, comes to 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 get some funds for that, you know, I I just want to make sure that we we, we give those things to them. Um, this year, we have put a, a plan, a game plan in place um, to really try to attract outside uh, cities and people to our Juneteenth Festival to to put people in in, in uh, hotel rooms to keep generating money. Um, but I, I definitely worry about the future and, and with different um, organizations coming and things of that nature. And I, I want to make sure that we put some put some aside. I think they deserve that in our community. Well, you know, I appreciate that. And we have worked closely on Juneteenth. Mm -hmm. um, but for this amendment, I see this as a duplication of what we already have. We have a line item in 2110 that is already for $75,000 that the advisory group is uh, allocating from those funds. So but is we already it, have that line item in there, which is how Juneteenth, correct. it's on first reading tonight. Correct. The advisory board mm -hmm. gave the thumbs up mm -hmm. uh, for $10,000 for mm -hmm. Juneteenth, mm -hmm. looking to revamp it. That's right. coming out of that line item that's already there. Right. To, I'm confused about the 60 I, because we already have the 75000 in that line item. You do. And, and when with that $75,000, so normally we, for us, for Juneteenth to get that $10,000, we had to, one of the million Inc. had to, we, we had to make sure that we were going to spend some, some money with a local uh, media group for some outside advertising. I'm okay with that. I think that's a great idea. I did talk to them. They wasn't happy about it, but I, I did um, um, convince them that that is, that is a, a good game plan because we do want to bring people to Springfield. We do want to uh, um, put people in hotel rooms to keep that fund uh, solid and, and growing. I'm, I'm fully uh, agreeable with that, but I think it gives too much of a... Um, chance for for 
the board to say, oh, well, you know, they, they're, they're not going to bring um, – People in our hotel, so no, it's not worthy. Or if the golf championship is 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 more important, let's give them fifteen thousand, and then we we flip over here and give them more fifteen thousand, and you know then then Juneteenth got to do cartwheels and backflips just to get ten thousand measly dollars that I'm gonna they're gonna give back three four thousand dollars to the city and the park district. I mean, so 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 what I'm saying is is that we need to have two separate funds. So we can help our local organizations, and then we can help our uh, organizations that's going to bring group. That's that's main goal is to bring groups from out of town, and and I I just think that's fair. I I think it's just um you know having it that one way. I I just think it, and I'm not trying to affect the seventy five thousand. That just gives you guys uh more to spend for 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 the people that's going to you know like the golf championship that's going to bring uh, more people in. Um, but I think there there needs to be a fund for our local groups, which is a little less than the seventy five thousand. I think that's appropriate. I mean, um. You know, that's just my thoughts on it. Well, the local grants are designed around tourism. We want to try to bring visitors from outside of a 50 mile radius in to spend money in hotel rooms because mm -hmm. that's where the funds are generated Absolutely. from the hotel tax. Mm -hmm. And so, like subsidies, different than local grants. When we provide subsidies to a convention, mm -hmm. we know exactly how many room nights they're going to use and we only subsidize them up to the hotel tax that's generated so that we recoup that tax. Here is different. And I think we're going down a road that uh, we started down a few years ago. And that is, you know, the, the past 20 years, we didn't have local grants. We didn't give local money mm -hmm. simply because it doesn't recoup itself. So that takes away from any marketing or subsidies that we could provide to conventions that are recouping that, those dollars. But really the long-term effect of that is this. If you don't recoup the dollars, at some point it affects your fund balance. So you have $75,000 in there right now, mm -hmm. but you're giving it away locally to events, mind you, that's not recouping that. Does anyone know if you have 70, let's put them together, $135,000, how many ho hotel rooms it takes to recoup $135,000 in hotel tax? So do you think the $60,000 is that, that big of a deal to, like, if people I think it's, not I think it's come, a huge deal. No, I think it's a huge deal so, because it takes 20,000 room nights. Mm -hmm. To recoup that hundred and thirty thousand dollars. So gave, if we increase it to sixty and we spend and we and we spend hundred and thirty thousand dollars in the community, mm -hmm. is that hundred and thirty thousand that we're spending in the community generating twenty thousand room nights? And if it's not, at some point <laughs> down the road, five years down the road, six years down the road, it's going to affect our fund balance. So when somebody looks at Director McCarty and says, Why is the CVB's fund balance three hundred thousand less? That's because we haven't been recouping the dollars because we've been spending them locally. And I, and I thought that we would put that cap on it for $75,000 to spend that locally, even though, quite honestly, I didn't even want to have the $75,000 simply because, again, it eventually eats away at that fund balance. So to add another sixty thousand dollars to that, and I'm not really adding. I'm just taking away from your advertising budget. I mean, your advertising budget well, went that's, from that's, that's one right seventy one to six hundred thousand. Am I correct on and, that? And and so we can show through analytics that if we spend sixty thousand dollars on that marketing, I can generate more than I, than you will generate it's not locally even, it's at sixty thousand dollars. I understand that, but it's that's that's really not what it's about. Is is really to try to help our local organizations and and really take. Um, the little game that is played sometimes with that board on who gets money and who doesn't, and that's just why I've, you know, I stand that. That's why I introduced it. We can vote it up. We can vote and, it down. And, but and that's I, how I, I see feel. the holistic approach of that, and I respect that. And again, we worked very closely. Sure. I'm sure. all behind it. You know it. We I can revamp that. And we can do it. I'm behind absolutely. that. Absolutely, absolutely. But we're going down a road that we don't want to go down. And five years from now, when our fund balance right. is depleted because we haven't recouped because we're spending $130,000 a year then I guess we'll replay this tape and we'll decide at that point what we do. The other thing we have done that uh, is a soft cost of sorts, I mean, we, with uh, like blocking off streets, using, yep. uh, you know, public works or CWLP, mm -hmm. uh, the police to offset costs. So but hopefully other government, you mentioned, I think, Park District, hopefully they help with those initiatives so, you know, we're not I'm taking not the, the funds and you know, I said we should be talking to other organizations to see if we can. But this started thirty thousand dollars so they don't years charge ago. it to like Juneteenth. But thirty thousand four years ago, now we're approaching one hundred thirty, and you can see where that's going. So that's why I'm I'm, I'm laying caution to the wind. I understand. Certainly. I understand.
understand. So any other discussion? All in favor of the amendments? Uh, oh. and there's not been a motion in the second. Oh, there had Oh, I thought there was. Is there a second to the uh, motion of adding $60,000 for local groups? Second. And second it. Any discussion? All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed say nay. Nay. Motion fails. Amendment number, lucky number 13. Can I have a roll call vote, Mayor? Sure. Roll call vote. Alderman Redpath. No. Alderman Gregory. Yes. Alderwoman Turner. Yes. Alderman Fulgenzi. No. Alderman Proctor. No. Alderwoman DeCenso. No. Alderman McMiniman. No. Alderwoman Connolly. Yes. Alderman Donnellan. No. Alderman Hanauer. No. Three yeses and seven noes. Amendment number 13. Amendment number 13 is sponsored by Alderwoman Connolly. This will add a position in economic development. <laughs> <laughs> this will add a, another position in economic development. This is a grant writer at a cost of $93,713. There um, is, for a point of clarification, a grant writer already in the mayor's proposed budget. This would be a second one. And I, and I will say, um, I, real quickly, I am going to withdraw this amendment. Uh, my thinking behind, yeah, th what my thinking behind this own? one, um, my thinking behind this is, is, is coming from a place of having dealt with grants. Uh, we've been piling grant opportunities onto an, a yet unhired person in Val's office. I'm, we've we've um, discussed at length the expectation that the police department will be using this grant writer, the fire department will be using this grant writer. And, and that sounds like it's a very easy thing to do, but grant writing is not just the application process, it's the maintenance and reporting process in a grant. So. I, what, I, what I will do right now is withdraw this amendment with the caveat that um, I expect that we will hear back on the success rate of this grant writer and if we need additional resources to maintain and manage grants that um, we'll hear supplemental talk. Real quickly, Mayor, yep. if I can. Alderman Redpath. Alderman Connolly, you're absolutely right about the grant writer. Very important position. I'm glad the mayor put one in to start with, so we're not going to duplicate this by withdrawing this, but grant writer is really needed, really needed. It is, and I think all we've done um, over the last couple of weeks is build evidence for that. I agree. So I, I do hope that um, as this grant writer gets hired and starts to work, that um, mayor, that you will be open to coming back and letting the council know if we need additional resources sources to maintain and, and properly report on our grants. But again, sure, I withdraw Amendment 13. He was talking about that very issue. You have used the word grant 17 times during this discussion. <laughs> mm -hmm. So Good. we know we need grants. <laughs> yep. That's why we proposed about four years ago. Yeah. That's free money. Yeah. But Mayor, and I can yep. just call him in Hannah. I think the concern at that time was the, that it was in the police department itself. It wasn't it, it, and it, that it would be it, it wouldn't be allowed that other, um, uh, no, nothing against the, the police department, but um, that, that they wouldn't, uh, uh, they wouldn't be allowed to be opened up from the other, um, from the other uh, uh, agencies or, or, or departments. And this, this way, it's more centralized. Uh, other departments have better access to it. And uh, we go from there. Uh, that 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 was my thought four years ago when we did it. And quite frankly, if we would have had it two years ago, they probably would have got whacked. Yeah, actually, it was a previous director under economic development that proposed it. I think four years ago, or it might have been further, but there may have been one under the police. So. There was one that was originally under the police that was the last one we voted on. You know, this grant writer will pay for itself in three months. Absolutely, I, I agree with you. I'm, mm -hmm. My my concern was more to the the oh. how much this grant writer is going to pay for themselves. So again, withdrawn amendment. Thank you. Move on to my next one. Amendment 14. Is this the last one? This is the final amendment. Yeah. Does Ron, anybody want to guess name. who sponsored it? Uh, <laughs> All the woman Conley. <laughs> amendment number 14 removes <laughs> from the budget funding for the position of outreach coordinator in the police department, a savings to the corporate fund of $81,899. 
And again, if I could just briefly explain my thinking on this process, I know it looks like I'm trying to add a whole lot tonight. Um, <coughs> Chief, I, I appreciate and respect the thought that, and the, where you were coming from with this position. Um, I am not convinced that that the position is going to be used for anything other than that will what will duplicate existing services within our social service community. Um, I, 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 I'm, I'm two ways about this one, and, and I'm not going to I'm not going to make a big pitch one way or the other for the amendment. Um, just understand, I, I, I feel like we have a lot of social service agencies that already cover the functions that you are expressing that this position would would do. Um, I would prefer. So that's, that was my question, that's where I'm going, and that's my amendment. Alderman Proctor? Yeah, I just have a quick question of the chief on this one. Um, this position, was this the position that was supposed to help um, our homeless outreach officer, or is that another position? No, yes, sir, that would be a position that would help our homeless outreach officer as well as our focused deterrence program. Uh, since we've lost the funding for the grant for the focused deterrence program, we've tried to restructure it. Uh, we believe that a professional case manager would help in those aspects too because a lot of times what we're dealing with on the gun violence issue as well as the homeless issue is a need for social services to come together and get people to it. Um, the reality with this position is that we need additional help. One officer cannot do it all. Mm -hmm. And we thought a professional versus another officer would be cheaper and more successful in helping us. Um, there are a lot of great social services out. I went to the continuum of care uh, because everybody thought there was a conflict in, about the liaison position. They're predicting this has nothing to do with that. This is no conflict at all. What I heard in that room that day was the same frustration that I hear in my focused deterrence meetings when it comes to getting people to services and then the services they need. And the reality is um, in the field at late night hours where the homeless people are at, those services aren't being delivered. You know, I know Helping Hands does some stuff inside their shelters at night. I get that. I, under, I know that um, Memorial Behavioral Health comes out, and I believe Ms. Anderson's even in the, uh, the audience that comes out and works hand-in-hand -hand with Officer Jones. But the reality is uh, we, people aren't just going to show up at your door for social services. You're going to have to convince them, build a relationship, earn that trust to get them there. And whether that's... Uh, Embedding somebody who's a professional with my homeless outreach officer and my NPOs to help address the homeless issue in the community. It is progressive thinking. I know it's not a popular thing. I know that other departments have embedded mental health professionals with their police departments, psychologists with their police department. We're trying to think outside the box to address the homeless issue. And I've said all along, this is not a police problem. This is not a police problem. This is a community problem. But we're the ones who are constantly taxed with it. We're the ones who get, during the summer, there's not a day I come in, I don't get hate mail. There's not a day I don't come in, I don't get hate phone calls about, what are you going to do to move the homeless people along? We can't move the homeless people along. We, need, we have an obligation to help them, okay? And we have an obligation to do what we can. And this is just another resource, because what I hear from the social services is that it comes down to funding and money. They would love to be out there with us. They don't have the funding or money either. So that's what this is about. It's not about trying, I see it as a compliment to what is already occurring in our community. Um, I was also, you know, basically told and brought to light that, hey, it's a great theory. Is it gonna work? I don't know. It might not. There is frustration built in. You cannot make people get help who don't want help. This is not going to solve homelessness, but it's another step of trying to do something to address the issue so we don't have a repeat which I think we're gonna have this summer, of what we had last year. So with, with that, Alder Woman Connell, I, I would ask that you withdraw this amendment if you could, because our homeless police uh, outreach officer is swamped, and he's only one person, and he needs the help, and this position is budgeted, in the mayor's budget and the police chief, this is one of the amendments where the, the <laughs> The head of the department is asking, like, really pleading for it. And, well, I've killed you know. another one where they've asked for it. I, I will say, um, from, what I, from what I've heard, in, in, and I've been having a lot more conversations around homelessness in the last couple of weeks, um, everything I'm hearing is that this will be just a duplication of services instead of an, an addition to. So, Have you talked to the homeless outreach officer about it? I did not want to put any police officer in a position of having to speak against or for um, against something that their their police chief has said. And so, no, to that end, no, I have not and spoken with him directly. I would love to have 
the social services out in the field with us addressing these folks in the evening hours when they're sitting around the, the, the fountain out here, when they're in the bread line. But can helping. I ask, what, what would a social worker who's connected to the police department, what will they do for the people who are sitting at, at the fountain? I mean, again, I think we're putting Band-Aids onto a situation that is, that is not actually, be, and then Chief, I applaud you. Well, well done. I applaud you, Chief, for trying to think outside the box on this one. I, I really do. And I, I just, I'm concerned that we're putting money where it won't be best used as opposed to funneling our resources in, into a, a, a different place. And, and I, again, I, I, I'm just going to, I, I'm putting my amendment out there. I would ask for a second on this amendment. I thank you for your, your consideration of this, and, and I, I, I am very appreciative of all the work that your officers do, because they do a very good job with our homeless. And we had, um, Chef Higgins was in here just last week, complimenting your officers. I, I think that comes from improved training. I think that comes from just a certain level of respect that your officers have for our community, and I appreciate that very much. No, thank you. And we'll continue to work with Continuum Care and everybody else to address homelessness. We were just looking for additional resources. So if a social service wants to come forward and partner and bed somebody with my department, I welcome that opportunity. I guess uh, I'll add something, then Alderwoman Turner and then Red Path. I think Gene Mitchell said it best. I mean, when we were adding a security guard to the library, he said, they're not social workers. You know, we have individuals who are dealing with drugs. It's a difficult situation. And so that's what <laughs> our police chief's asking for. And this is uh, out of the box thinking for Springfield, I know, but in Oregon, this is proven. They went down the homeless outreach team uh, direction, and this is the direction they went in addition to the homeless outreach officer. And they've had results, and it's reduced. It has reduced homelessness. So it's uh, not way out there, I think, probably for Springfield, but really it comes down to relationships. It's not, you have to reach out to each individual person, find out what their needs are, how do we move them to the next level of self-sufficiency? So, you know, some are lower than others, some are higher than others. That's what we have to figure out as a community. And the officers are the first ones called, and I'm sure we'll have that discussion tonight, but uh, that's where we have to go. That's the direction, <coughs> building those relationships. And not everybody, I think Gene Bond mentioned or someone did, not everybody wants to see an officer. They want to see a regular person and talk to them and it's another aspect that we can add to what we're currently doing, give the police the support they deserve and need, and move forward in this direction in complement to our social service agencies. So Alderwoman Turner. Uh, so my question is, how does, because I, I, I have a, I really believe that the city has a responsibility to have a comprehensive homeless initiative in place. I just believe that that's the city's responsibility. So my question is how, I know we have the other position that is working with the consortium. And I think that it's very difficult to have a successful homeless initiative by consortia. That just the nature of what a consortium is makes it impossible to be the head of and, co do, and coordinate a successful city homeless initiative. So how does this position interface with the other position? So the coordinator position, if that's what you're asking about with Continuum Care, right. I'm not an expert on that, but when we sat down with them and talked that's, about... The, hold on one second, because the city is kicking in money that for that. Right, yeah, right. yeah, yeah. So that's what I need to know. How do those two... When I was at their meeting, what I was informed is that that position would kind of be a... Uh, kind of a, a head over all the social services and bringing their efforts all together under one roof, so they're working together, going in the same direction. Uh, it had nothing to do with what we're trying to talk about in the field, outreach, case management. Right. Uh, it was more about them seeking grants, seeking funding, donors, sponsors, that kind of thing. Right. It had nothing to do with what we were doing. I think there was some confusion initially about that, uh -huh. but that's not what we're doing out there. And something I got to say here to make clear, we appreciate 
the social services in our community, and they, they're working with mm -hmm. us. This is not a bash against them. This is not meant to say they're not doing, you know, as much as they could or should. This is about the fact that when we come to asking for more, it always comes down to funding, funding, funding. Right. And this is the way of the police department saying, I know what the summer is going to hold on us, and we're just asking for an additional resource to help my officers right. out. So do you ever see, I guess I should ask the mayor this question to both of you. Do you ever, do you, what role do you see this position playing in a helping to provide that comprehensive homeless <coughs> initiative? I see them working hand in hand with our homeless outreach officer, as well, like I said earlier, probably about 35% of the time we'll be working with our focus deterrence folks. But I see them when they're working the majority of the time with the homeless outreach officer, uh, being a partner, being a professional that they can bounce ideas off of. Somebody that maybe uh, the uniform creates a barrier that mm -hmm. is not there. Uh, we see somebody who is going to hopefully, I know that Officer Jones that's on the board of the Continuum Care. I don't know if this person will be invited to do that or not. That I don't know. But we see them being an asset and a and another resource for everybody. So that's kind of how we see it. Uh, with that said, you know, I just want to make sure I'm crystal clear here. We're not here bashing our social services. We appreciate them. We need them. Uh, and, and I do mean that if, if, if they have the people that can be embedded with our people, we would look at a, a partnership with them. But what I'm always told is that it comes down to funding. It comes down to funding. No, and, and, and I just want to be clear, too. I never thought that. No, no. Yeah. I just, I just I want just, to be crystal right. clear for everybody I, out I there. I never thought that. Right. Alderman Redpath and Donlin. Chief, I support this position be only because, and this is a new position, correct? This is a new position. I, I support it because I don't, I'm an advocate for not using sworn police officers as social workers. It's not what their role is. They're supposed to be out enforcing the law. We need professionals, a professional like this to come in and, and pick up the load off of that for for uh, our for us and, and, that's our thought uh, and you're right exactly you're right with the, when they come in and they see that that barrier that uniform we know how that works and the bottom line is is that this will be an advantage to you Alderman Donner and then mayor and I, you know chief uh, when we first first came up you know I was pretty hard on and and asking if you had spoken with the continuum and what that position and how they would interact and so forth I appreciate the fact that you sat down and had those conversations and have a better understanding of the differences. But I echo Alderman Redpath's comments about uh, it not being an officer. But in, and from what I hear uh, from people that deal with these uh, issues on a daily basis is that Officer uh, Chris Jones needs help, and uh, this will be a great service, and, and uh, I appreciate you bring it, thinking outside the box. Thank Alderman you. Hanauer. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Um, one thing I would ask, I, you know, I've, I've kind of struggled with this because you know, I, I like the idea of having a, a, a non-officer doing this, but <clears throat> one thing I would ask is, can we get an update of um, how that job is progressing throughout the year? Because, I mean, if, it, if we do this and it for some reason isn't working, then we can always look at not funding the position in, sure. in a couple years or whatever. But... Um, I think that, and, and, and Chris Jones has been a, a real blessing, and uh, hopefully this this coordinator, I'm willing to go with it. I wasn't sure how I felt about it, I mean, up until just as you were speaking, and and uh, I'm willing to do it, but I'm also, I want to make sure that it, it it's doing the right thing, and, uh, and, you know, we can review it next year as well, so... Um, and I hope that the job requirements are are very are very uh, strict as far as um, right. having a good social service background, dealing with homeless or whatever. That's that's where I'm coming from. I just don't want someone, mm -hmm. you know, hired to, to and have to learn on the job. Right. That's my concern. Uh, Mayor, a um, woman Conley. I'd like to withdraw my amendment, um, Chief. I, I think you've got this much support around the table. I, I would like. I'm. My attempt was to try to not duplicate services, but I, again, I don't want to rain on your parade of you trying something like this, so um, respectfully, I withdraw my amendment. I do would, want, would ask that we get some, uh, like a quarterly update or uh, update toward the end of the fiscal year mm -hmm. next this year. Mm -hmm. We'll come up with some measurables that we can present for you. All right, thank you. Thank you for your support. So any other discussion on the budget? 
God, I hope not. Well, if we need one more amendment, I'll make a floor amendment for five cars. What do you want? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sit down. Yeah. 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 Don't give her an opening. <laughs> All of it, Gregory. I know, I know we're here late, but I might as well uh, do this now. Um, <coughs> can we talk about just one more amendment? Sure. And that is um, from from our public works section. It was something that was forgot about earlier uh, in my notes um, for a uh, streets crew and a uh, two barricade um, crew members. Nate, what's it called? Is Nate still there? Well, I understand that our, our barricade guys, um, they don't have enough to keep cars uh, in, in some situations. Um, Gene can speak on it. Um, but in some situations where we're telling people to slow down and things versus um, um, actually doing the work, you know, it's, it's become a problem in some of those instances. Um, I did speak to a couple of those gentlemen, and I know Gene can uh, speak to um, more of the details if he would like. It's a safety issue. I mean, it's something that we got to consider and we got to make sure it's right. I mean, somebody can get killed out there. So, uh, right now we have two barricade Gene uh, Mitchell's truck. at the mic. Oh, my Just apologies. Just for our listening audience. Uh, yes. And uh, Gene Mitchell would ask me, Council 31. I represent uh, Public Works Local 3417. Uh, and I, and I, I had with me about 115 years of experience, but I lost about 40 years of it. But I'm still, I think I've still got a good amount of time here. And what my guys tell me is they have barricade crews, and for those of you who don't know what that is, uh, we need to section off a, city, a street to where you can't access it. And uh, what we really need for a barricade crew at a bare minimum for safety standards, for IDOT standards, is to have one person unloading the barricades and then to have one person flagging traffic to make sure they don't get hit. What I'd like you to do for barricade crew is to listen to my good friend and brother, Aaron Pearl, who does this work as to why we need two more barricade truck driver laborers. Uh, good evening, uh, Mayor, Council. I've been here before, several years back, when I spoke about our budget that we were currently facing. I've been in here tonight for five hours. I did be at home typing the paper. We, we spoke about sidewalks, streets, trees, Police cars, one thing that we never talk about, the firefighters, we never talk about public works. For those that have business degrees, I'm sure you have one, Mayor, uh, the director back there, McCarty, we know about lean. Public works is working on a lean department. Every time that there is a budget cut, public works is the one that gets hit first. So then when we start talking about safety, we have two barricade trucks. What's ironic about that is we have guys that drive the trucks by themselves, and they're taking down road closures on South 6th Street by themselves. Dr. King once said, he said that, uh, he said that lightning, let me find it up here. I'm your neighbor, Mike, you're right. <laughs> he says that lightning, you never hear lightning till it, you never hear the sound of lightning till it strikes. Safety is an issue here. We sit here with public works. We've been down this road before. We need, we need more personnel. We keep saying that, you know, we don't have the money, but we have the money to pay when people are getting injured on the jobs. Then these guys that are getting injured on the jobs, they can't come to work because we don't have light duty as a truck driver labor at public works. But if we're in management at public works, they can come to work on light duty. Something's not balancing out here. So what we need is we need more employees. We keep saying that we don't have the money. We have the money to do everything else. We just put up a bunch of trees in Stratford Place. I'm going to be honest with you, uh, Alderman Hanauer, they put four in front of my house. I didn't want a tree, period. Okay? <laughs> there's, money, there's money here that we have here. We need more employees. We're not getting them. The city of Springfield is growing. We have over 650 miles of city streets that we plow. Craig Scroggins, Sam Spence, Daryl Jackson, Todd Hazelwood, y'all don't know them. They work 12-hour shifts, Bobby Collins, when it snows. When you're in the bed sleep, we're out plowing for 12 hours. Now, when we talk about squad cars and safety, we can go to fleet maintenance, and there's about 30 of them in the back of fleet maintenance. We don't have that with our trucks at Public Works. We have the worst equipment. The safety is terrible, and we sit back. We're always talking about what we want, what we want. When is Public Works going to get this? We're not, we need new guys on barricades. We need two more guys on the barricade crew. We had an incident where both of the guys called off, and we had nobody to run barricades that day for the city. You do the math. We have two trucks, 
and only two people. What if we had four people working two trucks? If two people call off, you still have a barricade truck. We need more people. We're not getting them. We're finding out budget, budget, budget. The funny thing about it, we was in here the last time. When we was here the last time, I talked to Officer Redpath, Officer Donlin, Officer Hanauer. You probably remember me from Gavin Tony's Pizza one night. I spoke to you about the budget. <laughs> yeah, yeah, you remember me. Yeah, you remember me. And the funny part about it, we was wanting to slash public works. We came in the door, I thought public works was safe. I heard a comment before. Well, if it comes down between a firefighter, a police officer, and public works, I know which way my vote is going. I'm asking for your vote right now to put more money into the budget to hire more employees for public works because it's going to be a safety issue. Guys cannot keep running like this. The city's steadily growing. New subdivisions are coming up. New streets are coming. We need people, and we're not getting them. We're not getting them. But then, then we go buy, we want to buy 10 police cars, and we might buy three tandem trucks every three or four years. You do the math. We're putting Band-Aids, like you said, Alderman Conley, we're putting Band-Aid on a serious issue, and we're overlooking it. Public Works is the elephant in the room. We're asking for some help right now, and we're asking you guys to deliver it for us. So, quick question on the barricade uh, crew, the additional one, what would they be doing if they're not doing barricades? Would they be plowing, or what would they? They would do it, but we have plenty of work for them to do barricades. When we have a guy that is taking down a barricade, a road closure on South, South 6th Street by itself, and he's not doing nothing wrong, the reason is he's just doing his job. Right. Okay, but now the question that I have to ask myself, if he's doing his job, who's allowing him to go out there? That's a safety issue. That's a safety issue. So somebody should be saying, hey, guess what? That road closure might not be, might not be picked up today because we don't have enough help. But we're sending these guys out there. And then, I mean, I'm not trying to put Director Bottoms on the spot because he's coming, in to, he's coming new as a director. Right. But there's a lot of bodies that we need at Public Works, and we're not getting them. You're wanting the work done and you're trying to be lean about it, and it's a safety issue. When these guys get hurt, they can't go to work. Right. If, they, if they don't use FMLA or if they got time on the books, they're just basically hit. But if our management gets hurt, they can come to public works every day and still collect a check. And the thing is, if you want to be transparent, we're the guys out here that are transparent, not the management, not the management at all. Because if you want to, if you want to do another thing too, do, do, do a study on this. How much management do we have at the city of Springfield, and how much do we need? And we can get some more employees. To, to answer your question, Mr. Mayor, uh, yes. Uh, I, I seem to recall not too long ago, uh, Alderman Redpath uh, given the director of public works the business because he couldn't get his constituents out of their driveways because of the snow. A right. uh, little statistic, 2009, the Department of Public Works had 249 employees. You know how many they have today? 180. Just doing the math, that's identical to what Jim Cousin has lost over uh, the period of time. We went from 12 to 9, we lost 25, over 25 percent. What that means is, is that, yes, we have fewer people putting up barricades, which means it's unsafe, which means they could be hurt. But also, when your snow is six inches deep and you're looking for your constituents to get out of their driveway, you know who you call? You call my truck driver laborers. No, I call Lake Services. They come <laughs> over and do it. <laughs> Actually, he calls Nate Bottom. I mean, that's who she calls. But to speak to the streets crew, um, which is extremely important. I, I would love for you to listen to my good friend and brother, Craig Scroggins, who has over 20 years of experience as a truck driver laborer and a foreman as to why it is crucial, not just for the city, but for your constituents as to why we need another streets crew. Hey, Gene, nice. before you go, why don't we talk about why didn't you guys bring this to the hearings that we've had for the last couple months? I mean, we're talking, we're negotiating, we're negotiating jobs right now when we should have been doing it in here. So, so to be clear, we are not advocating for an actual increase in your budget. And the reason why is because we did an analysis of your contracting of public works over the last four years. Does anyone know how much contracting you've done for public works, meaning not these guys, but private vendors over the last four years? $109 million. That's sidewalks, that's tree trimming, that's patch overlay, that's stuff that we do. And what you're doing is spending more money to do less. So back to my question. So to, back to your question is what we, what we, the reason why we weren't here is because we were trying to talk to the administration. The, prob the problem is we were told 
And Director Bottoms, you're here. You can tell them, hey, Gene, you're too early. That's what I was told. Well, so now I'm too late. Gene, I'm going to tell you for next year, you're too, you're not too early. you got to come to the hearings because, actually, mm -hmm. everybody on the city council supports the, the safety of our workers. Absolutely. Believe it or not, we don't trade jobs in public works for police and firemen. We don't Correct. do it. The bottom line is, is that we want everybody to be safe. These guys are my brothers just as much as they're your brothers. I know every, most of these guys. I know the police and fire every one of them. And the bottom line is, is we're, we don't want anybody to be unsafe. So we we have to find a different way to connect here because bringing I'll, these things I'll to take your budget, invitation. I'll be here next year. You better year. believe it. I'll be here. I'm, I'm telling you, be here. It's the 12th hour. This, isn't, so, the way, this isn't the way to negotiate a budget. Right. So, Nate, uh, would you like to make a comment, please, especially with the barricade? True. I mean, there's two people we're talking about, I believe. Sure. Uh, you know, we can always do more with more people, but, um, you know, we have obviously have a limited budget. But in regards to the barricade crew, um, we consider safety very important. And whenever they are parking in a live lane of traffic, there should be two people on that. We also are drafting a memo. We've done safety training in regards to our operations coordinator with traffic. Um, and then there are two barricade crews that will split up. However, they're doing live, live, and live traffic. They should be setting up together. Uh, we can also grab additional staff and pull them over if we need to. Um, yeah, ideally, if we had an extra person in the in the sign shop, that would be great, and we could have them on barricades or putting up signs and, and doing additional work. Um, but uh, we can always reassign people in order to make sure it's safe. Um, there are additional events that we are doing now for putting up barricades, so that does spread pretty thin. We try to do the best with what we have. Um, and then in regards to equipment replacement plan, we're planning on moving forward and um, developing that over, over the next year so that we have a good holistic approach um, for, for public works moving forward. How many uh, barricade crews did we have previously? I mean, well, we just have had one one crew, um, basically. We used to have two. We used to have two. We got two trucks and two crews. Okay. So, so back to that. But, so well, now you're down to one? one we have um, basically two guys that split up, and then sometimes somebody else will hop on. Hop so do you, on need a, do, do you need more people in the barricade crew? I mean, we can, we can use another person yep. on, on the barricade crew. Um, so is there a second to Alderman Gregory's I'll second. For one or two persons, what, what, what was the um, amendment? I, 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 they, they have, uh, I know they, two, two. let's do two. I'll second. What's the point? What, real quick, though, what's the, what are we talking then? Just for, for oh, gosh, it's salary good. wise, so I'd that's have what, That's the reason why we got to do this. I want to yeah. Benefits. And benefits. And we're also contracted out contractors. We're spending money on contracts to do this job. So if you can come to the mic guys, if you like. You can come to the mic. Look, we, at least it, we don't. It, look, it comes down to this. We need places to put people that are losing their jobs at CWLP. So those two jobs will be right up our line. So we'll take them. So, Alderman McConley's been waiting. Thank you. Um, Director Bottoms, I, I, I'm sensing some support for this, this particular um, amendment right now. What I would ask moving forward is that we get an update in the not tonight at this point, but I would like to see um, if, and have a closer examination of our, our use of contractual employees and, and see if we can't, sh see what the implications would be to start shifting some so that we're adding crews to our public works department. There are employees. That's, I would like to see us not having such a heavy reliance on contractual work. Yeah, we'll definitely work with them uh, to, to look at the valuation, do a cost and benefit like analysis, which we, which, we have, which we have on, on some items, um, which. Yeah, Director McCarty will help yep. run Thank the analysis. Thank you. Yeah, but I would like to see that come back before this council so that we sure. get to have a full so picture. So, how do we form the motion, Mayor? Uh, oh, wait, 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 wait. Hold on. I'm going to turn it. <laughs> Can we? Can I just understand how much we're talking about? Twenty-four uh, McCarty. Um, it was according to Julie, who and Julie's never wrong. Never. Uh, One hundred twenty-two thousand, about sixty-two thousand a piece. That's the entry rate. It'll be higher than that in a few That's years. With benefits. And that doesn't count that, Director Bottom's other costs for like materials. And right. Yes, it's, equipment. It, if equipment's needed and materials, then obviously that goes up from there. Of course, with, with the barricade do. truck, the equipment's going to be minimal. So, so if we said 130000 that would be fair? That would cover it. Mm -hmm. To start. Right. You want to say something? But we got to have a number for the budget, right? Right. That's why I'm, that's, I'm just trying to... <laughs> 
If you will approve 130,000 for the positions, we can fill in the blanks. Okay, that's that's what I needed to know because you can't make a motion unless you have an, an amount. Alderman Pulgenzi. Uh, I think we just added another amendment, didn't we? I, I did. And I, I, I agree with you and I support that amendment. Yes, sir. But if we're going to add another amendment, <laughs> since I've got <laughs> Peoria Road, oh boy. Oh, no. I know where since this is taking us. Can't backing, drive down Peoria Road. I propose an engineering study for Peoria Road <laughs> out of the that's tip another, fund. That's another. That do that after. Do it after this amendment. We'll please. bring an ordinance. Do, do it so, after this. I, I like to correct. So I, w I would like to make an amendment to add one hundred thirty thousand dollars for two positions to barricade crew. Barricade crew. Is that it? Or is that? For public works. Recommendation. What's that? I second that motion. For house, yeah, we definitely for having one additional person for the larger events. So, sometimes they're just doing pickup and everything along those lines. So, uh, the director but, uh, but we can also use them for signs positions. if we have okay. two people and have some flexibility. Right. Then, we, right. Okay, that's. We'll provide as high as level of service right. we that's can and I, operate as efficiently as possible, like public works always does. That's my thing. I would. Yeah. Okay, I would. I would prefer that it just be. Not that it matters what I prefer, but I think it would be best for you as well as for the workers if we said add two positions with the 130000 and then that gives you the flexibility if right. they need to work on the barricade crew or if, if they need to where. So I think that our preference is that we make sure that the barricade crew is fully staffed, okay? So they have the flexibility to, to work on other groups. That's my that's my point. That's my point. That's up to so, you, Nate. Yep. What do you call them? They laborers? Uh, yeah, TDLs. Truck yeah, driver laborers. Thank you. TDLs. So I think Truck driver laborers. Yeah. The amendments to add two TDLs. Not to be higher right away. Not to exceed one hundred thirty thousand right. dollars. Right. Yeah. That's what I, just if we just say two TDLs and not say where they need to go. Is that does that work for everybody? Three. Other questions? Okay. A point of order is uh, yes, these all money is coming from the corporate fund 0001, or is this coming from the capital improvement fund 95? What's the source of the funding? These Director will be, McCarty? McCarty's these will be out of the corporate fund. Yeah. Corporate. <laughs> Any other discussion? All in favor of the amendment? Roll call on this, please, Mayor. Sure. Alderman Redpath. Aye. Alderman Gregory. Aye. Alderwoman Turner. Aye. Alderman Fulgenzi. Aye. Alderman Proctor. Yes. Alderwoman DeCenso. Aye. Alderman McMiniman. No one I'll explain later. Alderwoman Connolly. Yes. Alderman Donlin. Yes. Alderman Hanauer. Aye. Nine yeses, one no. Alderman McMiniman. Well, uh, are we going to start the discussion of the uh, on the vote for the uh, appropriation ordinance itself? Because okay. that's uh, where I want. No, we'll wait. Is there any other amendments? Can I, no, but Alderman Turner. Before you before you guys it. leave, yes. can, can I, in in fairness to you, you you did reach out to people earlier about about these issues and things that you wanted to see, but could we do it during the budget hearing part? Promise. Then I can make it to Lamford game if they have one on this night. <laughs> You're not going to make Friday's game if we don't get it done. <laughs> Alderman Fulgenzi. Yes, I'd like to make a motion to have an engineering study for a corridor study on Peoria Road coming out of the TIF funds. Second. Thank you. <laughs> Call the question. Been moved and second to uh, have an engineering study for... Or study for Peoria Road. For Peoria Road. Road. Tiff. How much? Out of the tip. Tip. How much? Thirty thousand. Okay. Thirty thousand. Up to. Up to thirty. Up to thirty thousand. Got fifty. Spend it all. Any other discussion? <laughs> all in favor, say aye. 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 Opposed. Motion passes. A discussion on the appropriation ordinance as amended. Thanks, Doris. Ten times. Actually, 11, I think. Alderman McMinimum. Mr. Mayor and uh, fellow aldermen, you know, we've been discussing 100,000 here and 50,000 there, and these are all worthy um, 
um, budget amendments from the person that's offering the amendments. But the elephant in the room, which we really haven't discussed tonight, is the fact this is an un unbalanced budget, just like they have been for 25 years. Um, by that I mean, and these are audited numbers, um, 25 years ago we owed our police and fire pension funds $15 million, that's five plus five plus five. Today we owe those police and fire pension funds $375 million. Um, under Mayor Houston's watch from 2011 to 2015, the unfunded debt rose by 170 excuse me, by 75, by, by $100 million, by $100 million, over a four-year period, $100 million. Uh, these numbers are so large that it, it defies an appropriate discussion of what this is about. Uh, under Mayor Langfelder, and, and you've taken some small steps to try to address the problem, the unfunded liability has increased by $75 million. So $100 million under Mayor Houston, $75 million under five years of Mayor Langfelder. Uh, this problem is going unaddressed. It's a, it's a slow motion crisis, and that's why I'm voting no, because we really don't have a balanced budget. We just keep allowing the debt to our pensions to grow larger to support operations. Now, one alderman a few weeks ago said, well, we can't afford to put money into the into the pensions. Well, you know, let's think about that. The, 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 the pension debt is kind of like a mortgage. We're, we're borrowing money that eventually we have to pay it back. I mean, you, 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 no one's going to forgive this debt. It has to be paid back. So when you have a mortgage that you can't afford or can't satisfy, what you do is you either downsize or you find new revenue. I mean, those are the only two choices or a combination of the two that we got. And so eventually, this council or those that follow us will have to do exactly that. And so those that have been here around this circle the longest, whether you be um, helping a mayor execute the functions of the, of the city or you, you, you served in prior terms, we better address this. And it's the elephant in the room. It's the elephant in the room. And uh, I've got three years left. I hope it won't be 12 no votes in a row. I've offered two good solid amendments, uh, ordinances, a year ago and uh, last week. And those ordinances are just exactly what you have to do when you, you don't have a balanced budget. You have to plan and then you execute a plan. And uh, I've talked with some of the aldermen about what Peoria is doing. Peoria has taken three tough medicines in Peoria. Number one, they shrunk down their services. Number two, they created a dedicated funding source to, to handle the police and fire pension funds called the Public Safety Pension Fee. And, uh, and number three, they uh, reduced their rate of return assumption on their pension funds from 7%, which is what we have, down to 6.5%. And uh, I did speak with, uh, or talk for, uh, on uh, Monday with uh, Brad Cole, the uh, executive director of the uh, Illinois Municipal League. And I've got a pretty good understanding of what the consolidated police and fire pension funds under the consolidated plan will, will do. And I'll discuss more about that at a future meeting. So that explains my no vote. Any other discussion on the appropriation ordinance as amended? So just to clarify, uh, the amendments that were passed, Amendment 1 for uh, $50,000 coming down from $200,000 for trees. Amendment number 2, it uh, eliminates the HR assistant position. Amendment number 3 adds $50,000 for Kidzeum. And Amendment 5 adds $78,000 for uh, police training, which uh, it, that would uh, replace if the state does not provide that funding. Amendment six is to reduce the uh, police commander position amount by $3,659. Amendment eight is to add a security guard at the library. Amendment 10 was uh, adding a account clerk two with Convention Visitors Bureau. Amendment 11, an engineering study for North Grand and Stevenson Drive, the amount of $60,000. $30,000 each. Amendment South Grand, right? 
No. No. Oh. North Grand. All right. Didn't mean to. Didn't mean to. Screw <laughs> <laughs> Unless you want to change that. Yeah, just be clear. <laughs> Did I stop say playing games over there, Jim Don? Uh, <laughs> guilty. Guilty. <laughs> Amendment 15, uh, adding two TDLs uh, in the amount of $130,000, and Amendment 16. Uh, it's an engineering study for Peoria Road being covered by the TIF. And then the TDLs coming out of the corporate fund. Any discussion on that? All in favor of the appropriation ordinance as amended, vote yes. Those opposed, vote no. The voting is now open. <coughs> Here, Nine John. voting yes, one voting no. Next item on the agenda is number 20. Well, thank you for everybody for indulgence, <laughs> especially those in the audience. We really appreciate it. Next, next item on the agenda is 2020-060, an ordinance amending Chapter 37 of the 1988 City of Springfield Code of Ordinances as amended by amending Section 37.04.02 regarding extra pension payments from the corporate fund. Chair will entertain a motion to place agenda number 2020-060 on final passage. So moved. It's been moved and second uh, discussion. Alderman Hanar. Um, I'd like to make a motion that we uh, that we file a proposed amendment number one. Uh, what what proposed amendment one, number one does is uh, goes back to the original language instead of striking it all, and it um, it uh, re changes the uh, percentage from 16 percent to 20 percent. Second fund balance. Been moved and second to accept amendment number one, which changes the fund balance <coughs> level from 16% to 20%. So if the fund balance is over 20%, an extra payment would be uh, made to the police and fire pensions instead of anything over 16%. That's correct. correct. Any discussion on the amendment? Well, discussion. Alderman McMinimum. This is going in exactly the opposite direction we should go in. Basically, um, we don't even have a 20% fund balance now. We've got, I think it's 19.8% fund balance. So what this is saying is, let's not make any extra payment to our uh, pension funds, even when our reserves are, are um, uh, what the mayor had suggested, over 16%. This goes in the opposite direction. I don't think we'll ever make an extra um, pension payment now under what our mayor proposed and we passed a year ago because based on what we did tonight, we're just going to keep drawing down the corporate fund because all these amendments draw down the, the, um, the, um, the corporate fund and this is going in the exact opposite direction and it's, it's, it's a sad day for the city of Springfield. Alderman Anner. Well, um, you know, Joe, a couple couple weeks ago, you sat here and, 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 and I'm so friggin' tired, I can't hardly keep my head up, but you sat here and was complaining about the the corporate budget and, and, and how we got funding issues and all that. You can't have both ways. You can't have both ways. Either you want to you want to bring in you bring in the amendments. Bring in you you had we had 15 amendments tonight. 16. Where was the amendments for, for for the uh, pension stuff? You didn't bring anything in. There was nothing in. You complained about about funding on on the corporate level. I believe it was a couple weeks ago. I can't even remember. It's been so dang long. And. So I told you, okay, well, we'll fix it. We'll get it to where we don't have to have to make a pension payment. So what this will do is, at the at the end of the audit, and I'll I'll be the one to we'll look at it. We can discuss putting an extra pension payment once the audit's done and we see how much we have have left over in the budget. But we've got we've got pilot that's that's going to come up. And I'm not going to keep repeat myself, but we've got some serious financial issues coming down in the next couple years. Serious financial issues. Now, if you want to take away the, the roads and the, all the overlays from Ward 7, volunteer it. I'll put it towards the, toward the pension. I'll be happy to. You're talking like you don't understand the difference between the corporate fund and the infrastructure fund. Those are different funding sources. Now, as far as the comment I made two weeks ago, what I was explaining, Alban Hanauer, was that this budget is spending down our reserves. 
So if you look at the 12 months worth of revenue and you compare that to the 12 months worth of expenses, we're spending more money than we're taking in. Now, you took that as a, as a, as a statement as if I don't think we should put more money into the pension funds of any kind. Well, let me explain something to you. There's discretionary spending and there's mandatory spending. Well, if you've got a contract and you're obligated to spend money, that's mandatory. If you've got a pension obligation, it's mandatory. 80% of the budget is discretionary. So what I'm saying is, let's take care of our mandatory spending first, because we'll never get around that unless the state of Illinois changes its laws and we can allow bankruptcy by, by municipalities. And that's what we're headed for in Illinois, not just in Springfield, but throughout the whole state of Illinois. So my, my point is, take care of mandatory obligations first, then you spend uh, discretionary money. And uh, discretionary money means about 80% of the budget. Alderman Redpath. Alderman McMinimum, I disagree with your proposal, your observation that we don't, we're not going to put extra money in. I, I absolutely believe that's going to come to it this year. I agree with Alderman Hanauer to the fact that we we have to wait till the, the audit comes back and, and figure it out. But the, I absolutely believe that there'll be money going into extra money going into the fund this year. Well, again, that's kind of plain. Um, that's that's like misunderstanding the facts because okay, let's take that. Uh, let's say a hundred. Uh, let's take a million dollars of of cannabis money. But meanwhile, the pension debt grew by ten million dollars. That's not extra money. It's just not. It, we're just falling deeper and deeper behind. That's a new debt no, that's, that's Joe, not being paid for. With you. So I don't. I don't, I don't buy this thing. Or like Alderman Hanauer says. Well, now our fire department will charge. Uh, let's say five hundred dollars when there's an accident by a non-resident. Okay, that brings in fifty thousand dollars. Our problem is so much deeper than that. That that is kind of like trivial nothing. So, so you don't want us to do that? You, no, you I voted for it. I voted for it. I voted for it. But we have to do so much more. And people around here should understand that, and they should own up to it. Alderman woman Turner. Uh, I, I don't think anyone disagrees with Alderman McMenamin that we have a major pension problem. I think it's perfect, crystal clear. We all agree on it. Um, and I think that all of us are working towards addressing it. I, I see everyone when there's an opportunity to introduce some ordinance that will put a new funding stream towards the pension, we do that. I mean, um, Alderman Connolly and I did that with the with the cannabis. Uh, Alderman Hanauer did that with um, some ordinances that he did. Several of us have done that, and the mayor has, has done uh, some administrative things that address it. So, and I, and I, I will say that I believe that this amendment is a good compromise. Um, Alderman Hanauer had an, uh, had an uh, amendment that was going to strip away, and we weren't going to put, and it, we didn't have any percentage in there that we were going to reach, that we were going to put money in towards the pensions. So I think that this is a good Compromise, and I appreciate the fact that Alderman Hanar and I were able to talk it through and come up with this compromise. It doesn't mean that we're not going to put any money towards it if it doesn't get to this 20 percent. This is just, as you say, a mandatory versus, versus a uh, doing nothing. But I think all of us, at the end of the day, after we have our audit and we see how much money we have, we all want to put a percentage of that money towards the pensions. But I think that this is a good compromise, and I appreciate the fact that Alderman Hanar and I were able to work it. Alderwoman Conley. I'll be real brief. Um, Alderman Hanauer and, and Turner, I, I appreciate what you're doing with this. Um, my thoughts on this and my vote on this is that I would have liked to have seen this ordinance stay in place for longer than a year to see how it played out. Um, so I just want to understand. Let you understand well, that's where I'm coming from with this tonight. Thank you. Alderman Donlin. Thank you, Mayor. I, I appreciate the opportunity to talk about this ordinance because when I when you first approached me, Alderman Hanauer, I was a little bit apprehensive about the concept. But when it, through the discussion we have all had and had some with you some of you personally on the phone, the intent, and you've been clear tonight, the intent is once the audited numbers come in, that we will have a discussion around this horseshoe and then make some decisions. And so really, 
it's just not automatic by code, but there will be a discussion and then we'll make a decision. So. Well, we could go the other direction and amend it so it's not automatic where it has to come before and leave the percentages the same. So it just have to come before the council for approval one way or the other and then the council can decide at that point in time. Just leave it as it is for now, Mayor. It's something that Any other discussion? <coughs> All in favor of the amendment, say aye. 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 Opposed, say nay. So we're voting on the ordinance as amended. Any discussion? Doesn't look like it. Good discuss. And the ordinance as amended passes eight voting yes, two voting no. The chair will entertain a motion for an ominous vote for agenda number 2020-061 through 2020-065 for reappointments. So move. Second. The so movement second, any discussion? All in favor say aye. Aye. Opposed say nay, motion carries. 2020-061, ordinance approving the reappointment of Craig Colbrook, JD, to the Springfield Historic Sites Commission. 2020-062. <coughs> an ordinance approving the reappointment of Stephanie Doe to the Springfield Historic Sites Commission. 2020-063, an ordinance approving the reappointment of Aaron Schroeder to the Springfield Historic Sites Commission. 2020-064, an ordinance approving the reappointment of Ernest A. Slotag to the Springfield Historic Sites Commission. 2020-065, an ordinance approving the reappointment of Peggy T. Grant to the Springfield Historic Sites Commission. Chair will entertain a motion to place agenda number 2020-061 through 2020-065 on final passage. Second. second. The movement second. Any discussion? All in favor of the motion, vote yes. Those opposed, vote no. Voting is now open. And the ordinance passes 10 voting yes, none voting no. Is there any uh, unfinished business come before the council? All the women come. Mayor, um, I'm bringing up unfinished business that was um, brought up last week at the Committee of the Whole. Um, this regards the operation of the Winter Warming Center. Mm -hmm. um, I, I, I know that we have people here to speak on this issue. Um, my understanding was that we would have someone from the Community Relations Office here tonight to answer questions. Uh, Juan Wirt is out of the office. Does he have a number two who... who no, not really. Okay, I was told differently. Um, well then, um, so you know, um, we do have a number of people who, who want to speak on this issue. We've had some very disturbing reports that have been, um, that have been shared with us. I sat down this weekend. I've, I've talked to almost everyone, I think, on council about my experience listening to the stories of people and their distress and mis their distress and mistreatment at the Winter Warming Center. I'm, I'm bringing this up here because that center is being run with the city's logo on the side of that building. And Mayor, you requested that we send monies to this, this building. So a um, couple of questions just to start the conversations. Sure. First of all, I'd like to know how much money the city has put into the Winter Warming Center thus far and what, what do we have budgeted and planned for this. Um, I'd like to know what kind of data collection we're doing there so that we have records of this. I, we did, um, at quarter after five, get um, an email with numbers on the increased, the number of calls for service from the police department. That number has gone up, in my mind, in an alarming rate. Um, the issues that we, we talked about last Tuesday have not been resolved. They have not been changed. I was speaking with people on Saturday who Friday night had been at the warming center and who were still undergoing mistreatment. I was told by more than one person, multiple people, what happens in the warming center stays in the warming center. The city is not running a fight club. That is not what this center is intended to be. This center was put in place as an emergency stop gate for people who are experiencing an extreme situation in their life. It was supposed to protect people. It was supposed to provide a place of shelter over the winter months. And I, I know everyone's tired. I know we all are. It's been a very long night. But this is extremely distressing, it's extremely disturbing, and we need to have changes and we need to have results that happen sooner rather than later. That said, I, one request I would ask, Mayor, is that we, have, we ensure that there are cameras at the Winter Warming Center. I know that's happened under other, in other situations, so that we are getting out of a cycle of he said, she said. And again, I'd like to reiterate, this is not a one person said, but multiple people from different 
different times telling me the same basic story, their same shared experience, and it is devastating. That said, um, Mayor, I would ask that we could um, acknowledge the citizens who've come tonight to speak to this matter. Sure. Uh, Salvation Army's here as well. With regards to the budget, uh, based on previous years, we spent upwards of 75,000, so. We've spent uh, we 75,000? Mm -hmm. So what do we have budgeted for this year? Actually, we haven't had the uh, receipts coming in from the Salvation Army yet, but we expect to probably spend above that because we've added additional staff <laughs> with regards to the additional numbers. But as far as the data goes, uh, they could speak to, uh, Salvation Army could speak to that. With regards to the issues, uh, when the letter was received, there are cameras uh, that were installed, I believe, Monday uh, with regards to the common area, uh, and that was by the police. Uh, with regards to the other issue that's under our purview and the chief can come up and speak to it, I think one of the questions was how uh, people were frisked or when they came in, how were they handled, and I'll allow the sp chief to speak to uh, that particular issue, and then Salvation Army is here to uh, speak on their own behalf. Well, and, and I will say, Chief, um, and I do appreciate that your staff has been spending um, time there and, and helping with the intake procedures. My concern is not with your, what happens when a police officer is supervising an intake process. That is not my concern, and that's not the concern that was raised. It's when the staff that's on site there um, are, un, are unobserved by our police officers that people are, are being discriminated against, they're being treated with the levels of disrespect that border on uh, abuse. abuse. Thank you. I was told by a, by a gentleman that he was denied entry because of his sexual orientation. That is unacceptable in any world of any level. I mean, this is, you're, you're getting tired, Aaron, and, and upset, Aaron, because this issue has touched my heart, and it should, I think, unless you've got a heart of stone, it touches everyone's. So, I agree, um, it does touch everybody. Uh, the Low barrier but I shelter, guess I'm, that's, I'm also that's asking for more than touching, regarding, I'm asking for change. We'd ask the Salvation Army to come up and they can speak to how they handled uh, the issue with regards to uh, personnel. But um, the, other also, Mayor, also, our, the other thing we have done, uh, I've turned it over to the Inspector General uh, last week. So they'll be, you know, they'll, he'll review the accusations from that and make a recommendation in addition to what the Salvation Army has done. And Mayor, just for clarification, I have also contacted the Inspector General. I have maybe a different perspective on how I'm addressing it. Um, I would ask that the council be get, given numbers from the last four years on what the city has expended for the Winter Warming Center. And I sure. realize Director McCarty doesn't have that at hand right now, but I would like that for next Tuesday's meeting at the latest. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Captain Eddie. No, thank you. Thank you, Council. Thank you, Mayor. Um, I just I want to start out by saying that uh, we started this process in October and I we did it completely because it was a need and we yes. stepped up to take the need um, it was not impossible but it was improbable to pull it together in the two and a half weeks that we had um, the reason we were able to pull it together in those two and a half weeks is because we have staff that were absolutely fantastic it's people that are, are committed not to make money because you absolutely aren't going to make money at the winter warming center but to helping people and making sure that they're off the streets and they're in a warm place and and, the, and, and our whole goal our whole mission is to help to, to serve humans without discrimination and I, I, I can deny completely that, that that happened and I don't if that person wants to come to me I will address that problem and every single problem that's arisen I have addressed and I've taken care of we've put other things in place with the cameras were one of them I put a comment box in a place that was not out in the open so that they could legitimately you know, put a comment in there without anybody knowing who it was or anything. Um, my casework staff has been down there very regularly. They go almost every night to make sure that they see what's going on. I talked to the chief to make sure that the, the police were in there in the times when we were, we were the, the most chaos was happening. So just 
I, I just want you to know that I'm committed to fixing any problems that we have. Mm -hmm. And this isn't, this isn't something that it's just myself doing. I, I'm guided by a, a multinational organization. This is not just a little HR practice, a, a human resource practice. This is something that, that all the policies and procedures, all the guidelines, the way we do the shelter, the way we do all of this, it's all ran from, from offices even above me. And so uh, I promise that we're going to do everything we can to make sure that, that need the, these concerns are addressed. I've made sure that each person that's, that's reached out to me, I have addressed the concern. And there, I'm not going to say that we've done everything right. And I, but I am going to say that everything that we found that we we're doing wrong, we have taken steps to connect correct. And this is a living, breathing thing. I'm not going to say that we, we have the exact perfect system, but I, we're more than happy to keep changing this as we need to go to be flexible and to make sure that we're delivering a high quality of care to the, the people. Alderman Cap Turner. Yeah, um, I appreciate, I appreciate the, the daunting task that you had uh, before you. I know that two and a half weeks is, you know, almost like you said, impossible to do. So I appreciate I appreciate that. Um, I also appreciate the uh, local businesses that stepped up Absolutely. to do um, almost a total re remodel of the building. So I'm I'm very appreciative of all that. Um, however, I am very concerned that. We had, um, several weeks ago, we had several individuals come and talk about um, egregious activity that was happening at the winter, winter Warming Center. And everyone, not everyone, but most people said, oh, no, 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 that, that couldn't have happened. Uh, you know, I, that didn't happen. And just kind of, you know, brushed it off. And then a, a, a gentleman, a retired gentleman, went literally undercover in the winter warming center and we found out that everything people had said to us happened and more yes. and and I was I was yeah. it, it was very disturbing to me yeah it, it was very disturbing to me and so I I appreciate the fact that you did go undercover so that we had someone else that could someone else that could say yes, this was happening. I, I am I am a bit annoyed that no one believed the homeless people, but yes. I'm glad that you went in and and they believed you. Um, I'm, I'm I'm equally concerned because the, I don't think the public. I don't think the public sees the differential between the Winter Warming Center and the city and the Salvation Army. I think everyone believes that it's the city of Springfield's operation. So the fact that these things were happening is, is really um, even more disturbing, which goes back to what I said earlier, that I believe the city has a responsibility to have a comprehensive homeless outreach initiative, and hopefully we can talk about that later. But the other thing that I'm concerned about is that from, from all of the reports that we had from homeless individuals and our undercover boss, that the, the individual that was perpetrating most of these acts is also a city employee <coughs> who was working part in the evenings, I guess, at the Winter Warming Center. So I, I'm, I'm really very, very, very disturbed about that. So my question is, is that individual still working there or? He is. <coughs> so, he, so he's still working there? He is. Are you paying him or is the city paying him? Yes, we are paying him. So he's being paid by the city during the day and by the Salvation Army at night? That's correct. So if you, so I guess, and not to get into the HR piece of it, but um, in my past life, I did have some experience in, in HR and EEO and all of that kind of thing. And I'm just not understanding why, mm -hmm. if you have all of these complaints about this individual and you have collaboration and my understanding even some video collaboration why would you keep that individual in that in I that don't position? have all of that I have Joe's letter I've gotten two letters and two calls and 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 none of them 
Um, none of them were actual people in the center. I keep hearing that you're talking to the people in the center, and that's why I made sure that the caseworkers were there in the beginning to make sure that they could hear from and, and be available and those kind of things. And none of us have heard from those people. I, but it like just, it, but it just seems, it just seems to me, and I'm, and this is the last thing I'm going to say. But it just seems to me that if you have a complaint that's that egregious from multiple individuals and from an, an outside collaborator that the first thing that you would do would be to remove that individual pending an investigation. Yes. That's, I mean, I, I, you know, I spent some years in management and I, I just feel like that that would have been the appropriate thing to do. I, I just, I think that it puts, I think that it puts a very dark light on the city of Springfield right now with with all of this that that's happening and and I will tell you I was I was I was already very upset but when I saw the video that was on um, I believe it was a YouTube video the first person I saw in that video was one of my childhood friends that I know has some mental health issues and I was I just couldn't believe it I, I was I was devastated I, I, I was just devastated because I understand that people find themselves in situations that are beyond their control, and when they're at that dark place in their life, they don't need more hurt and harm put on them. They need comfort and compassion. And to allow an, that individual to remain in that position, I believe we are adding to that hurt and harm and not offering compassion. Alderwoman Conley. Thank you. Um, and Captain, please understand, I do, this was, a, this was a difficult situation that had to be, we needed something in a short, a short time frame. I am going to, instead of repeating any of Alderwoman Turner's beautiful words, I'm going to echo them, and I'm going to just add that you are not talking about a population that is probably accustomed to going to Salvation Army and looking for Captain, Sure. you know, Captain Jeff, that's, these are people who are experiencing trauma, who are going through a situation that, you know, there but for the grace of God is what I think every day. I am very grateful for, for what I do have, and, and I am, I, I, I mean, I've been praying a lot more these days. Um, I, I think to dismiss these concerns because they haven't come to you sure. is, is to dismiss the severity of what our people who are experiencing homelessness are living through right now. Sure. And so I, I would ask that you take that very much to heart. I don't want, I, I have not dismissed these concerns. This is ongoing. This is something that, that is, it, it, I'm working on it. And, I, I think and Alderwoman I, Turner gave you a solution that needs sure. to be implemented immediately. And I've, and I've heard the opposite as well. I've heard, I've heard as much evidence on the opposite and that's where I'm, where I'm really stuck. When I will say, I've heard from people saying there are people who get preferential treatment. There are people who are happy to do whatever they're told to do because they get they get preferential treatment. But if you're not in that club, and again, this is a shelter. It shouldn't be an us versus them situation. If you're not in with the in crowd, then you're getting cursed at. You're getting dismissed. You're getting diminished. You're getting kicked out when someone attacks you because you've asked them to turn lights out at 3.30 in the morning or keep your voices down at 3.30 in the morning. This is the, These are the kinds of stories. The weight of these stories is overwhelming. So there may, I'm grateful not everyone is having a terrible experience. It shouldn't come to that. The fact of the matter is, is that we, we're hearing and we're hearing and we're going to hear more and I appreciate you coming and staying for so long because I, I, I respect this is your time that you're volunteering to be with us tonight. Um, and I, I appreciate that, but I want you to know the only reason I would have brought this up after all of us sitting through a very long meeting already is because the stories that I've heard and the evidence that I've seen is, is overwhelming and yes, it's devastating. These are people who have been traumatized and we're doubling down on the trauma. And so I do ask that you listen to the people who've come to speak tonight and please Absolutely. understand that, that we're all coming from a place, well, let me just say, we're coming from a place of solutions. This is, not, this is not a place of casting stones, although there's stones being thrown because there's a reason for that. 
But the solution is that we have to provide, this safety net needs to continue for a little bit longer because unfortunately yes. it's the only net we've got. Right, thank you. So we do have uh, some people uh, signed up to speak. Uh, Joe O'Neill. If you'd state the, your name uh, and address for the council, we'd appreciate it. Uh, my name is Joe O'Neill, and I'm the, the, the snitch, the spy. <laughs> I've been called a lot of things in the last three weeks. Um, my goal here is not to be an adversary of the mayor or Captain Eddie. I started a year and a half ago in my, uh, my passion in helping the homeless at Salvation Army. Um, what happened is uh, I watched a meeting take place here on December 17th with Reggie. And he brought up some uh, talking points, some bullet points, laws being broken and medication was being stolen and phones going missing. And I mean, the list is long. And I, I saw that and I'm thinking, wow. Juan Huerta sure did dismiss that in record time. It took about one minute. There was no investigation. There was no nothing. It just, it didn't happen because everything's running well, which he said eight times to the city council while he was up here. Everything's perfect. Um, so I let it go. I thought, you know, rumors, innuendo that we hear in the workplace. Um, I, I respect these people. Uh, I, res I met one who worked. I took a tour of the Winter Warming Center. I was impressed with them. Uh, I don't have an agenda. But there comes a point where when you're in, when you're amongst these homeless folks, they're my friends. I've come to know them. They trust me because I've established a relationship with them and I've proven that I can be trusted. I've given a lot of money and a lot of time. Somebody needed to know the truth. And with all due respect, Mayor, this is what you said at that meeting on December 17th. You basically said, contact me. Contact your aldermen. Contact the Salvation Army. That's what I did. Matter of fact, they, they used the verbiage tonight, uh, observe and report. I'm not a policeman. I'm not an investigator. I went in there for 45 minutes, planning on spending the night. And I went back out to my car after 45 minutes. I didn't say a word. And I wrote an overview of what took place. I have no reason to lie. Uh, I'm a sick man. That, you know, those people do not know my story. Those people do not even know the story of the homeless that are staying there because they don't care. There's, there's no love, there's no passion, there's no empathy. I, this isn't to destroy somebody's uh, reputation. I'm, I'm not going there. Uh, I don't know Mr. Hines. I don't know those people that are there. All I know is what happened. And uh, I wrote you a letter, Mr. Mayor. I wrote Captain Eddie a letter. I wrote you basically what I thought was a pretty comprehensive overview of what took place with a copy of the emails that you sent me. Uh, I returned, I replied to your emails. <laughs> Uh, your, your letter to me was four sentences. Your letter to me was eight sentences. Neither one, no one contacted me in the investigation, which was reported on Channel 20 as complete. We did everything to fix it. That's what you said. I've got it right here. So what am I going to do? I need to go to the next level. Um, my hand is forced. It, it makes me look like I'm a liar. Uh, so I said, well, I'll, I'll just go and start taking video. So I interviewed 50 of them. I took video of 30 of them. 
and dozens of people were with me when I did it. Even the media. Thank God for the media. I believe this isn't about the quantity of videos. This problem is about the content of the videos. And what I have delivered via a web, via a YouTube page, via a disc I just handed, is disgusting. It's unacceptable. Um, I have dedicated the rest of my life, whatever that may be, to this issue. I am their conduit. And I'm not going to waste any more time. I've told my story. That's all I did. Uh, but I can tell you, I'm going to be here reporting back to the city council every council meeting. Um, if there's a lawsuit to be had, I'm going to pay for it. Because those things, such as the, uh, the gay man, those things such as the walker not being able to enter the premises. I mean, do you want, you want the video on that? I mean, I'd be glad to, yeah. glad to share it. I mean. Yeah. Yes, I do. <laughs> Is it, do, you, do you need something more terrible than what I've already discussed, what I already put in this letter right here? How terrible does it have to be? You know, I'm, I, <coughs> I, I even mentioned my letter. I, you know, I just remove the gentleman like you would do in any business. You would remove a gentleman at City Hall if they had that job here. You'd remove, a, you'd remove that person from where I work. Anywhere, anybody that has any common sense, business common sense, would have done that first. Yeah. You wanna, I mean, I'll give you room to respond to it. I'm, I'm, I'm curious. Do you know me? Huh? Do you know yeah, me? I don't know. If you My name is Gary Spaulding. Uh, wait, wait Sir, a second. Sir, no. Sir Neil, if you would please no. take a seat. Not order. What's that? If you please take a seat yeah. so he could. Okay. Uh, wait, yeah. wait, have you finished? Yeah. Have, Mr. O'Neill, have you finished? <laughs> yeah, I've finished. Okay. Yeah. If you'd state your name and address for the council, we'd appreciate it. My name is Gary Spaulding. I'm from here in Springfield, Illinois. I moved back here about uh, two years ago. Um, I was um, the first um, person of color to enter the Salvation Army from Springfield as an officer, and I was a Salvation Army officer. I worked in Kansas City for the last 35 years. Um, part of my job in Kansas City was to um, put together homeless shelters, help develop homeless shelters, and uh, I was the homeless coordinator for the metropolitan area, and that's, that's what I did. First of all, I'll say I never opened a shelter where I allowed people that were obviously intoxicated. Um, and, you know, some people may see some, um, they may see that as, um, as a way to operate a shelter. But I never operated one. And the reason that I asked if he, knew who I, if he knew who I was is I'm the person that's been driving that big monstrosity around on Sundays and on Thanksgiving feeding people um, here in Springfield for the last year. Um, so my job was not only to go around, and this is as a volunteer, okay? Um, my job was not only to go around feeding people, but encouraging them and bringing them to the shelter, um, to the warming center. What, you know, some of the things that I've heard, um, some of them I understand a little bit. Because I've been in situations where people have said things to me, they've said things about me, um, um, I was accused of discriminating against uh, another black person, okay? Um, and so I'm used to that. But what I'm not used to is someone bringing um, things that come to them from people who are obviously intoxicated, people who have some... I, no, excuse me. 
You have to come to the podium Excuse to me. speak, please. Have, have some um, degree of, of mental problems. Sometimes that's the issue. Um, and the thing about the wheelchair, I took a wheelchair in there just Sunday night. And a gentleman on a wheelchair, he was sitting out in the rain. Speak to the council, please. Okay. He was sitting out in the rain, and he had a wheelchair. And I took him in there, helped him up into the building, and he was welcomed in. He came in, um, and they did the things that they needed to do, do to give him a place to stay for the night. You know, probably a lot of the people that are complaining about what's going on there are probably some of the same people who said the homeless shelter is not going to be in my neighborhood. That's not it. No. 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 Yes. No. We can't speculate. No. no. Yes. No. Just keep, uh, keep to the facts, please. Yes. Okay. I'm sorry. That's right. Um, but what I, the main thing that I wanted to say is that I've seen a lot of things and I've been in a lot of different situations in homeless shelters, warming centers, and things like that. Um, and I've never, I've never seen or heard some of the things that I've heard here tonight. Okay? Um, but, I, but I also have been treated in them a lot better than the captains have been treated here tonight. Um, he's not the guilty person. He's trying to make something good of a very bad situation. You know, we've talked about many times being concerned about people sleeping in doorways and being afraid that someone was going to freeze out there this winter. And we've worked hard and long to, um, to try to make sure that there's a place where they can go and where they can be accepted where they can be fed. Um, when the warming center closes, I'll go back to feeding people. You know, I'll go back to taking the truck around and taking meals to the people that are in the streets wherever they are. Okay? Um, but I just could not let the things be said without any, um, without any kind of, um, y yes, Proof <laughs> um, and make um, the city, the Salvation Army, the villains for wanting to try to do the right thing. I and I, I want to be real clear, if I can, Mayor. Mm -hmm. Woman Conley. I absolutely do not consider Salvation Army to be a villain in this situation. I'm asking for a more a more immediate and a more um, comprehensive solution to a problem. I am glad that not everyone is having a bad situation there, and I've, I've said that already, but the fact that there are enough people who are, who are repeating, not repeating, but saying the same variations of a story to me tells me that we do have an overwhelming wealth of evidence that shows that there is a continuing problem there. And I appreciate your time and, and your, your service to our community, that, and I say that from my heart, I don't want to, I please don't think that this is, I, I am upset, I am, I get hot and every now and then I've, the Irish comes out at me and I get loud. Um, what I'm saying, what, what the hope at the end of this is that tomorrow we sit down and, and the Salvation Army, if, if there's assistance that's needed that it's given, then that we have a better center coming out of this. That's can what I I'm ask, asking can for. Can I ask another question? Has anyone uh, here volunteered to go into the warming center. Yes. Again, to, the, can I just say the problem is it. not when people I are mean, there watching. I mean, to see for themselves what's going on and to help yeah, but yes. it's, uh, provide the services. We had a witness who went in. No, he's talking about actually worked at the centers. Yes, that and, I, and, I'm, yes. and what I'm saying is, is that's why the undercover component, and again, it feels so cloak and dagger, but the under, undercover aspect of Mr. O'Neill going in gains even more credibility. My kids, my family, everyone knows how to behave in front of someone who's watching you. Mm -hmm. I know that. Mm -hmm. um, it's when people aren't watching, that's what I want to know about. And that's what Mr. O'Neill is speaking to tonight. Okay, and, and has anyone d even taken into account the fact that the captain told him that his social workers have been there during the time the center was open? 
uh, to observe what was going on. I, I'm still hearing stories yes. all day Saturday. I sat and listened to people telling their Mayor, stories. Okay, uh, I mean, first of all, Captain, you, you just you just got the video, the stick with the video, right? Joe, you just gave it to him? It's been on the web for a couple of days. All right, but you haven't seen it, right? I haven't seen it. And you haven't seen it either? Because, I mean... I, I guess what I want to see is where do we go? I, I, I believe everything you said. I believe everything that, that you said. I don't know that you, since you haven't seen the video, I think that's a little bit of a, a you know, it's a little bit of a disservice that, that you need to see the video so you can judge yourself. But where do we go from here? I mean, we can stay here all night, and we can we can, we know there's uh, there's apparently issues, but where do we go? Where, how do we move forward? Yep. But That's I, my I question. I wish I could just speak yep. so that I could bring yeah. some solutions. We have uh, other people. It's a long yep. Evening. Yep. James Kass. Smiley, you would like to come forward? Then Susan Phillips. Can I say Phillips. something though, real quick? Yeah, this, uh, this, this building is definitely Gregory. my war. Mr. O'Neill, before you leave, I'd like you to get my car because this is the, or right, Mr. O'Neill, mm -hmm. Mr. O'Neill, I'd love to. Yes. Um, be, before you leave, I'd like for, for you to get my card and, and, and things because I, you know, I, w I would like to hear these things firsthand and not on the news and from my colleagues. Because I do go there quite frequently, away from away from council and just in my normal street clothes and things, and, and do have a family member that stays in there right now to this day. So I definitely care about that. I definitely talked to Reggie when he when he um, brought this to us a, a long time ago, long long time ago, and and we definitely went over uh, fact versus reality, and 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 the things that he was bringing were very serious claims, but they were very serious claims against every entity that supports homeless in this city. Reggie, am I correct? I, I think it wasn't. Uh, it wasn't. It wasn't just on the winter warming shelter. He has some things to say about helping hands and what's going on. So the problem is 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 that this 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 thing. When the lights aren't on, it's it, it just we can't control everything. But every entity is having some issues and having some sneaky things going on and, and paying themselves to be these champions. But we got some things going on in all of these, in all of these entities that need to be cleaned up. So I, I feel like the individual who, 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 who stepped out of line, he, he's, he's, he's a decent guy. Called me one time at 2 o'clock in the night crying because he was going to have to put mine out. And I told him he got to do what he had to do because I do know the atmosphere at times can get a little willy-nilly. But we've got sneaky but things wait, going wait, wait, on right here. And I, and, and, right here. And I got the floor. So, so what I'm saying is he does need to be removed. He doesn't need to be there. I tell him that to his face and as, as, as far as wine too because it, it's, it's, it's a situation that doesn't, that, that's not well. It's not working. But all of those individuals that's working there in the Winter Warming Center are just not mistreating those folks at all. And, and, and I'm, not, I'm not here to, to, to take away what wrongdoing was done, but they have a, how many, how many people you got working over there? 13. 13 people. We're talking about one person, maybe two, from the, what, what the lady said in the video, but she didn't mention her name. So we need to go after that lady as well and figure out who that is on that video as, as far as who she was and grabbing people and putting hands on people. Um, so, so Reggie, you, you, when, you, when you go to Mr. O'Neill and all of them, you make sure you have them go, go in the helping hands. They need to go in contact ministries. They need to go in all of them so we can make sure we, we, we get to all the, all the issues, okay? The, the issues, the same things that you came and told me. You said people are, from Helping Hands is, is using their link cards, right? That's what you told me. I told you that that's very serious, that you need to bring me proof before I, before I take that to anybody. Correct? Um, um, yes, yes, yes. And then I got a couple calls from the audience told me to step down. Then the homeless people came to me and told me to step down. Then I got a couple calls in the middle of the night telling me they're going to get ready to investigate some people's. Because when I'm supposed to set up a meeting 
with the, the peoples. Everybody like came to me, they're like, Rachel, you just can't talk about it. You need facts. I said, okay, what we got to do is send somebody in there undercover to get the evidence that we need. And that's exactly what the community did. I didn't know who they sent in there, but I did have a feeling on my phone when somebody sent it to me, said we getting ready to send somebody in to investigate the woman's center to get the evidence that we need to bring back to the city council that we can address the problem and get the people's fired out of there and put the right people's in there. James, if you'd like to come forward, please, and state your name and address for the council. We'd appreciate it. James Smiley, um, um, just as a citizen, I've been working with the homeless uh, population in Spring in St. Louis. I sit on the board of uh, St. Patrick's Center, and also uh, I instruct and do ministry for the men's men and helping hands. And we're developing a program to help work through some of these issues. Um, I was brought in at the last minute and had an opportunity to sit down and actually interview some of the people myself. This is the issue we're dealing with. We're not dealing with where, where there was a problem in Helping Hands, Salvation Army. This is the issue. And the concern should be, how do we fix this? Then we can worry about something else. Yep. That's one. The number two thing is, you can't stress or bring trauma to people who have already been stressed and traumatized. You defeat the whole purpose of having a warming center. That's right. So what we're doing is we're causing people to be in a cold even when they're supposed to be in a warm place mm -hmm. because we're treating them with inhumane aspects. We even have mistreated a, a, a visually impaired gentleman there are people who don't even want to talk about the problem for fear of retaliation. So what are we really dealing with? We're really dealing with the inability that when you can't do something right when it comes to homelessness, get the people who know how to do it and work alongside of them and quit trying to do it by yourself and quit covering up what you're doing when you know it's not right. There's no way 10 people are gonna get on a video and tell you it's a problem, and it's not a problem. There's a problem there. You don't have to like, you don't have to, everybody don't have to see the video. What happens is the leadership has to step up and say, you know what, we have a problem here. We need to investigate it. We need to replace the people immediately. We need to put them on my administrative leave. Uh, suspension or something, let's get the right people in here. Because the problem is, it may not be the Salvation Army. Maybe they did the very best that they could. But when you don't have the right trained people, this is what happens. And hurting people hurt people. So part of the problem is, you have the wrong people working in there. Because why would somebody in a warming center by link from someone who needs it, who lives on the street. You're insensitive. You're missing the point of why you work in the warming center is to help them keep their resources and divert them in the right direction. <clears throat> so here's my solution, so we don't have to go all through this. I have sat down with a group of people, and we said we want to come in, and we want to help get this straight, Captain. We want to help you get it straight. We want to bring trained people, and we want to help you remove the people who are doing wrong and put right people in there. You can't beat that. Who's we? We're, I believe that. Who's I, we? Help the continuum. He can work with the Salvation right, Army. Salvation that. Army, uh, uh, concerned citizens. So we have a group of people who we have already sat down and decided we want to come in and help. We don't want to keep on talking about this all night. I commend you for the budget. I commend you for the hard work. But I prefer to come here with a solution that says, look, we need to get some of these people out of the way because they should have never been working there in the first place. The favoritism and the nepotism, the, the, the mistreat some people and treat the others right and wrong. Regardless of the reason, you don't do that. I agree. You're dealing with this population. Let's have some sensitivity from the mayor's office all the way to the, the lay people. 
That's not one person or another person. It's all of us getting the idea. We have to come to a, a, uni, a unified agreement on something. Get it done correctly and show that as a city, we can unite and get something done as far as our neighbors. I hate to preach, but I sat up here for five hours after being at work for nine and sat here and patiently waited on everyone, called in like I was supposed to. But this is the most important thing. If your staff is right, then keep them. Rewrite the policies and guidelines. Make a new intake. When you, you have an intake, make sure you make a referral to the other service agencies. Make a community oversight for the warming center. Resolution, teach people how to re uh, have resolution, de-escalation, new police intermediary, and conflict resolution. Staff training. Changing policies to best fit their personal agendas has to go out. Reprimand the right people. Appointment of individuals or committee. A non-emergency call to win a warming center contended by the police. The police were even give, given directives not to intercede. Just come in, whoever's wrong, then you, they have to go. Give the police some autonomy to come in there and make the judgment call. They're police officers. They do this every day. They come in and gotta follow the dictates of a mean, upset, egregious staff member and not have no decision-making power, that's not going to work. So how do we work this as a group of people? So everybody has, has gotten a bad, a black eye, from the city to the police to the um, EMTs, everybody, but I, I refuse to believe it's that bad. But I only know how good it can be when we all just work together. And so that's the only thing I put forth, Mayor, and this council, is can I, with a group of people, work to make this situation better? So nobody has to be in the cold. So nobody has to lose their job. So nobody can be mistreated. So nobody can be felt like they're less than a citizen of the city. Thank you, James. I think everybody's in agreement with the statements, but Chief would like to clarify something, it looks like. And then uh, it'd be uh, Susan Phillips and then Ed Reiner and then whoever else would like to, since they I just want to go on record saying that our officers operate with the discretion and decision making at the shelter just as they do on the street. There has been no order to them to follow any kind of dictatorship from the Salvation Army or the leadership at that shelter. There have been no instructions to that other than to be there at 5 o'clock to help with the intake to make sure people are acting appropriate during that time since that seems to be when there's the most chaos. Previously, it was 6 p.m. We moved to 5 p.m. at the request of the captain. That's what we do. There has been no hands-off approach from the police department at the request of the leadership of the Salvation Army or anybody else. If you could. Thank you. But any problem that we have, I, pre I appreciate what you just said. But I believe that any problem or any miscommunication, we can work that out. That's all I'm saying. Okay, thank you, sir. I just want to point yes, out something. Yes, woman Desenzo. Really quickly, we were um, we were lied to last week. We were told that there weren't any city employees working at the war winter warming shelter. Our name is on this. We were told by one last week, yeah, are there know. any city employees working here? No, there are not. And then we come to find out through other means that yes, there is a city employee working at the winter warming center. If that's the case, he must have misunderstood the question. <laughs> he said it here, several times. I mean, he'll be here next week. I mean, I think he meant uh, that no one was working as a city employee. As um, a city employee. Maybe I don't that's want to what split hairs. Yeah. Oh, it's quarter to 11. But he'll be here, he'll here. here next week. Can't I mean, you know, someone who's not here. Yeah. Sorry. I hope they have secondary employment filled out. It's late. I invite you to take a breath. My name is Susan Phillips. I live on uh, Pawnee Road, and I pastor First Presbyterian Church across the street. I know that you all came under very short order to get the shelter open when the Center for Health and Housing collapsed in October, much to my distress. 
Our team served meals in November for the first time and on November 18th wrote a letter to Juan Huerta expressing um, our concerns about unsafe overcrowding conditions and suggesting ways to remedy it. December 17th, one of our citizens reported to you that there were illegal things happening at the shelter and some of you dismissed it and denied it and some of you were brave enough to say, actually, I've gotten calls too. I've gotten complaints too. Three of you, in fact, said that. Teresa Haley from the NAACP stood up and said they had gotten complaints. You have been receiving complaints from your citizens since December that things are problematic there. I have talked to residents who will not talk to you because they are afraid that they will lose the only shelter they have and then be on the street in weather that can be lethal at this time of year. That's how serious this is. They will take the abuse that is being dished out primarily by one person in management there rather than risk getting sick or injured or dying on the street. This is typical of abuse. And abusers will always have people who will stand back and say, no, no, he's a good guy, unless you're the one being abused. I also, in January, heard reports from two healthcare workers, two citizens, one of my colleagues about abuse. In one of those cases, an elderly woman with mental illness was put out on the street at 10 o'clock at night because she couldn't behave herself. This is a low barrier shelter. This is the place you go if you are elderly and mentally ill and have nowhere else to go. If a person has needs that cannot be met by the staff, there should be protocols for providing for their care. Those protocols should never include putting elderly, mentally ill people on the street at 10 o'clock at night in the winter. I have been trained and certified as a mandatory reporter of abuse for 30 years. I'm older than I look. <laughs> I know that when I receive a report of abuse, the person being accused must be removed from their role so they cannot abuse further while that situation is being investigated. I have been in conversation with Captain Eddie. I have asked him who the investigators talked to. Did they talk to the family of the woman who was put out of the shelter? Did they talk to the, the healthcare workers who were threatened by the manager at the warming center? He didn't know that they had. So the investigators aren't talking to the people who have been threatened, who have been verbally assaulted. You have a situation where you have an employee, a contracted employee maybe, maybe not your employee, but a contracted one. It is your responsibility to safeguard the people in the shelter. If I, as a pastor, receive an allegation of abuse by someone in my care, it doesn't matter if they're an employee, a, a volunteer, a contract worker, someone who just showed up that day, it's my responsibility to safeguard the well-being of people in my care. And if I don't remove that person, if I allow them to continue and they abuse further, I'm liable. We are liable. You have a situation where you need to remove someone who has been accused of abuse, verbal abuse, emotional abuse, I'm not sure what other kinds of abuse, discrimination, inappropriate behavior. I have personally, in conversation with Captain Eddie, volunteered to bring folks in to provide compassion and care for residents and to lower the temperature in the room. Because I know it's a hard job. I know it's a hard job. Y'all know I know it's a hard job. We have other people in town who can help make this a safe place for people who are vulnerable and traumatized. I'm asking you to please take immediate action to make sure that abusive people do not remain in those positions. Thank you. Yes, Alderman Hanauer. Mayor, I'd, uh, 
I, I know we can't tell you what to do as far as personnel rules, but I would think that at this point you need to revoke his secondary employment at, at, with, uh, and, and that would it, it stop him from being able to work at the shelter. I think that, you know, uh, he's Dorsey, working for Salvation Army. It's not an appointment. But he, he still has to have secondary employment approved uh, by the city. And if that's the case, you pull case him and then he can't work there, fixes the problem. Absolutely. It might fix one of the problems. I'm not okay. saying that that's going to fix all the problems. But Correct. I think that that's something that we should do as a city. And I, we can't say that you, we can't vote. We can't, this is a, this is a personnel issue. It's also a personnel issue with you guys, but I mean, yeah, we'll take that. I don't think we have action. to hear. You know, everybody's. It's it's all pointing this direction. Now, I'm not saying it. Like I said, that he's the only one, but at least it's. It seems all the spotlights seem to go that direction. Do, so, corporate. Am I am I missing something? Now I'd ask the corporate council to uh, comment on it. I mean, well, this is, to... I mean, it's, it's a very clear personnel issue. I mean, it's not something that's uh, really appropriate to be talking about in this context, but the, if the uh, person involved is working currently for the Salvation Army, they should take the initial steps. However, the mayor last week asked the Inspector General, Judge Holmes, uh, he's already received a tremendous amount of information about it. Uh, the mayor just got inadvertently a copy of the video, I guess, today, this afternoon, which had not been provided to the city before, but the inspector general has that. So the next steps will be pretty, uh, he, uh, Judge Holmes had indicated that he thought it would take a couple of weeks, but his intent is to uh, talk to all of the parties involved. But we also have a policy that secondary employment has to be approved, is that correct? Yes, and we'll have to check into that. That gives us a little bit of little leeway to revoke his secondary employment application. We'll have to look into that, yes. Thank you. Yes. If you'd uh, state your name and address for the council, we'd appreciate it. It's Ed Rainier, address is 72 Bobble Link, Springfield 62702. I'm going to make this very brief. I had a a written talk, but uh, I'm totally exhausted, as I'm sure you are. Um, I volunteer at Helping Hands, and I also do outreach with the homeless. I was standing outside this evening before coming in, and a young woman came up to me and began sharing her story. She's with her husband. They've been here seven months. They're homeless. They're staying at the warming center. She's pregnant. She went to the emergency room at, at Memorial and was told there's a good chance she's going to lose her baby. She stays at the warming center. She works at McDonald's on Clear Lake. She has to be there at 5 in the morning. She says some mornings she gets up at 2. Some nights she doesn't sleep at all. The doctor told her, the EOB talked, told her with all the walking she does, there's a good chance she's going to lose her baby. This is unacceptable. This is, this is outrageous. So my message to you is, as Susan Phillips said, about being distressed about the, the, the scuttling of the center for the homeless. That's what we need in Springfield. Decatur and Peoria have more comprehensive services than the state capital does. Come on. The center would have provided comprehensive service. You just heard about the woman who was put out because she had mental health issues. The center would have addressed that. Mental health, primary care health, detox, shelter, and linkages to assisted housing, permanent housing. What, what, what is wrong? 20 years, nothing has been done. I was told, I don't know how true this is, but I believe it, your father started helping hands 20 years ago. And what progress has been made? All I hear is Band-Aids, and they are Band-Aids. That's all they are. You're not solving the problem. You need some comprehensive service. I have been told that helping hands, when they have somebody that comes in there that has mental health issues, and they're all housed at night, I think they've increased the number to over 50 now, 
that person begins acting out. They that person unsettles everybody, and there's no place they can take them. They can't remove them, which they would have been able to do in the center. Come on, do something. This is the state capital. What is wrong? You know, let's 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 take care. They're the most vulnerable people. Your statement on the web page, Mayor is we are a family in Springfield, and one of us suffers, we all suffer. That's not reality, that's not how we're treating our most vulnerable people. And I take issue with the, the whole thing about being racist from the point of view, only from one point of view, I'm not talking about the ward or where is located, I'm talking about the fact is, it over in that ward, it would have provided services for residents, low income residents in that community. For example, primary health care. Also, in my experience, the people that I encounter, the homeless I encounter, there's as many African Americans as there are white. So by scuttling this whole center, you have basically done a disservice to the African Americans. You really have. It's not, it, 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 there's no other word for it. So with that being said, I thank you, and I hope that you will somehow resolve, put some kind of permanent solution to the homeless problem, at least make it improve their situation. This could be your legacy. It's gonna haunt you if you don't do something about it. Thank you. I understand the magnitude. Yes, my father did start helping hands. Salvation Army is gonna provide medical care, and that's all I'm gonna say with regards to the center. I mean, we can go into a long discussion Actually, that we, we did that that night, but uh, we will not, because the I think someone said, we need to move forward, and that's the whole purpose. Let's move forward together. I think James Smiley hit the nail on the head. It's together. Unfortunately, not all these social service agencies are coming together. And so that's what needs to happen. Salvation Army stepped up for us. We really appreciate it. Because guess what? We probably have 60 people on the streets. And we are concerned. That's why the police calls are up. We ask the police to make the rounds around the city. Because we do not want anybody passing away staying at a ramp or in a doorstep or anywhere. We've had so we all take this seriously. We all care about one another. That's why I make the statement. We are like a family. And that's what's proven out now. That's what proved out when we talked about the center. We need the best possible solution moving forward. That's, that's the way it is. We talked about the center but did nothing. And what you are doing now... This you can come to the podium if you'd like to another, speak, please. Someone else also spoke to the fact that, I don't know if it was Susan Phillips, when you have this continuum of services, or it may have been Dr. Smiley, you need, you need a focal point, you need a center, you need, otherwise it's disparate. You got this group putting, applying this service and this one applying this service. As I said, it's all Band-Aid. It's not a resolution. It's not a solution. So a year from now, you're going to be doing exactly the same thing. And, and uh, you know, let's open the warming center. Who's going to run it this year? And, and you think this is, this is how we solve it? It's not. I agree. You got to go, you got to go a step further. By working together. And it wow. goes back to the case management, one on one, finding out what their needs are and moving them to their a better position. Their needs are a, f a, a center, a central location where they can be managed appropriately. Whatever issue they have, detox, mental health, whatever it is, it can be dealt with there. And with the linkage to housing, to permanent assistant housing. There are people that are working that are, have SSI, that are homeless. They need, they need that linkage to the housing. Correct. I think we're working towards that goal, aren't we, Mayor? Right. We're still working on that. If, if, I, if I can, so what, what, what you're saying uh, is... Next, you can. If, what, what you're saying is, what I heard you say a couple of times, is the health and housing project was that answer. It was, it was definitely 
definitely a step in the right direction. And I've been told, I don't know how factual this is, that even HUD monies could be threatened because the services, homeless services, are so inadequate in Springfield that the whole movement is towards permanent assisted housing. And I know Erica Smith has all kinds of data about the savings it would provide to the hospitals, about getting people housed, how much money that would save the city. But it, you know, apparently it just didn't, didn't do any good. Well, the city council did approve the zoning for that uh, comprehensive center, right. yes, but we don't control what Helping Hands does after we approve the location. Or what other it wasn't on it Helping Hands. Bring in lawsuits. Wasn't so on Helping Hands. This wasn't on Helping Hands. No. Thank you. I mean, I was Thank here in September comments. and it was approved. Eight to two. Thank you for your comments Thank tonight. You. Yes. Allison. I came here to city uh, council, hello Doris, and thanks for calling to ask how I was. I was very, very ill, and I came out of my bed, which I should be in it now, because I am upset about the homeless. I really am. I came home one night and there was a gentleman sleeping in the hallway in the hotel, the county where I live right now. I'm still displaced. So I know how the homeless feel sometimes. But I feel like we need something more than what you're doing. First off, if I was the one running the shelter, the person that was doing this, he would not be working today, okay? And the other person stealing the link cards to do it, they would be in jail. Because I don't have no squalms about it. You don't mistreat these people that are, have already been mistreated are mentally ill. Now, I had a friend staying in the Helping Hands one night, and he had to call me to come and get him. He had two bruises on his back where a man has been beaten on him because no, he couldn't get nobody to help him. This is terrible. And I know what it's like to be homeless because I was. I was in L.A., had no place to go. Only one person came and helped me, and she was a street walker and gave me a place to stay. And that lady is still my friend. Salvation Army people walked by six or seven times and didn't do anything. I have nothing against you, Salvation, but sometimes you don't do a lot of good either. But I think it's time that we get someone in there like this young lady here said that is qualified. I am certified to turn in abuse and I will do it in a heartbeat without a hesitation. But you have to give the guts and you have to get the nuts and you have to do it with that lady said there. We need someone to help these people get into residence homes or some place where they can be safe and know that they're being taken care of. Because this is terrible to see them on those streets and not have no place to go. And then when you walk up to help them, they think you're trying to do something else. This is nowhere for Capital City to be. And if we're going to be a community, let us be a community. And I remember when your father opened the help, Helping Hands Okay, he would not stand for this, Mayor. No way, shape, form, or fashion. And neither would your mother. Remember that, I know them both. So get off of your tub, do what you have to do, and get it done. Just so you uh, know, I was there when they opened up the Helping Hands. I know you were. As part of contact ministry. And so uh, they were displaced, they found a permanent location. Where they're at was supposed to be a permanent location. It was So uh, they've outgrown it, or what have you. But uh, with regards to what we've done, we've provided veterans housing for homeless, mm -hmm. and we'll continue. Like I said, the winter warming center, is it the solution? No, it's a temporary solution. How do we get to the permanent transitional, it's supportive, to take these houses supportive housing that they need? Down here in this town that are empty. This big building that you've been trying to get it fixed for I don't know how long on Monroe Street. Okay, a lot of money went in there. A lot of that money that you put in that building because that man didn't know what he was doing even though he owned it, could have helped the homeless. You could have found a place. You could have done a heck of a lot more than what you're doing now. 
Alice, with all due respect, you came here and spoke out against the Center for Health and Housing. I you, did, because yes. I didn't like the, where it was at. You said you did the simple fact it was too close to kids. You said and you, if that's the kind of thing you want, then fine, because you couldn't ask them if they were rapists, and you couldn't well, ask them if they were child. You said you didn't want that trash in your backyard, Alice. Alice. Hey, we, I got it in my Alice. backyard. Alice. Every day. Chief, come on. You want I help live her, on the east side. I see it every day. Mayor, can we get that, back at the task at hand? Yeah. What are we going to do about this? You I mean, the listen. homeless you thing is a whole different... You don't you listen. Care about what you Alice, care about. please, Alice. I think this is a passionate issue that we're struggling with. We will find the solution by working together. Well, so uh, this lady's been waiting, so if you'd state your name and address for the council, we'd appreciate it. I'm Eleanor Nailing, and I actually work at the Warman Center. And I'm very just kind of disturbed on um, the reports that was made after 45 minutes. You know, you stayed 45 minutes. Try staying eight hours. You know, when you're dealing with 50, 60, 70 people that's got mental disorders, that's coming in, falling down drunk, but you don't turn them away because they've fallen down drunk. You try to find a way, again, to comfort them, to bring them in. Some of them I have a good rapport with. Some of them my other staff have rapports with. You know, but to, uh, to, to throw everybody up under the bus, it's, it's just not a fair call. Again, I think we all need to work together. All the social services, you know, this has grown because again, instead of us finding places and helping these people individually, getting to know them, we've tapped them on the hand and said, okay, it's okay for you to be homeless because we're gonna provide the services for you. It's okay for you to get your check and go blow it because we're gonna provide these services for you. And these same individuals, you know, that saying that they're making all these complaints are the same individuals that come there disrespectful belligerent, you know, and abuse the services that we're providing. They don't tell you about how they're conducting themselves. Not to say that we're, we're, we're uh, supposed to be mean and nasty and rude to them. That's something that I'm not. But at the same time, you know, just like the police, you know, that's one of our protocols. If there's something escalating, we have to call the police. Sometimes it takes the police 30 minutes. So if again, if I or one of my other staff members don't get in the middle of two or three people trying to fight, you got bloodshed. Then who's that gonna fall on? Who would that fall on? Nobody's talking about those type of things. You know. My thing is, and I, like I had spent talking to the mayor is that again, as far as intake, we all need to work collectively and get to know each individual, learn their story so we can learn how to help them. Just coming in and telling them that you could come and lay down here tonight and get up the next morning and go on about your business, that's not providing a, a true service, not for real. It's a Band-Aid. I get my check. I get Social Security and I get my check on the first. I leave, go get me a hotel for a week or so, blow my money because what? I know I can come back to this shelter. I can talk crazy. I can talk reckless again to the staff. I can be unmindful to the rules. And that's a lot of the problem, the rules. There's rules set in place and there's rules set in place to keep ordinance. Eight o'clock, you know, is the time that we ask them to, you know, be able to be in by. That's the latest of any shelter around here. But you'll have the ones that want to come at 12 o'clock, and because, again, they can go to the police and tell the police, oh, well, they won't let us in. They have the police bring them to us, falling down drunk, you know, we have to accept them. That's what you do. It's That's what you, for. Uh, That's what please, only come to the podium to speak. 
So any other comments, ma'am? We appreciate your work at the shelter. Thank you. And then, Chief, if you'd come up and speak to the uh, the difference between this year and last year with regards to the lobby downstairs. I think this goes to the heart of turning people away. Uh, it may have been, I'm, I can't even speak to it, but we know for a fact there's, <coughs> last year we had a <coughs> different number staying in the lobby. Yeah, at our lobby this year has been very few people. Last year, you know, we made every effort to get people into shelter as much as possible. Uh, those who did not have a place to go, uh, <coughs> typically those who were sex offenders and couldn't get into the shelters, are the ones who were staying in our lobby. Last year we averaged probably 10 to 15, 20 a night. Now we have nowhere near those numbers. I assume they're staying elsewhere. Maybe they've uh, moved on. Maybe they're in the shelters. I don't know. Uh, but you always have those people in the lobby that don't want to follow rules as well. And then, you know, we had to try to take those and find alternative shelters, you know. So um, it's a difficult task. It's a difficult task. I don't think anybody here is uh, suggesting that anybody should be treated mis treat it wrong, that everybody should be compassionate, respectful, but it is a difficult job. And, um, you know, I think that we all want the same thing. We want the same thing. We want to get help for the people who need help. We want to give them a safe place to go. With that said, you know, uh, it is a difficult job. So we're here to help any way we can. Well, we thank the need. council for their action tonight for the outreach coordinator. I think that's going to help with uh, part of this. I think it could help, yes. I think it could help. Again, anything else you want? Anybody, Anybody else wish to address the council? One more All thing. All the woman, so. Yes, it's going to help. And this isn't directed at you, no. Chief. This is just directed at everybody. But we need a center for health and housing. It's more than evident. We have to do something. We have to get everyone back at the table. We have to get all the conversations starting again. We have to pick a location, wherever that may be, and we've got to make this happen. Because otherwise, this is just going to continue. And this, it, this is awful for the capital of, of, of the state. This is disgusting. This is despicable. And I'm sorry, I, can't take the, I cannot take hypocrisy. There's a lot of things I will tolerate, but I will not tolerate someone coming up here and crying about homelessness when they didn't want homelessness in their backyard and they called the whole homeless person trash. And when they trashed you, the mayor, and I don't defend you very often. I yeah, know, I appreciate that. You're welcome. <laughs> See, there is hope that we all can work together. That's right. Hey, we... But that was out of line. That's right. No, and I, I don't also, I don't appreciate yeah. someone coming to us saying, you know, no city employee works at the shelter when in fact a city employee does work at the shelter, whether it's in the capacity as a city employee or not. We, everyone needs to start telling the truth, period. You too. Oh, come on, so, uh, Oh, my gosh. On. What is wrong with you? Yeah, I'd ask you. Uh, doc, Dr. Smiley if he's still here to come forward. Mm -hmm. Yes, sir. The, uh, one thing I would ask is if you would uh, lead the initiative to get the groups together, because you understand it again. You you understand uh, more yes. than you, you know than you a lot of individuals with regards to. Ever. Please, you we have either. someone at the you podium. You don't tell me what I can and can't say, Joe. Would you be willing to uh, attempt to get everybody together with regards to the uh, moving forward in the capacity we need to with the Center for Health and Housing? Getting the groups together uh, yeah, that, to work that's, together. That, yes, that is that is true. But we also would want to be able to deal with this issue as well. Sure. Yeah. Because the, at the root cause of what we have to deal with there, we also need to deal with this here as well. Mm -hmm. And so I think the the best approach would be to spearhead what it needs to do to help Salvation Army and the staff get it up to where it needs to be. That's the reason why I asked Pastor Susan. Uh, to come up with me. She's been working alongside me along right. with others. Pastor Phillips, I'm sure, would be willing to help in that capacity or in some capacity with Salvation Army and the I, other I have been a fan and a supporter of the Center for Health and Housing because permanent supportive housing is the best option we have for seriously reducing chronic homelessness. Nationwide, it is the model. However, it's not the issue on the table tonight. Right. Tonight, the right. issue is you have a crisis because you have a contracted employee who has been behaving in abusive ways toward residents in your care. Thank you, Susan. That is the point tonight. Right. There are people tonight 
who are afraid. They are afraid that they will be kicked out. They are afraid that they're going to be on the street. You have citizens that need you to respond promptly to a crisis situation. And uh, Captain Jeff would probably uh, work course, with yeah. you immediately with regards to that. Mm -hmm. So if you exchange so, yes. numbers, that'd be helpful. Most definitely. Alderwoman Turner. Um, I agree. This is a crisis situation that needs to be handled now. I, I think that when we started this whole conversation, I said that and offered some what I thought were valid solutions that needed to be taken immediately. However, in order to move, I, I appreciate what the mayor said about moving forward and, and, and trying to have a viable solution <clears throat> to this whole problem of homelessness. Because if we just address the winter warming shelter, next year we're still going to have another right, winter correct. warming shelter somewhere in, in disarray and, and in confusion. So we have to we have to look at how we as a city are going to address homelessness and how we're going to put together a homeless initiative. And I I I still say that that cannot be I mean I I value the consortia. I, I've worked with them before on, a, on health care issues. I value their input. I value their experience. You know, I value what they bring to the table. However, you cannot put together a citywide homeless initiative by consortia. There has to be a leader. There has to be someone that's coordinating and Bring and convening people and bringing people together. And the way the consortia works, or the way it used to work, is that it has a chair that rotates. There, so, Mayor, we have to, as a city, we have to take this on as a city initiative, and we have to identify a qualified person that can lead this effort and get us where we need to go. And I, I I feel very, very strongly about that, and, and I don't know who that person is, but it has to happen, and I, I don't know. It, it, and it needs to be someone that has the experience, the background, and the wherewithal to do it. Very good. Very Mayor, good. Could, could I just ask, Captain Eddie, could, could we do, and I, 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 could you look at, at Putting the, I, I, want, I just want to get some closure on sure. what we're talking about. Mm -hmm. Can we at least look at the video? But I think that what needs to happen is the, the gentleman needs to be even sus suspended on, while you look at the video and, and come to your conclusion. I think it, at, at worst case, or, or at, at, at the, the lightest case, that's, that needs to happen. All, that's what all these people have talked about. <laughs> If we can't do it through, if if, you, if the city doesn't want to do it, I'm asking you. Put it doesn't hurt to to give them a couple days off while you come to your to your your decision. But at least what it does is it solves what the problem. It, it solves a, a small part of the problem that we've been addressing tonight. Is that is that is that yes, fair? Thank you, Ralph. Is that fair? And can I have your, I, 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 okay, thank you. And we've yeah. been directed as well to connect and look into the other problems thank as you well. Thank you for stepping up and like so that, so that yes. we can also report back to you and give you the assessment of that as well. Right. Thank you, and we, we could be objective on that and we can also be in depth. So that's not a problem. But our desire is to see the very best warming center that we can have now moving forward and then developing some exactly. other things with the other issues. Correct. That's fine. Thank you. All right. Michael? I'll be real, real quick. Um, we've been listening about homeless for a long time. We listened about putting a center out by the cemetery. We listened to a sign company. We listened to Helping Hands. We've all been working together for all those years to put all those together, and we've never achieve that. Now we want to talk about the Salvation Army and a city employee who 
works at the Salvation Army who we want to get out of the job, maybe punish, maybe whatever. But I would say to you as a city council, who created the situation? Who created a situation that put, let this guy with no training work someplace where he would be working with people who are drug addicts, alcoholics, schizophrenics, and whatever? And if any of you had to deal with homeless on the street, like I have as a business owner downtown, you know that you get a lot of grief, a lot of shit from these people that you're trying to move out of your business or whatever. And if you're not trained to do it, or like, if, like in our case, we don't argue, we just call the police department. But if you got someone that's not trained to deal with that, I'm telling you, you can lose your temper real quick. And I would say to all of you, this guy we're gonna punish, who created the situation? The lack of anything happening in this city over the years created this situation. Okay. Some of that's here, some of that's here, and some of that's in the past. And we're still fighting it today and we're still gonna punish someone who had no business working there in the first place. Thank you. Anybody else wish to address the council? We do have one announcement. Uh, Public Works having an open house at the uh, Lincoln Library from four to six on Thursday to go over the uh, downtown initiatives of the one-way streets, the beautification, and the parking meters. Mayor. Okay. Alderman Hannah. Just real quick. Uh, public announcement, uh, Christ the King uh, boys eighth grade basketball is playing for the state uh, 1A title uh, Thursday night, so I won't be at the open house uh, over at Make Meridian, and uh, they've, uh, they're playing well, so. Yep. Ralph good will luck. be cheering for them remotely. The mayor saw them play. That's right, they were good. <laughs> Motion to adjourn. Okay. All in favor say aye. Uh, Opposed say nay. We're adjourned. Thank you. Wow. <laughs> he broke a record. That's the longest meeting we've ever had. That I've been down there. You don't know me.